if you can keep your questions, at the end we come together here and we'll have plenty of time for discussions, we'll collect questions and um, give uh, the chance to the, uh, to the uh, speakers to, uh, to enter the discussion. So, without further ado, I'll give the floor to uh, Emily, who will um, do the first video. Thank you for the introduction, Peter. And um, I feel honored to be uh, the first presenter of this Last Rise conference. Uh, but actually, it should have been my colleague, uh, Asri, who should have been uh, standing in front of you. Uh, unfortunately, um, she, uh, she couldn't attend the conference, so, um, so I'm stepping in. Today I'll present to you um, joint work with uh, Asri, uh, my colleagues Bima and Daniel on uh, selecting teachers uh, in Indonesia. So the Indonesian government uh, has been aware that uh, the quality of their teachers has to be improved. So. In 2015, they assessed um, all of their over 3 million teachers with this national competency test, and on average, their teachers failed. So uh, they scored below the passing threshold. Uh, so they have since then tried several teacher training programs, but um, as most of you know, teacher training isn't easy, and this hasn't been effective. But now there's um, this retirement wave. So uh, a lot of civil ser servant teachers are uh, retiring with up to 90,000 uh, teachers retiring in 2024. So this generates um, an opportunity for the government to replace these retiring teachers with um, more effective ones. But then the question is how to identify um, effective teachers as replacements. So um, selecting teachers seems to have the potential to improve learning. Uh, so first of all, there's many people in Indonesia that want to become civil servant teachers. teachers. So uh, they have um, a large pool to choose from. Uh, and other studies have shown that teacher value added uh, varies a lot. So um, there's a lot of variation in teacher quality that seems to be contributing to learning. Um, However, the literature so far um, has found that it's really complicated to, uh, to predict which teachers have the highest value added. So um, little of the variation in teacher value added is actually explained by these um, easily measured characteristics like um, their education levels or their years of experience. And um, there has been some evidence of uh, a correlation between performance in the classroom and uh, the GPA of these uh, teachers and some screening tests uh, like assessments of their subject and pedagogical knowledge, interviews, sample lessons. But generally, the, the correlations have been uh, quite small. But um, the Indonesian government um, has tried exactly that, to use these uh, screening tests to um, select motivated uh, young teachers into um, this one-year training program. So, as said before, the government is concerned that uh, their teachers are underperforming, uh, and they think that uh, this could partly be explained by their teacher colleges uh, producing underperforming uh, graduates. So uh, what they did is they decided that in order to receive a teacher certificate, all teachers have to go through this, um, this one-year additional program called uh, Pendidikan Profesi Guru, or translated teacher professional education. Uh, and this is, includes half a year of coursework and um, half a year internship. And uh, so they wanted to attract and select motivated and, uh, and uh, good teachers. So they, uh, there's large benefits to uh, people who get into this program. So first of all, uh, when you graduate from this program, uh, you, the, these teachers immediately receive their teacher certificate, which means that they get a doubling of their base pay. And um, it also makes it easier for them to become a civil servant. So 
Uh, they have to do this test if they want to become a civil servant, and uh, they get automatically get the full score on the teaching part um, of this of this test if they graduated from the um, from the PPG program. Um, so um, in this paper, we were not interested in evaluating the program that's being done by my colleagues at Smer in a different paper that hopefully will be out as a rights working paper as well soon. Uh, but we were interested in whether the selection criteria that the government uses uh, to select teachers into this program are actually uh, predictive of uh, student learning later in the classroom. So how did they select uh, the teachers? So we're looking at uh, the primary school teacher paper gay program uh, and at the cohort that was uh, admitted in 2018. So first of all, um, these candidates have to pass some administrative requirements. So this might be a bit small, but basically um, they had to be young, uh, young teachers, so less than five years of teaching experience, uh, younger than 31 years old, and they had to have an undergraduate GPA of at least three out of four. Um, they also had to stay single until the end of the program. Uh, <laughs> So the reason for this is that um, they were not uh, allowed to choose the university at which they were going to take the program at. So they had to be, uh, they, ha they, they likely had to move um, to follow this program. So it would be quite complicated if a whole family would have to uh, move with them. But yeah, there were a lot of marriages right after uh, graduating. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the, the, the candidates who passed these requirements then took an online test. Um, so they were tested on their academic aptitude, English skills, and pedagogical knowledge. And this was all quite theoretical. And if they scored more than 50 out of 100, they were invited to uh, an interview. Um, so this interview also had this standardized um, sort of scoring cards um, on which they were assessed uh, on their motivation, personality, attitude, and it often included some micro-teaching. Uh, and then their online test score and interview score were combined, and if they passed, uh, if they scored higher than 60, then they were accepted uh, into the program. And you can see with the number of individuals in these boxes here that this online test score was quite selective, so they went from 3,900 um, uh, people who took this test to only 1,700 that were invited to the interview. But the interview itself actually wasn't that, uh, wasn't that selective. So it only counted for 30% in their final score. And you can see that it only uh, decreased um, the number of individuals from 1,700 to 1,500. And in the end, 1,291 uh, candidates actually enrolled and went through uh, the whole program. So we are interested in whether these screening tests are actually correlated with teacher performance. And uh, we look at two different measures from, for that. So the first one is their performance in the PPG program itself. So uh, we look at their uh, exam scores. Uh, so they took two big exams. The first one was a knowledge uh, exam. So they were, again, tested on their pedagogical knowledge, on how to... Uh, to create uh, assessments and also uh, subject knowledge. And they also had to take this teacher practice uh, exam. So they had to prepare and implement uh, a lesson in front of people that were not their own uh, mentors. So these were usually teachers from other uh, universities that were offering the, the program. So we have this data for all the teachers, but my colleagues at Smero also tested uh, the students of uh, a subset of uh, these teachers two years later. So they selected seven universities, and this is mainly, so these are the universities that are located on Java Island, so that uh, the costs of the data collection were, uh, within, were within budget. Uh, so they tested 1,620 students that were taught by 114 teachers that graduated from this program, and these teachers were now teaching in various grades in, in primary school. And unfortunately, as you can see, and like many other studies, also our study was affected by COVID, uh, the pandemic. So these students were, um, uh, so, so Smeru did home visits to test, uh, test these students to see what their learning outcomes 
were uh, the schools were closed in 2021. So um, this would this also likely limited um, the effect that teachers could have on on their students. So um, so that is definitely um, yeah that that definitely affected um, our study, unfortunately. Um, so. As I, so, as I, so we don't have performance indicators for all the applicants. As I said, we, on, we look at these exam scores of the ones that graduated and uh, their uh, students were tested. So uh, here I just want to show you what variation in screening scores we're looking at. So um, as I said before, only teachers that scored above 50 on the online test were accepted in the program. So in black, you see the distribution of uh, all the applicants, nice normal distribution. Um, uh, but we are only looking at the ones that scored above uh, 50. But if you think of your own time uh, in university, a student that just passed the test and students that score very high are still very, very different. And uh, the interview score wasn't that selective. So we almost have the whole, uh, whole uh, distribution there. Uh, and then the, the teachers whose students were tested are actually quite similar to, to all the, uh, the graduates from the program. As you see, their, uh, this, the distribution of their screening scores um, overlap mostly. So then to the results. Um, so we first see that teachers that did better on the screening scores also perform better in the program uh, itself. So we just we, uh, estimated this um, OLS model with um, the knowledge, the exam scores as outcome variable, then the vector of screening scores, and we included some university fixed effects to uh, take out these uh, yeah, university specific effects. So on the left, you see the correlations with the coefficients between the, the screening tests and the knowledge exam. So um, those students who scored one standard deviation higher on the online test scored uh, on average 0.3 uh, standard deviation higher uh, on the knowledge exam. So this makes sense because these tests were testing similar uh, competencies. Uh, the interview was not predictive for this knowledge test, but it was for the practice exam, although, um, although uh, the coefficient is much smaller. So uh, I forgot to say, so the, the bars that are uh, dark are the ones that are statistically are significantly different from zero and the empty ones are not. Um, so um, yeah, in the interview, they were also looking at this micro teaching and in a practice exam, they also did it. So uh, it kind of makes sense that the, that, that is uh, correlated uh, and the GPA is correlated with both. But then when we move on to the students' outcomes, there's nothing. Um, so you could be uh, worried, we only tested these students uh, at one point in time, so you could be worried about selection. Uh, we tried our best to condition on uh, student background um, characteristics like their parents' education, house quality index. We included classroom average score to correct for this selection. But um, the usual worry that people have is that better teachers select into better schools and therefore are uh, teaching better performing students. Well. If that was the case, then these results mean that these screening uh, tests are actually selecting worse performing teachers. So we don't think um, that this selection is uh, uh, an issue here. Um, and we also looked at the correlation between these uh, exam scores and student learning, but there's also uh, nothing there. And we have quite precise, precise uh, zero coefficients. So um, yeah, there's really no uh, association between these tests and learning. Uh, so another way of, um, sorry, am I on time? Okay. So another way of showing how, um, how uh, little predictive power these tests have for student test scores is by doing this very simple exercise. So imagine that you just, that, we are ma that you make another selection within uh, this group. Um, how would that, uh, what, can, how, what would the average test scores of students be then? So we standardized within grades, so uh, to have a mean of zero for, for all teachers. And then if we only look at the top 50% uh, scoring teachers on these tests, these would be, uh, these are the, the average uh, student scores of, of their students. So it makes very little difference 
but not only that, these, uh, these seem to be worse performing than the students of uh, the, the bottom 50% scoring teachers on these tests. So uh, we conclude that selection based on pre-employment criteria is, uh, is complicated. Um, so teachers that, see, that perform well in the screening tests and perform well uh, in this training program are not necessarily the ones, uh, oh, it stopped. So I don't know, maybe I'm taking more time now. Uh, got lucky. Um, yeah, so they, these are not necessarily uh, the teachers that will also perform well in the classroom. So it's, it's a, our results suggest that this paper gay program selected and educated their teachers on competencies that were not associated with better learning outcomes. And this might seem like uh, quite a strong uh, statement based on our results, but I'm also referring here to the impact evaluation that really found that this, is, uh, that this program was not um, teaching them on uh, the competencies that, would, uh, that are generally um, associated with better learning outcomes. So uh, like the literature, we also find that it's hard to measure teacher quality at one point in time with tests. Um, so, um, so for future research, um, it would be interesting to look at whether um, it, would be uh, it would be possible to uh, observe teachers for multiple years. So like Lent and Yuyi suggest uh, in their paper to have a probation period or curation period in which the teachers are actually observed and select based on, uh, on that because uh, at one point in time it's just too complicated. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That's wonderful. So we're now uh, switching to Sharmik. Uh, who's going to present online. Can you hear us? Charming. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. We can hear you. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, from the moment we can see your slides, yeah, they are coming up. Um, you can start. And we'll, we'll, if you don't mind, I'll remind you uh, of five minutes before the end uh, because we try to keep the uh, timing sharp. So over to Perfect. you. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to present this research here. Um, so this is a joint work with Dr. Alejandro Ganimian from NYU and uh, New York University and Dr. Shwetlena Sabarwal from the World Bank. As the title suggests, in this paper, we show that teachers in South Asia overestimate the performance levels of their students. Um, next. Uh, you can actually have all of the bullets come in together. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, we know that there is mounting evidence pointing to the fact that teachers in low- and middle-income countries rarely cater to the needs of low-achieving students um, in their classrooms. Most, teacher, uh, most children cannot perform basic tasks in literacy and numeracy, despite being enrolled in schools for long enough, such as that they do not learn adequately in their classrooms. Um, the learning levels often remain flat, and the gaps in performance between the low and high achieving students are rarely remedied as they progress to higher grades. We also know that teachers rarely engage in differential, uh, differentiated instruction in absence of external interventions that specifically ask them to do so. Um, as you can see, the prevailing explanations for why we, uh, why we see this in our classrooms suggest three key mechanisms. One, uh, the curriculum uh, that, that the teachers are expected to cover is too ambitious, and teachers are often expected to rush, um, rush to complete it. This often leaves um, low, uh, this, this um, often leaves uh, low achieving students behind. Next, uh, teachers see little payoffs from investing in low achieving students since they believe that parents are likely to pull them, uh, pull their children out of school if they do not show promise. And finally, teachers' accountability mostly rests on their top performing students scoring, um, uh, scoring well on high stakes exams, so that uh, so the teachers' focus mostly remain on uh, top of the distribution. Next. Yes. Uh, we, however, argue that teachers, pay, uh, teachers could pay insufficient attention to low performing students possibly because they underestimate how many of them are there in their classes and how, and how much they're struggling. We use data uh, from student achievement levels measured by their performance on standardized tests in math and language, 
and teachers estimates of, of, of uh, their students' achievement level to show that, one, uh, teachers underestimate the share of low-scoring uh, low students um, in their own classrooms, two, uh, they overestimate this, uh, the actual scores of these students in absolute as well as relative terms with respect to the within-class uh, within uh, distribution, and three, they vastly underestimate the within-class variability um, in these test scores. Our findings are from two studies, uh, one from India and another from Bangladesh. In study one, uh, we, uh, we use the data from a randomized um, evaluation of a teacher residency program in Maharashtra, India. We use the data only from the control group of this RCT since we did not want the program to be affecting our analysis anyway. Um, in study two, we use data that we collected in Bangladesh to understand the extent to which uh, these patterns that we saw in India were present in another school system with similar institutional features. Uh, next. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Um, there seems to be a lag in what I see and what you guys see. So uh, we can go back to the previous slide. Uh, it should be, it should have two panels. Yes, this is the one, thank you. Um, we see that uh, teachers um, misestimate the share of low and high achievers in their classrooms. They also overestimate the scores of low scoring students, that is those in the bottom tercile of the national achievement distribution and underestimate the scores of high, um, of, of high scorers. Uh, if you look at panel A to the left, um, it shows the estimation of shares at the classroom level. Um, on the uh, on the x axis, we group students by uh, by the tercile they fall into the national achievement distribution, um, and on the y axis, uh, we show you the percentage of school uh, students who were um, who actually were there in that tercile and who were estimated. So, uh, as you can see, teachers have underestimated the, uh, underestimated the shares of low achieving students uh, in the in the lowest tercile and overestimated the shares of students in the highest tercile. In panel B to the right, uh, uh, we show the gaps um, in the estimation, uh, which is the difference between the actual score that individual students scored on the test and the estimated scores that the teachers uh, provided us for these individual students. So this is at an individual level, averaged across the entire sample. Um, on the on the x-axis, uh, we again group students similarly uh, to the to the panel on the left, where you know where where we group them based on the tercile they fall in the national achievement distribution. And on the y-axis, we show you the sample average for the, you know, for the gaps between actual and estimated scores. So um, as you can see here, teachers have overestimated uh, the scores of low-achieving students by about 27 percentage points and underestimated the scores of um, high-achieving students by about 9 percentage points. Uh, next slide, please. We see that, uh, next we see that most teachers overestimate um, uh, the performance of their students across the entire distribution. In both panels, we show you the distribution of differences between students' test performance and uh, teachers' estimations. On the x-axis on the bottom, um, uh, we show you the difference in percentage point terms, while on the x-axis on the top, um, we, we show you the differences in standard deviation terms. So we find that um, about 85 percentage of the um, of the differences in India and about 60% of uh, the differences in, in Bangladesh are positive, meaning they, they fall to the right of zero. And this, this uh, indicates that most teachers have overestimated the performance of their students. And next, we also see that the magnitude of these misestimations uh, of uh, students' test performance is quite large. How do we know this? Um, the graphs in both panels show the scatter plot between students' actual scores on the y-axis and teachers' estimations on the x-axis. The solid line uh, is where all of the dots should have been had the teachers um, you know, made um, perfect estimations. The dotted line shows the actual linear fit. In India, teachers' uh, estimations explain about 13% of the variation in actual student scores, and in Bangladesh, um, teachers' estimations explain only about 1% of the variation. Next slide. Thank you. Um, we also find that teachers uh, do not seem to know. Yeah, this one, please. Thank you. We also find that uh, teachers do not seem to know the relative st uh, standing of their students. And um, we can see this by uh, these two panels separately. So uh, on, in, the top, in the top panel A, 
we show the relationship between students actual and estimated within class rank. Um, so on the x-axis, you'll find the estimated um, estimated ranks separately for India on the left and Bangladesh on the right. And on the y-axis, you see the um, uh, predicted rank based on uh, uh, teachers' estimations. So similar to the slide, um, uh, similar to the previous slide, um, the solid line um, shows perfect estimation, and the dotted line is the actual linear fit. Um, as you can see, the, the amount of variation explained by teachers' estimation is slightly higher than what we saw earlier when it, you know, uh, when it was absolute scores. However, it's still pretty low at 25% for India. For Bangladesh, you, you see the points to be a bit clustered because we uh, we'd only asked uh, the teachers to provide estimations for three students. So the ranking is only for three students over there, uh, whereas in India, we had 10 students for each teacher. Um, in the bottom panel B, we show you the relationship between uh, the estimated and the actual classroom level standard deviations. Uh, again, uh, similar to what we've been seeing on other scatter plots, uh, solid line means perfect estimation and a dotted line is actual linear fit. The amount of variation that's explained by uh, teachers' estimations uh, revealed by their um, uh, you know, teachers' ex estimated standard deviations revealed by their actual predictions are pretty low. Um, with both in India and Bangladesh um, uh, being at about well uh, at about two percent, and um, this 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 basically indicates that teachers have very little clue of the amount of variation uh, that they have in their students um, students achievement levels within their own classrooms. Next slide. Um, as robustness check, we ask teachers to provide estimations about specific topics um, or, or or content domains, as you can see here. Uh, in addition to this, we also ask for specific items, and we ask them to report uh, um, estimations for specifically identified students, and not just the classroom level estimates that I've been showing you. In all of these cases, we found that the estimations um, or the accuracies in these estimations did not improve. Um, in this figure, we show the percentage of students actual and estimated by different content domains in math. The gray bars show the actual percentages, and the light gray bars, uh, sorry, the dark ones show the actual percentages, and the light gray bars show the teachers' estimations. Um, we see that uh, teachers um, um, overestimate um, the performance across all the domains. Next slide, please. Um, when we show specific items and ask teachers whether specific students who've been identified by name can answer um, uh, can answer these specific items, their uh, their accuracies in their estimations do not improve on average. In fact, what we find is that uh, they generally overestimate the ability of students um, um, on items with high difficulty, which we know from uh, from the difficulty parameter that we can estimate using a two parameter IRT model that I've shown um, uh, right below the bar graphs. So if you look at the difficult items that are to the right, let's say the, um, the item on numbers and operations, 14% of the students have gotten it right, while teachers think 64% uh, of, uh, of their students can solve it correctly. Next slide, please. Um, yes, we can get all the bullets out, thank you. Uh, we looked at potential mechanisms that could explain inaccuracies in teachers' estimations. Um, we found that teachers uh, were not um, uh, we we found that uh, teachers' accuracies were not any higher for uh, for those uh, who were more educated, um, um, highly trained or um, um, or those with above median experience. Um, these measures that are typically used as proxies for teacher quality do not help in predicting which teachers have a better knowledge um, of their students' academic skills. Uh, teachers, however, did seem to use some heuristics while reporting their estimations. Uh, about 11% of the teachers in India and about 20% of the teachers in Bangladesh had reported exactly a score of 60 uh, for what their you know, what, for what their uh, students would score on the test that we showed them. And this the 60% mark uh, is, is typically used as a passing in for, uh, for a topic. We found that misestimation explained by, um, by, by teachers' over-reliance on students' intelligence as a proxy for their test performance. What do we mean by this? 
Um, uh, first, we checked and, and confirmed that teachers were not estimating the scores for, uh, uh, teachers were not underestimating the scores for, let's say, female students or those from historically uh, uh, disadvantaged groups uh, like low income um, or students from low caste groups. Next, if we classify students based on the performance on, uh, on a nonverbal abstract, um, abstract reasoning test uh, that, that measures students' fluid intelligence, the scores for um, the test scores for those with below median fluid intelligence score uh, was about uh, was 32 percentage point while with those um, while the score for those with above median fluid intelligence score it was uh, 43 percentage points however teachers estimated the first group to score 56 percentage points and the second to score 70 percentage points this suggests that uh, teachers could be overweighting the um, uh, importance for fluid intelligence next um, and finally, this is one of the first uh, uh, studies uh, to systematically document uh, teachers' misestimation of student achievement in developing countries and to highlight its potential, um, uh, potential consequences for instruction. In high-income countries, uh, just as a benchmark, the mean correlation between actual and estimated score uh, based on a meta-analysis that, that covered uh, research on this over 40 years is about uh, 0.63. While the same measure is about 10 times weaker in Bangladesh at 0.07 and two, uh, and two times weaker in India at, uh, at, at 0.36. Our results have uh, three main implications. Uh, one, they draw, uh, they draw attention to an underappreciated reason for um, why differentiated instruction interventions may have been successful in the past. Um, given that teachers in these settings do not actually know the skills of their own students, part of the reason why these interventions may have been effective um, is that they help teachers update their incorrect priors on the level and the spread of achievement in their classrooms. Our findings also just that providing teachers with results of formative assessments or training them on how to administer, uh, administer them on their own may yield some of the benefits. And finally, uh, we, uh, we raise an important question about the consequences of uh, documented biases, uh, biases against, uh, against disadvantaged students. So future work could... Um, could explore on how uh, teachers' misperceptions relate to their instructional practices, and particularly on how teachers interact with students um, whom they underestimate, and how this impacts student learning. Thank you. Wonderful, Sharnik, and thank you for um, sticking to time. So the next one, uh, next speaker is Andy, and I think, so please. And Jacqueline is uh, joining us remotely. Can you hear us, Jacqueline? Yes, I can hear you quite clearly. Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Okay. You, can, you can start. Great, thank you so much. My name is Jacqueline Matenge, and I'll be presenting with my colleague Andy De Barros, who's in person at Rides Oxford. We are presenting on our study, which is called What Drives Teachers to Change Their Instructions? And this was a mixed method study from Zambia. And this was done by my colleague Andy De Barros, who's already there in person, Janita Henry, and myself. Next slide, please. Before starting, I would like to thank a couple of people who made this study uh, worthwhile and who supported us, and that is the research participants. They took time to talk to us and give us their thoughts around uh, different elements of the school level approach. We also like to thank our funder, the GP Kicks, and our various partners who have been supporting us in the study. Uh, before I start, which you are about to do, I'd like to point out that the research findings, interpretations, and conclusion expressed in this presentation are entirely those of the authors, myself, Andy, and Junita. Next slide, please. So what did we do in this study? So this was an exploratory study that was asking what provokes Zambian teachers to change their instructions. And how we went about this is we did primary qualitative data with 78 Zambian education personnel all the way from school level to provincial level. And we identified what drives teachers to change their instruction. And we connected these drivers of teacher change 
to exposure to professional development activities. And we did this through a mixed method approach, which was combining qualitative thematic analysis with unsupervised machine learning, as well as combining qualitative analysis of association with linear probability models. And we will speak on this bit a bit later. Next slide, please. The study results highlighted the potential of a school-based teacher development as a means of altering instruction in developing country settings. And when you think of on-site, sorry, school-based teacher development, there were two elements. There's the initial off-site teacher training, which may be best positioned to promote new teacher skills. And yet there's another layer of on-site training and mentoring that invokes more teacher team-based problem solving and verbal encouragement. Uh, it's worth noting that the findings inform a large randomized trial of a continuous professional development program for primary school teachers in Zambia. Uh, you can always ask Andy in person or during the panel about this more. Next slide, please. So why did we do this study? What was the motivation? So over the years, many have grown disillusioned with in-service teacher development. And we can see from the World Development Report of 2018 by the World Bank, that most teacher development is ineffective. And furthermore, next slide, we also see from the Global Education Evidence Advisory Panel by the World Bank 2020, that the most common form of in-service teacher trainings are a bad buy for policymakers in low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? So there's obviously a gap that we're identifying but there's also research that have started to come up showing promising areas for support. And we can see the first one is teacher mentoring and coaching are promising means to improve instruction and raise uh, student achievement. Second, we can see that teacher development related to structured pedagogy can be an impactful tool to improve teaching quality and student learning. And thirdly, the teaching content that allows instructors to adjust their classes to student learning levels rather than focusing on age or grade level can boost learning. So we can see there are promising areas on teacher support, but as you can see, the piece that is missing is how, how do you best support teachers? Next slide, please. So here in our study, we looked at what drives teachers to change their instruction and ask how to do this at scale. So the first question, what, what drives teachers to change their instruction? And in particular, to what extent do frameworks from US research translate to the African context? And then the second piece, next slide. We looked at how do we identify in-service teacher development associated with such drivers, which remain effective at scale. Here, what we mean is how can we learn from large scale programs that already run in public school? So these have government oversight, they do not suffer from implement effect, there's no site selection bias or publication bias. So how do we become effective at scale? Next slide, please. So in this study, we took three main aims and step-by-step step, you'll see how they build onto each other. The first one is to confirm teachers actually change their instruction. And then the second one was to investigate what drove them to make these changes. And then thirdly, investigate the extent to which these drivers of change are associated with at scale professional development activities. Next slide. So after going through why we did it, now let's go through our sample context and data. Next slide. We, ra we randomly sampled 12 government and community schools from two provinces in Zambia. You can see them highlighted in light blue, and that is southern and eastern provinces in Zambia. And within these 12 provinces, two provinces, sorry, next slide. We interviewed a math and literacy teacher in grade three to five, as well as, as their support staff, both from the school level all the way to the provincial level. And in total, we interviewed 72 officials within the Zambian school system. Next slide, please. Obviously, with quantitative interviews, they but in summary, this was a semi-structured interview where we asked about changes in instructions and what triggered them. So when it came to teachers or people who actually carry out instructional activities in schools, we asked in the year before COVID-19 crisis, do you think you changed the way 
you went about your day-to-day -day teaching in the classroom? And if so, how? For those who support teachers, we asked in the year before the COVID-19 crisis, do you think your school teachers went changed anything about the way they do their day-to-day -day teaching in the classroom? And if so, how? So we made sure to identify that this was during the COVID era and changes that were not related to COVID, uh, but more within the system of the education uh, structure. I'd like to pass it over to Andy now. Andy, please go ahead. Exactly. I'll go over the analytical strategy now and then walk you through our results. I'll start off before I throw like something at you, um, just by saying, again, we really try to combine both qualitative methods by analyzing this data with quantitative da data, and then always bring these two together and then see how they relate to each other. Um, so in this case, we took all the text data that, I have, we've, that we have from in the interviews, transcribed them, and then analyzed them in these two ways. Let me quickly walk you through how we did this. So I'll show you on the left-hand side the qualitative way, and then on the right-hand side of the next slide the quantitative way, and then in the middle you always see how we brought this together. Um, so starting at the top of this here, again, we first wanted to document whether change actually happened. And then we also wanted to identify uh, main drivers of, of why this change happened, right? What did teachers tell us? So in the, on the qualitative side, on the left-hand side, we started with open coding, developing a, a coding framework. We did this by hand, uh, just developing coding uh, categories ourselves qualitatively. Then on the quantitative side, uh, we used uh, an unsupervised machine learning method um, called topic modeling. Topic modeling identifies for us clusters of, of words that are commonly used together in the text. And then we looked at these two pieces together and then uh, let them converge. So what you see here in the middle is then the combination of these two methods. With that, we have a coding framework, which, is then going to, which was then used by us for hand coding. We also did some quality checks like uh, the usual inter-rater reliability <coughs> methods just to make sure that um, then our raters actually agree with each other once they use this coding framework. So this is used for us to um, show the prevalence of change actually happening and um, the prevalence of certain drivers of change as reported by the teachers. In the bottom then, we move to how are these different drivers of change related to different um, professional development mechanisms that the teachers are exposed to. Again, we do this qualitatively. A qualitative rater um, assigns association ratings to this as low, medium, or high, or a negative uh, medium or high. On the quantitative side, we estimate linear probability models. Uh, where we take the text and basically say, like, if one thing is mentioned in the text, is there a difference in, uh, in the likelihood that another part is being mentioned? So, for example, if a certain professional development um, activity is being mentioned, how does that affect the likelihood of a given driver of change being mentioned by that teacher or by that educational staff? So let me show you uh, what the results look like for this. First, uh, we show in the paper that teachers actually report having changed their instruction. So, of course, this is self-reported, but um, I'm not going to do this uh, in detail, but this is important, again, for us to show that we're actually operating in a context where teachers are changing what they're doing. Right? And then, uh, secondly, uh, in, in terms of the drivers of change, so why did they tell us uh, they changed their instruction? Um, we identified primary and secondary drivers, and I really want to harp here on, on what teachers told us most of the times, what were the main drivers that why they changed what they do in the classrooms, right? And I'll show you on the left-hand side what is. N is here is the number of teachers reporting this, and then on the right-hand side here, a number of excerpts is like these snippets of text that we have in our text data. How often um, do these different uh, drivers, uh, are, they, are they mentioned by teachers, right? So what really clearly comes through here is the main drivers that is most often mentioned both by the number of teachers and in the number of excerpts is um, sharing and discussion of challenges with their peers on site in school. And that was really surprising to us to see that strong, so strongly come through. And secondly, another driver is the acquisition of new skills and teaching methods. So this is new pedagogy. Um, and then there's weaker drivers and you can argue whether like which one is the, the third versus the fourth and whether you call it a primary. Uh, one or not, such as, for example, getting verbal encouragement from, from their peers. What is learner outcomes here, for example, is also that teachers see, say something like, I see this actually happening, I see this actually um, working for my kids, that's why I'm using it, right? But really, most strongly coming through here, this on-site discussion and sharing and with their peers in school, right? So then, next, we asked ourselves, you know, how is this related to teachers' exposure to professional development activities, right? So on, on the next slide, I'm going to walk you through this again. We have the prevalence. So how often are teachers actually exposed to this? 
these different activities. So on the left-hand side here, these different roles are different professional development activities. Uh, for example, on off-site training, going to an event, and the second here being on-site training and being exposed to on-site uh, development. Right? Then what you see here as a heat map is for each of these three top drivers that I mentioned, mentioned here, especially I'm gonna focus on sharing a discussion of challenges because this was the one that came through most strongly, how is that related to these different professional development activities? So I'm gonna focus here on the left-hand side, sharing challenges in the top left quadrant, right? And I highlight for you the difference between off-site training and on-site engagement with, with peers, right? And what comes here really, through here really strongly, both in the qualitative ratings and in the quantitative ratings, that this is actually negatively related to off-site training opportunities, right? So teach, when in the quantitative side, for example, the interpretation that you have here, if a teacher mentions that they were exposed to an offsite training opportunity, they're actually about 15% less likely to, in that interview, also speak about something like uh, sharing challenges and interacting with their peers meaningfully together, right? Whereas in the onsite training, this is really what's happening and what's the main driver here, both through like the qualitative ratings that we assigned and the quantitative ratings. And if you compare these two, there's about a 50% per percentage point difference in this being mentioned, right? So what comes here really strongly is like to promote this onsite discussion we really want to, we, we should probably really focus on these on-site opportunity. Now, if you go to the right-hand side of the table, however, when teachers talk about what drives uh, new skills that they're picking up, like new methods, right? This is really then where um, the off-site training really shines, right? Which um, then could give you a great idea that you might want to combine these two things, you know, promoting new skills, new methods through, uh, through off-site activities but then you know, really combining them with these on-site activities where teachers engage in these discussions and um, work together on, on, these, on this. So let me wrap up here with, with the conclusion. Um, again, this was an exploratory study that highlights the potential of school-based continuous professional development as, as our main finding here, as it means to alter instruction in a, in a low resource context. Right? Obviously, it relies on self-reports. We don't have something like classroom observations here. Um, also, it's very limited in its ability to identify causal effects. Um, it describes what is. It does not describe what should be, right? Uh, so in the results, for example, you know, we went in and we thought, for example, you know, uh, engagement with data should be really important, right? Like, we want this to happen. But teachers just don't tell us that this is what they're not using, right? So this is just a snapshot of teachers what's actually happening in schools, and we need to take it like that but it's not a discussion of what should be or what could be, right? Uh, we also m think we make a minor contribution to mixed methods research by this like, you know, nice com comparison of qualitative findings with an unsupervised machine learning um, method or with this uh, linear probability methods and just uh, combining them quite nicely. Um, as the, the nerd in me is, is very excited <laughs> about that, uh, but uh, we hope really this, rather than just methods, uh, this has a much larger implication that we now want to explore in a large randomized trial together with Teaching at the Right Level Africa, VVUB, and the Ministry of General Education in, in Africa as we're scaling a large randomized trial there on the effects of Teaching at the Right Level and its methods in, in Zambia. And into this trial, we're building a continuous professional development um, intervention that is really trying to tap into this method of um, you know, getting student teachers engaged together at school and having a, a, an intervention that really you know, uses that mechanism to drive change. We're really excited about that. Um, we're excited about that because we really struggle with this question about how to change uh, teaching. And we really know that it's really hard to, to do that, uh, especially in a context where something like uh, transportation costs are really, really high, where we cannot have mentors come to school, where roving mentors are just not an option, so tapping into these existing structures and getting teachers together, work together, and combining that with offsite training is something that uh, we would now want to explore in our ongoing work. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andy and Jacqueline. Thank you very much. So next we have um, UA. Yes. Yeah. And she's going to talk us through um, the role of norms. The nice thing about going last is that everyone else kind of sets up your presentation for you. But anyway, I'm Yi Hua, I'm a research fellow at the Rice Directorate. I'm gonna talk about a project I've been doing about the norms that affect the teaching profession in the global south. Uh, this project takes the form of an asynchronous symposium of sorts and it'll eventually come up as a sort of an edited volume with interview transcripts 
and discussant style essays and a more structured analysis of the interviews, which is what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, oh, I forgot that I have a clicker. I can look. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you, Andy. So, right, as I said, I feel like I was sort of set up by the previous presentations because they showed that basically there's a lot going on under the hood um, and we need to understand teachers' perspectives a lot better, specifically uh, for this project, as we've been doing synthesis of research from RISE and elsewhere, it's really become increasingly clear that education reform often fails to engage meaningfully with sort of the social and interpretive and normative aspects of teacher practice. This example on the screen is one that some people in this room know very well. It's a school quality assurance intervention in Madhya Pradesh, India. You know, global best practices implemented well, blah, blah, but uh, didn't really make any change on student outcomes, partly because it didn't take into account um, the norms in terms of how teachers respond to government directives and the norms of how they interact with government officials. And that was a finding brought to us by a RISE India country research team. Um, you know, and the slippage between official expectations and tacit norms is something I experienced personally quite a lot when I was a teacher in Malaysia. And then after that, when I was doing my PhD work on teacher accountability, teacher motivation, social cultural context, it struck me that there are lots of people in different branches of social science seeing really interesting things related to this but they don't seem to be talking to each other as much as they could be. So in the hope of getting a few conversations going, what I did was I had interviews in this asynchronous symposium between pairs of people, complementary experience in teacher norms. Quite a number of them are in this room, so you can bother them about their views on this later. Um, and the reason I did this as conversations rather than as presentations or formal papers is that I was hoping to try and elicit some you know, insights that might have come out through years of field experience but never made it into a self-contained report or write-up. And to try to balance sort of spontaneity and reflectiveness, after these hour-long conversations, the interlocutors had the chance to revise their transcripts as much as they wanted to. Just the part they said, not the part the other person said. And um, just, here's just a quick overview of my approach to this project. And for those interested in qualitative work, this was somewhat inspired by grounded theory and analysis, but very loosely so, so don't hold me to that. Um, and this is just a background schematic of how I'm defining teacher norms. This is, to be clear, not meant to be a big theoretical statement or like an ontological contribution to theory or whatever. I'm just trying to bring some transparency to my analysis. And you see here that I have two dimensions or distinctions. One is between beliefs and perceptions on the left, so these are more sort of internal, meaningful, interpretive things. And then on the right, you have choices and actions, which are more tangible and observable. Then you also have an individual and collective distinction. And norms are collective level beliefs and practices that are dominant. Or to quote Dan Honing, who was an interlocutor, he said, we can think of norms as collective beliefs about each other's collective beliefs. Um, and the reason why I think about norms as beliefs rather than just dominant practices? Well, there are multiple reasons, but one is that um, as Christina Bicchieri, one of the dominant theorists of social norms, who does work a lot in development, she says that we can't think about changing harmful behaviors unless we know the decision factors behind why they're dominant. And I think Sharnik also made it really clear to us that teachers' perceptions and mindsets matter. And actually his co-author, Svetlana Sabarwal, was one of the interlocutors in this. Um, besides these group level norms, I also look a lot about individual level perceptions, partly because these contribute to norms and also because they're the mediator between norms and choices. And in terms of beliefs, I look at three types of beliefs, so self, standards, and situations, and all of these are embedded within society. And then I take these different types and I map them onto a framework which becomes the basis for how I analyze the interviews. So there are four domains here, selves are what I value, situations are what can be done in my classroom and school, and then standards or what those in charge, whether the ministry or the school leader or highly mobilized parents or other influential people, what they expect of me. And all of these are embedded within the broader domain of society. So where norms come in, according to my working hypothesis, is that I think norms are most likely to emerge when they're supported with or aligned with different domains. Um, it'll become clear what I mean by this later, but just to say really quickly, this conceptual framework and hypothesis and all come out of two main sources. One is the interviews themselves. So after my initial round of quoting the interviews openly, one recurring theme was that teachers, teacher norms are really profoundly shaped by their immediate environments and by their lived experiences, as you see in this quote from Kwame Achyampong. Um, also, my initial reading of key literature at this point came out in a number of different references. What you see on the screen is by Sadi Lalu. He's a social psychologist um, who's done quite a lot of applied work in industry. And he argues that the most sustainable behaviors in any social setting are the ones that are supported triply um, 
by physical space, internal space, and institutional space. Right, so I'm just gonna, I know that's been a lot of like theoretical blah blah. So here's, I'm gonna show you two concrete examples from the interview. So this first one is from Sophia Siddiqui, who was doing and talking about ethnographic work she did as part of the RISE Pet A work stream, which you'll hear about a bit tomorrow, um, about how, what the, I think she called it the making of a good school teacher. I'm paraphrasing badly, but in Hyber Pakhtunkhwa, province of Pakistan. And I'm gonna show you an example of a norm that falls in that pink bit. So it's supported by cells, it's supported by standards, but it falls outside of teachers' perceptions of what can be done. So it's likely to be completed, but just superficially. Um, so to start with cells, so Sophia was saying that, you know, teachers have multiple identities. They expect themselves to be good teachers, they expect themselves to be good bureaucrats, but they also have these societally driven identities. So whether that's related to, you know, things like being a working mother or aspirations to climb the socioeconomic ladder. Um, and just to complicate things for fun, while well also for realism, even the occupational identities like being a teacher are also driven by social religious ideals, right? And the problem is that all of these competing identities often end up taking time away from each other because teachers have limited time. And then when it comes to standards, one set of standards that the government expects is that there are these performance evaluation reports used to file for promotion. Um, and they require judgment of things like judgment and sense of proportion. The problem being, these are completely open-ended criteria, but they give you literally one line on the paper form to fill them in. And another problem being that teachers know based on other administrative documents and on just accumulated experience and observation that in practice promotion is based on seniority. So what happens is that, well, as you see on the screen here, when Svetlana asks, so senior teachers, how do you fill this in? They say, we just write good, good, good. Who has time to unpack what any of this means? So it's done super, it has to be done because you're a bureaucrat, but it's done superficially because you're pulled in all directions and you know, it kind of doesn't matter, right? So this other example, or oh, just to say, this is just a tiny example of Svetlana's like very, very rich, I mean, sorry, no, Sophia's very, very rich paper, which I really encourage people to read. But yes, this other example comes from Katleho Sangadi, who is currently a regional coordinator for teaching at the right level in Botswana with youth impact. But she's talking about when she was a novice teacher in Botswana. So, you know, in terms of self, she said going in, things she valued were like innovative teaching, you know, meeting the diverse range of students' needs. But then when she got to school, she just had so many students and so much to do, and she didn't have the support to help her meet her teaching aspirations. And then coupled with the expectation that it just seemed like the government and school leadership wanted her to do the curriculum and prepare kids for tests. So one norm, again, in this pink superficial box is finish the curriculum. Even if there's no way to get it done meaningfully, you do it superficially. And even if it comes at the expense of really meeting students' needs, and that's in the gray box because it's unlikely to be prioritized. Um, and all of this is further constrained by other things that affect your perception of what can be done in your situation, like the timetable. And then such that a norm that falls into the middle likely to be done box, because it's supported by selves and situations and standards, is that you just do the minimum you can to get your kids through it. Um, and all of this is, of course, reinforced by larger factors in society, like the fact that the job market is limited, so teachers just stay in the profession. This also means that some teachers, not Katleho, obviously, um, who are driven not intrinsically or not by sense of purpose, but by extrinsic factors, which further reinforces that do the bare minimum norm, unfortunately. And incidentally, this um, echoes an insight or shows really clearly an insight from authors like Sadi Lalu, who say that because there are multiple factors pushing toward the same goal, um, these, these factors can actually get people who either are new to the setting or who don't actually want to do those things to do them, to, which, both of which apply to Katleho. Right, so, why do I have the slide here again? Anyway, oh right, okay, so that was illustrating the framework. But then I really wanted to try to validate the framework a bit more, even if I forgot what I was going to say about it. So to do that, I did two things. And the first one is I did a more structured round of coding of the interviews. And this is an example of four sets of the, four of the sets of codes I used in this more structured round. So on the left, as you can see, for anything that an interlocutor mentioned as a dominant practice of priority, I coded it for both its content, so like a norm of collaboration, and then how dominant it was. And then... Um, for anything that was mentioned as a factor like you need to affect a norm, I coded it for what it was about and then which domain it fell in and for self-categories within those four domains. 
this is just a snapshot of one of the things. Like all for everything that was coded as a norm that was very likely to be done, there was reasonable support for my hypothesis in that all of those involved either formal or informal standards, and they also were co-coded with standards, I mean, with situations or society or both. The slight divergence from my hypothesis is that not all of these descriptions of norms that are likely or practices that are likely to be done involve teachers' cells. And I actually think that's mostly a data problem because most of the time my interlocutors were speaking as third-party observers rather than as teachers' cells firsthand, and maybe they just didn't want to be presumptuous. But anyway, so partly to try to get at that data problem and partly just to test my hypothesis more rigorously, I did a bit of a um, literature search to see what that would throw up. Um, in the interest of trying to do like a rigorous, well, rigorous-ish, but relatively efficient search among my inclusion and exclusion criteria, I searched for things like ethnography or ethnographic methods because I wanted to make sure that I had these like multi-dimensional descriptions of teachers' experience. Um, looking at time, I'm actually going to skip all of this, but basically I had pretty good, but in some cases not watertight support for this from that systematic search. But I wanted to end with two open questions and three takeaways. So one open question is that um, besides this thing about like, you know, being supported by multiple domains, I really wonder whether how clear a practice or priority is might also affect what becomes dominant or not. Because if you're being pulled in lots of different directions, it seems pretty plausible that how clearly specified those practices or priorities are or how clear the outcomes are might incline you to do them more, even if they're not necessarily what you care about the most. Um, unfortunately, that sounds plausible, but I think it's a bit less plausible that my interview data will let me investigate this rigorously, but I'm still wondering. Another thing I'm wondering um, is whether I should reconceptualize how I mapped societal influences here. Now, the way I framed it, as you can see, societal influences can affect cell situations or standards, but they don't really figure directly in those overlaps between what becomes a norm or not. And this is partly because I do think societal influences are you often filter through individual level perceptions and dominant norms. And partly really just for simplicity, because once you try to like diagram four things at once, it's a huge mess. But I do wonder whether I'm sort of underselling inadvertently how important society really is to these fundamental norms, as you can see in this quote from Masuda Bano, and I'm happy to mention that she will be presenting on this tomorrow morning. So we'll hear more about this fascinating work then. Right, and three takeaways. The first one is that, um, I think when it comes to systems thinking, you know, so looking at like interactions and feedback loops and complementarities, as much as I personally find the RISE 5 by 4 very, very useful, I admit that I have embraced the fact that I'm a nerd who has drunk the RISE 5 by 4 Kool-Aid. I do think that sometimes it might be worth centering a systems level analysis on the perspective of the main actor in question. In this case, teachers, especially because one theme from the interviews and actually from our internal rise conversations the last three days is that often we fail to take into account the voices and perspectives of people on the ground like teachers, parents, children. Second takeaway, um, this is, I think Dave Evans is in the room, but yeah, this is really just a reinforcement of the thing that I think everyone here is familiar with that, you know, it's not just about changing one textbook, it's not just about one more teacher training session, but really trying to change the interaction between what's going on in cell situations, standards, embedded in society, and that's how you get to lasting change. And um, I think that came out really clearly in like Andy and Jacqueline's presentation as well. But at the same time, another lesson from this asynchronous symposium mm -hmm. is that there are real limits to what individual human selves can concentrate on and there are real limitations in situations. So we can't try to do everything at once, as Laura Savage reminds us, but we need to be thoughtful and strategic. Final takeaway I wanted to mention is that, you know, loosely guided but open-ended conversations can be so fun and interesting, especially when they're wonderful, thoughtful people. So I just wanted to thank these people and to say, um, I think you will find the transcripts as fascinating as I did. I'm obviously biased, but do feel free to give me your email. I'd be more than happy to send you the full volume once it comes out. So thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, UAE and, um, and everyone for uh, very stimulating uh, presentations. If I may um, invite the speakers to come to the front and the people online uh, to switch back on their camera if they can. And then I should use the occasion as well to welcome um, the people in Abuja 
so we have a hub in Abuja uh, who is connecting. And um, we're going to take questions uh, from in batches from, from uh, you guys from the floor here. And I would also like to uh, invite people online um, to send their questions in text. And they will be, I, I understand Jason uh, will kind of um, summarize and pick some out and send them to me. So people in Abuja, can you, sorry for the late welcome, can you guys hear us? Yes, we can. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful to see you. So how we're going to do this is we're going to stagger the questions. So we'll have like a couple of questions from the floor here to get us going. Then we'll turn to Abuja and then we'll have a third kind of batch uh, from people online and we can see where we are then uh, with time. So let me open the floor here uh, in Oxford to questions and see uh, whether any of the live audience here, whether you have any questions. Raise your hand if you do, please. Okay, so let me pick some out. Ben, David, and yeah. So please, if, if you can speak up so people can hear you as much as possible. Sure. Thanks so much for the papers. My, I had many questions. I'll just do one. I'm going to start off with the right model. So uh, my one question is to Sharnik on the first paper. It really matches some of my priors about the teacher's inability to, to estimate learning outcomes. But I would love to hear a little bit about the alternative explanation, which is teachers have a lot of assessment data. The assessment data we're comparing against is just one round, if I understand correctly. And having seen some assessments being done in some countries, sometimes the assessments are not that reliable. So can we deal with the alternative explanation that maybe it's the, maybe it's the teacher who does know their kids and the assessment's bad? How do you know that's not the explanation? Let me just check in, Sharma. Can you hear us all right? Yeah, you could. Did, did you hear the question OK? Yes, everything okay, is perfect. Great. So let's, let's, let's collect the other questions. Uh, I think, Dave, you were next. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like Ben, I have a lot of questions, but um, we, one yeah, on... David, could, could we just start by everybody saying their name as they say their yeah, question, yeah, just because yeah, we're, you know, be yeah. a lot of people know each other, but some That's people right. don't, so. David uh, Evans, would you like I'm to... I'm David Evans from the Center for Global Development, um, and I have a question on this, uh, this great work in Indonesia that uh, Emily presented, and I... I'm just curious, this obviously echoes some stuff that we've seen in other places where they've introduced tests, and even though those have had some positive selection effects, they're just not predictive. It just seems like, overall, I know there are a few exceptions where you can point to some studies with a few stars here and there, but we're, I would say we're generally terrible at predicting who's going to be a good teacher. And so I guess I would just, like, taking your study, like, where would you go next on this? I mean, do we essentially kind of give up on that and just say, hey, it's all about, obviously we have a test or whatever, but in the end it's all about having a period where it's easy to fire terrible teachers. Or is there a direction that you see where we could potentially do better at this early screening? Thank you. Hi, my name is Shrikant. I'm from the University of Edinburgh. I have a question from, for Sharnik. Uh, there is substantial evidence that the cast of a teacher and a student uh, has important uh, implications on how they perceive student performance. So in your study, especially the ones in Maharashtra as well as Bangladesh, what was the composition of teachers and students? And were there similarities and differences between their own identity and that of the students that inform their interpretation of outcomes? Wonderful, thank you. So let's take these couple of questions and we'll, we'll, we'll turn to uh, Sharnak first. So, so question on what's the truth, right? Is it, is it the teacher or is it the assessment, uh, to put it blunt? And, and perhaps also on like the fragility of this. Does it not depend on the task that the student uh, fulfills? Can, can you enlighten us on that? Sure. So I think it was, um, it was an excellent question because, um, you know, one of the first things that we ended up discussing uh, once we had all of the results come in was that teachers do have access to a lot of data, right? But then... Uh, if if that's exactly what we are asking them to report on, is it that they have no idea about what this data shows them, or is it that the data is bad? 
I think um, one, you know, uh, we are pretty confident that uh, this this phenomenon is not driven by poor quality data because in uh, we tested this in two different contexts and the sources of data data are quite different, right? And the the one in India was independently administered by a team that was administered, um, you know, that was um, evaluating a teacher residency program, uh, so it's much more within the control of the researchers. Um, and but then the data that we have in Bangladesh was from national assessments. It was literally, you know, uh, it was it was administered uh, in 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 the entire country. It was completely within the purview of the government um, that that decided what the what the quality of data was was going to be. And both the sources of these data, when looked at similarly, were revealing similar patterns, right? So that sort of reinforces um, uh, our, our our confidence that uh, this is this is a general phenomenon that, that that perhaps exists. And number two, on um, on you know just just a comment on the amount of data as well. So one of the works that that you know that we're doing, um, um, Ali, uh, Shwetlana, and I, in, a, in addition to uh, Noah Mangus, who has joined our team. Uh, is to basically see how can we improve teachers' knowledge of students' skills, right? Uh, um, yeah, teachers' uh, knowledge of their students' academic skills by actually making all of this data that they have access to much simpler. If we specifically tell them how many questions in a, in a simple formative assessment if, uh, that that students get it um, that uh, uh, students get it wrong, and if we you know for instance flag those students who are uh, who need the most support, does that information does does the process of simplifying this information make it any better for teachers to keep track of their student skills? So that's for the first question, and for the second question on uh, you know um, caste or other identity match between the teacher and um, and and the student. Uh, this is something that we were exactly uh, able to test in India because we had a uh, variation on uh, students' class identities, and we we found that the uh, the estimations were uh, not any more accurate for those matches. Right. So if if, if you look at a a, a teacher whose um, um, caste identity matched with that of the student to whom they are reporting the estimations for, their accuracies were not any better than those uh, without these matches. We tested this for gender as well. So um, um, that was what we found. And and for Bangladesh, we uh, we we did not have as much um, as much variation um, as we did in uh, as we did in India for for um, for identity based stuff. But we checked it for gender alone, and and we found that the uh, the accuracies did not did not improve in any manner. So I'm going to turn to Emily uh, to reply to the um, teacher selection. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, David, for that uh, for that very important uh, question. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to um, emphasize that these were uh, this, this was data collected on uh, teacher students still, so they had uh, very little uh, experience in the in the classroom yet. I think um, so. What other studies have shown, and there's also another uh, teacher screening study within the Rice Indonesia team on more uh, experienced teachers. Um, they do actually find some correlations with uh, teacher observation in the classroom and their uh, and student learning afterwards. And also, uh, I think one thing that uh, selection is possible on is um, subject knowledge. So other studies are, I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? So uh, in order for, uh, for a teacher to teach a certain subject, they first have to understand the subject themselves. So I think that's definitely an important uh, factor that this other study in Indonesia also finds to be um, correlated. In this study, it was only uh, a small part of this knowledge exam. So this subject knowledge doesn't really, um, yeah, is, is, not, is not really a significant part of uh, the things here. So, so I, I, I think that um, selection based on this subject knowledge and for more experienced teachers, um, observation in the classroom can uh, still have some predictive power for uh, students uh, learning later, and which are, would be the good teachers. But yeah, observing teachers over a longer period of, of time just seems like a way more accurate and um, uh, more um, maybe also fair way for the teachers to uh, to make a selection. So. Great. So we're now going to turn, we'll come back to the room here, but we're going to turn to uh, Abuja for some questions. If I can press both uh, people who asked the question, the respondents, to be as concise as possible, given time. Um, so Abuja, over to you. Uh, if you can introduce yourself, ask 
your question in as short uh, a format as possible, and then we'll uh, come to the speakers. Okay. Are there any questions uh, there? Yes. Yeah, good morning. My name is Lucia Laban Colin. I'm an ex-official of the National Association of Proprietors of Private School, the FCT chapter. Right. And then um, I wouldn't know whether it's a question or a concern that I have based on the second presentation. I, I'm just imagining, I'm wondering if this study could be done or has been done in our own environment in Nigeria, where we are looking at this estimation. And then, you know, particularly considering um, how competition um, in the system is making a lot of teachers to want to just present a, a data saying my students are doing well, and then poor assessment practices. And in recent times, I've seen consistently how that it is critical that teachers, particularly because I'm familiar with the Nigeria and Africa particularly, are uh, being equipped with um, effective uh, assessment practices. Then the second uh, concern is along the area of uh, what drives change. It looks to me from the research that um, continuous professional development is critical. And uh, uh, when a teacher acquires new skills, the teacher is able to what I mean is most often wanting to I mean, make an effort to improve, adjust their teaching patterns. So for what effort is being made, you know, particularly when this research is uh, research outcomes are being passed on, what effort is being made? Is this kind of um, outcome being presented to like Nigerian government to make it you know somehow more mandatory for continuous teacher development? Do you have another question from from there? Okay. Yes, please. Um, good morning. My name is Dr. A.K. and I'm with the University of Abuja. Um, I have a comment, actually. I've listened to most of the papers and um, I'll be frank with you. I am intrigued. There are assumptions um, somehow that in that system, the teacher is uh, highly motivated. The students or the students or pupils also, they are also highly motivated to learn. What about this scenario? I'll be interested if it is also applied to Nigeria, particularly the Bostonian scenario caught my attention because it's close to what is happening here. Um, you know, statistically speaking, the, when you have the majority tending towards the particular trend, then it, it seems to want to represent the entire population. Now we're having an enrollment crisis. We have teachers, uh, I don't want to play statistics, I don't want to play percentage, but most of them are in the faculties of education, the college of education, they, they are not qualified to be there. They found themselves there by accident. Some of them in terms of English, in terms of maths, don't have anything to write about them. Now they are exported into the industry to go deliver content while they themselves are deficient. How do you bring it into this four paper that have been presented? Because I'm interested in what's happening in Nigeria. Now that's a Roman crisis in terms of the teaching core. What about the learning constituent? In terms, I'm talking about the pupils or the students. In our experience here, because of political exigencies, um, just long kids into classrooms, whether they are supposed to be there or not, just want statistics so that um, we have certain kind of um, certain kind of uh, output. Now, some of them are not motivated to learn. They are not interested in learning. They are more interested in peer pressure. And when you have these two contending factors in a particular ecosystem known as education or a school, the outcome is quite questionable. So I'm interested in seeing this kind of research um, come applied here. I wouldn't mind even helping out because here we have a crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let me take, looking at time, I'm going to take these two questions and um, throw the ball to uh, Jacqueline and Andy. 
uh, maybe for the first question and to UAE for the second one. So the first question, can you, can you enlighten us a bit more on, on, on the what driving change? Yeah? What is the role of, of mandatory uh, uh, practices? Can you, can you respond to that? Kathleen, do you want to have a go? Andy, please go ahead. <laughs> so, so he's, he's a person, it's better for him to answer and then I'll jump in. <laughs> um, so in terms of the mandatory professional development that is happening in Zambia, we actually, with the intervention that we're building now, we're not creating something new. So a lot of the the continuous professional development in, in Zambia already exists. So part of the follow-up that we're doing now is we're building a professional development intervention uh, for together with teaching at a right level Africa in Zambia is tapping into that. And in Zambia, there is an expectation that teacher group meetings happen, for example, in which teachers come together. Um, obviously, there's a question of like how much is that actually already happening, right? And what is happening in these meetings, right? Um, but for me, I went into the study and, you know, um, had heard previous comments as to like, you know, probably this is not happening, or, you know, maybe this is not having any impact and so forth. I was going into the study and thinking about, you know, a mentoring intervention and, and something tech-based maybe, right? But hearing from the teachers that this is actually a venue where teachers do come together and that this is actually having an impact of, you know, how they're, when and how they're changing their instruction, for me is encouraging. So this is where, how we completely shifted and we're now trying to exploit that, right? So there is something that is, is already happening that is mandatory, um, and we're now piggybacking onto that. But we're building also other things around that, and so and those are voluntary, um, and where we're building our own incentive mechanisms. We are building additional communities of practice. Uh, we're building WhatsApp groups, for example, um, and beyond the the how, by the way, we also uh, thinking very clearly about the what, right? So I don't think that these um, communities of practice work if there is a, not a clear message as to what you want to change, right? And so with teaching at the right level, for, uh, for example, there's a very clear understanding of the what. And this is what Jacqueline was mentioning before. You know, we, we know the medicine, right? We know the what. We know something like structured, in, uh, structured in, instruction. Uh, we know something like teaching at the uh, right level. So this is getting at the how. But we also have a very clear understanding what do we want them to do in these communities of practice, for example, in week two of the school year. In, year, in week two, they work on grouping and assessments, for example, in Tarl. So therefore, in week two, we want everything in that community of practice be focused on that, right? So it's this combination, not just about making it mandatory and making it that is happening. It's also about the what and giving very clear messages as what we expect them to do during that week in the school year. Wonderful, thank you. So maybe I'll turn to, to you, a, uh, the question on motivation, which I see as like, how do you translate this into the empirical side, right? How do you contrast your structured thinking with what's happening on the ground? Can you enlighten us what the, what, what the ways forward are? <laughs> yeah, um, the immediate answer to that is, that is, well, I ended with two open questions. This could well be another open question. It will be something I would love to iterate on, but I think, Circling back a bit, Doctor, I really do thank you for your comment because I think um, the sorts of complexities you raised, to me at least, but again, I know I'm biased, like reinforce in my mind the value of these frameworks that try to really get at all the different levels and different interactions affecting teachers' experience and different kinds of constraints, like you talked about, like motivation and access and resources. Although I apologize, I couldn't hear all of your comment. I will also caveat that like I have no pretensions to the data in my interview being comprehensive in any way. Um, given the number of people who I interviewed who are in this room, it's very obviously not a non-random non sample. I had certain benchmarks in mind for proportion of people I wanted who were from developing countries themselves, proportion of people who had teaching experience firsthand and gender balance, but I knew that there was no way I could be comprehensive. So again, hearing your experience in Nigeria is very valuable and you know, if you're, if you are open to, as you mentioned, looking into this further and thinking about this together, yes, please do like, look for my email. I'd love to be in touch. And thank you again for that comment. Wonderful, thanks very much. I'm, I'm looking at time and unfortunately, the painful, the painful thing we've got to live with is that time is constrained. So I know there's many more questions. Um, I'm going to 
try to stimulate and invite you to follow up here in Oxford. We're going to get coffee now. Uh, online, please don't hesitate to contact each other, right? Uh, because this is continuation of a discussion. So to zoom out for a minute before uh, we take a break, I think the wonderful thing about a program like RICE is that it doesn't shy away from the difficult questions. Uh, so often in academic research, and I'm, I've certainly been uh, in my capacity as an academic, have made these mistakes as well, you look for the, you, you look for the keys under the lamppost. And so often we make that mistake, right? And I think RICE has been very brave in looking around in the darkness. But of course, the consequence of that is that you only, take, you only make partial answers. You come up with partial answers, you often raise more questions than answers. And I think this session is deliberately one of these sessions where we know a lot about teachers. And maybe some of us thought, gosh, what else can we do? I think we kind of document here that there's a lot more to do. If this would be the end of RISE, I'm in full denial. From a research perspective, there's much more to do. We're getting our questions better. So I think on all the issues that were uh, discussed uh, on admission, on selection of teachers, there's much to do. On understanding how teachers make beliefs, form beliefs about their students, there's much to do. On how change comes into being through a system, we need to know more. And then, of course, on the last part as well, on motivation, it's a topic I've kind of worked on as well. It's really hard to do this empirically. And so to, to think a bit more about how we structure our thinking, uh, that's already very helpful. We still have a long way to go, uh, but we're making much progress on um, kind of understanding how this works. So I would like to invite you uh, to take a break, and at uh, 11 sharp, we'll start with the next section. Thanks. <laughs>
Hey, Ken. I'm good. How are you? No, we should have four. Who's missing? Can I start talking to them? Uh, I'm going to start talking to our online participants, just as our uh, in-person participants file in. I believe some people have had issues about uh, being able to ask questions. So this is a reminder. I think these details were in the information when you first registered. But just as a reminder, you need to go to slido.com and then use the link to the RISE conference. That link has just been posted on our Twitter feed. And it's also been posted on the description on the YouTube channel. And you can go back to the original email that you got. So that will be the way in which we will collect questions from our virtual participants. Okay? And we hope in the next session to be able to do so. Because I think we've got around 90 people online. OK, I will hand straight over to Louise. Thank you. Welcome. Um, get yourselves seated. Um, this session is billed as being about learning, which is highly appropriate in an education uh, conference. Um, but my suggestion to you and to the present, while well, it's hard to change your presentation based on what the chair says at the beginning of a session, it's already done. But maybe thinking going forward is think of learning not just sort of in the abstract, but the amount of learning that you can squeeze out of a bundle of inputs. Okay, the amount of learning per input or per set of inputs. Because when you look at around the world that white countries are, and by the way, I think a little bit of the discussion from Malawi yesterday was quite interesting because the minister was saying, look, we're in the dumps uh, when it comes to learning. We have 115 to 1 on average people teacher ratio in primary. We can't expand secondary. But, you know, they're spending 4% of their GDP on education. So what gives? 4% is not bad. I mean, it's, it's not up to the international average, and it's not fantastic. But compared to places like Liberia or even Korea during its great takeoff, was spending way less than 4% of GDP and took off educationally fantastically. So, what gives? You know, so, you know, there could be structural issues, age structure. If the population is extremely young, then it's hard to make the budget go far because you just have a lot of kids, and, and, and that's hard to do. And we've known that for 30 or 40 years, uh, 50 more, whatever, for a long time, um, that age structure matters. Um, so that's one thing that could be going wrong in, in any given country. Um, the other major thing that could be going wrong in any country is that whatever you manage to get out of GDP to spend on education doesn't go far because the inputs are so expensive. Well, pretty common sense. If your classrooms are costing $15,000 per classroom, which is the case in a lot of countries, you're just not going to be able to build many. And if your textbooks are costing 6 or $7 when they ought to cost $1, as Ben Piper has demonstrated, you've got a problem. And there's a type of analysis that's good for that, which is analyzing the market for those inputs. And by the way, one of the things economists, I thought, ought to do and are trained to do is to analyze markets, right? And yet, m most of us don't, except uh, the glorious team of Pakistan. Uh, you know, uh, are they here? You know, you guys are actually analyzing markets. That's, that's brilliant. It's not being done by almost anyone else. 
Uh, I wish it turned to analyze the market for inputs, not just the market for outcomes or whatever, or market for schooling, places in school. But understanding why books are costing $5 instead of one is really important. Or why teachers are costing 10 times GDP per capita when they ought to be costing maybe three or four times. Um, so expensive inputs is one barrier. And I suspect some of that's going on in Malawi. But the biggest barrier is once you've grabbed your money from the tax base, once you've bought your inputs, which may be too expensive, unfortunately, how much learning can you squeeze out of a bunch of inputs? That's the third most powerful, or, or third powerful determinant of how much learning is going on in a country. And if you look at the really successful cases, uh, Paul, like Vietnam, I bet that some of those, I bet that all of those things are lining up correctly, and that's why Vietnam is a star. You know, they, they have a decent tax base, I suspect. The population is not too young, and their inputs are not too expensive, and they manage to get to squeeze a lot of learning out of your inputs. So what we're going to be doing in this session is looking at, you know, squeezing learning out of a bundle of inputs. Um, and, you know, the various approaches, we're going we're to look at them. You know, value added is a kind of obvious one, you know, because it's adding value to the, to the stock or, or, or basket of inputs that you have. How do you value add uh, to that? That's a very, very relevant topic. The other, the other papers are, are along uh, the same lines. So without um, further ado, um, we'll take them ideally, I think, in the order in which they are in the program. I think that keeps me sane, keeps you sane, keeps them sane, perhaps. Uh, so let's go. So Kane. Thank you, Lewis. So I'm going to talk about the RISE Ethiopia program, which was a, essentially a, a broad brush evaluation of Ethiopia's General Education Quality Improvement Program, GQIP. Uh, that program was rolled out nationally and has a very large number of inputs. And just as Lewis was saying, Ethiopia is a country that is trying to stretch relatively thin inputs across a very wide number of schools and regions. Uh, it's a country with a relatively low income per capita, but nonetheless it's also got very s significant challenges of expansion because it's a country in which since 1994 there has been very rapid expansion of access to education. So this is work that I've done jointly with Moses Akech who's here, uh, Jack Rossiter who's here and Dawit Tiruna who is online hopefully. So the background to the, to the work, as I said, is that in Ethiopia, the GQIP program has been actually three phases of uh, large-scale government intervention to improve the inputs to schools, and particularly the inputs in relation to teacher quality. So a lot of teacher training, teacher upgrading, improvement in uh, teacher recruitment and teacher deployment, but very many initiatives implemented in, in really quite a large scale across the country. And we don't have nationally representative data, so I'm not going to present here a robust evaluation of the impact of GQIP. And in fact, that, that would be quite difficult, given that, in, in fact, we've had in Ethiopia over this period of time declining learning levels. So outcomes have not improved on average. In fact, they have deteriorated. And that's not perhaps uh, uncommon. And it's, it's in line with what was shown yesterday, for those who are here yesterday, in relation to Indonesia. Actually, the graphs look quite similar to those in Indonesia. So we've got rising enrollment, especially in disadvantaged areas, which of course brings in more, relatively more disadvantaged pupils to the schools, so arguably can make the job of the teacher more challenging, although you don't quite have the 115 pupils per class that you have in Malawi. So our questions were essentially what, what patterns and trends can be discerned in learning progress in grade four, which was the grade we were studying specifically over the period from 2012 to 21, 2021, that's what we've got three surveys for, which come from the Young Lives Programme and from the RISE Programme. And then given that we can't discern improvements in outcomes, we focused really on the question of equity. So is it possible that even in an environment of reducing outcomes, you could still have some improvements in equity? And then that's the question, of course, for GQIP, because GQIP was not just a programme about inputs, it was also a programme about improving equity and focusing on more disadvantaged areas. So as I said, we've got three data sets which are carefully linked together. So the Young Lives data collected in 2012 and 13 was a survey of grade four 
grade four schools in all of the Young Lives sites, which are a purposive selection of sites across Ethiopia, so not nationally representative. But it's longitudinal in the sense that we collected data, including learning outcomes data, both at the beginning of the school year and at the end of the school year. The same design, almost exactly, is used by the RISE program Grade 4 survey, which does the same thing in 2018 and 2019. So the same baseline and endline. Very similar geographic base, except that it doesn't include the AFAR region. Uh, both of those surveys include observations at school level, classroom level, and teacher level, including a test of teacher pedagogical content knowledge. Then the, the final survey, the second RISE survey, which was funded additionally by the Gates Foundation, took place in 2020 to 21. Same design, baseline and endline, excluding this time the Afar and Tigray regions because of conflict in the Tigray region. Uh, and this includes the teacher test, but not observations at the school and classroom level in addition to that. Uh, and that's partly because the, the budget was smaller, but also this is during the COVID pandemic. So the second phase, the end line for that, is just after the end of the lockdown in Ethiopia. So other findings that are relevant to this work, which I'll just briefly comment on, which will come out of the RISE Ethiopia program, are first of all that in the common schools that are included in all the surveys, we do see, as I said, a decline in average learning outcomes, which is equivalent to one year of schooling. So pupils in grade four by 2021 had learnt one year equivalent less than pupils in 2012. So that's the kind of scale of the decline in those 33 common schools. Difficult for us to say exactly what's the cause of that because we don't have data on grades one to three. We only know that in these cross-sectional studies across time, there has been a decline in grade four. We suspect that most of that took place in earlier grades, right? The, the fact that kids are coming into grade four with lower learning outcomes is because of something that's happened in grades one to three or in preschool or before that. But we also know that those students are on average more disadvantaged, right? So some of that is going to be differences in home backgrounds. And there is one study which has been done by Meselli, who's probably here as well today, I think, uh, which uses propensity score matching to look across those grade four classes to see whether or not when you match students with the same background characteristics, have they still got lower learning outcomes in 2020 to 21? And yes, they have. Actually, most of that gap cannot be explained by differences in backgrounds. And nonetheless, as I said, there have also been improvements in the schools. So there is a bit of a mystery there, which I think Lant was pointing to yesterday in the sense that there is a reduction in learning outcomes despite certain other things that are going on in the background, which ought to be positive. So in addition to that, there have been uh, some declines which are probably linked to uh, coronavirus. Uh, that is something that we will comment on, but it's much more difficult to get at. Uh, there are, of course, more first-generation learners coming into the system, but as I said, that in itself is not a sufficient explanation. And importantly, we don't have any evidence for declining progress levels in grade four. So actually, when we look across the three surveys, progress made in the same grade is much the same uh, across the three. There isn't really a reduction in progress. And that's telling us that, in another sense, school quality hasn't declined. OK, so looking at questions of equity rather depends on how we define it in terms of what we think the trend in equity has been. So there are very many different views on equity. And Luis and I wrote a paper about that early on in the RISE program. So for example, there is in Ethiopia a greater fraction of children who now have access to all stages of education. So that in one sense is an improvement in equity. But probably there is a reduction in the, in the fraction of pupils who reach meaningful standards, such as, for example, being able to read by grade 10. There's probably fewer pupils in school who can read by age 10 by 2021 than there were by 2012. But of course, there is a larger number in school. So if you ask the question whether or not more 10-year-olds can read, we can't answer that. We don't have a nationally representative survey. But maybe, maybe that stayed broadly the same. There's also been a, possibly a reduction in the gaps that you could call inequitable, uh, i.e. those that are not based on effort, which could relate to, for example, quality of schooling. So even if students haven't learnt more in school, they are in schools which have, on average, better teachers, better infrastructure, better school quality in some observable sense. Now, that doesn't mean, it depends how you'd like to define equity, doesn't it, whether, whether that is a better thing or not. But it seems that being in a better equipped school with a better trained teacher ought to be a good thing, even if that takes a long time to feed through to improvements in learning outcomes, which it likely does. 
So a better learning environment is an improvement in equity. And there is possibly a improved focus on disadvantaged children in the sense that although on average levels have declined, the proportion of that decline which is attributable to students from disadvantaged backgrounds isn't actually that large. A lot of it comes from reductions in progress among the more able pupils. Again, not necessarily a good thing, but it's the same thing that we saw in Indonesia yesterday. So this is a graph where I've linked all of the surveys uh, across the regions in Ethiopia, and you can see that in each case there is uh, a baseline and end line. So the first one is young lives, the second one is the first round of rise, the third one is the second round of rise. So taking place across that long period of time, the biggest decline is between 2013, the Young Lives Survey in Grade 4, and 2018, the first RISE survey. And these data are for the common 33 schools. So it's not every school that's included in all these surveys, just those that appear in all of them. And they're not the same children, of course. These are cross-sections of children of the same age in the same schools. So the pattern is quite consistent between 2013 and 18 in that there is a decline in every region in average learning outcomes. Uh, the 2021 measurement is right after COVID, so actually I don't think that looks quite so depressing. And I think there are some signs that, certainly in the more advantaged regions like Addis Ababa, that there is perhaps some recovery of learning outcomes towards the levels that they were in young lives. And perhaps you could say that 2018, in some sense, in those regions, is the low point. And that would be consistent with what we can say about students' backgrounds in 2018, because looking at how those have changed, in the urban areas we can see that there has been a slow improvement across the whole period in caregivers' literacy. So pupils have become, in urban areas, more advantaged in that their parents are more likely to be able to read, for example. Uh, in rural areas, that's gone down uh, as more disadvantaged children have come into school. That average has gone down. But then by 2018, all those background indicators have started slowly to rise. So that's a possible interpretation of that, is that you know, the maximum point of disadvantaged pupils entering school has been reached, and that's bottoming out. So the U-shape of disadvantaged is increasing uh, sorry, well, disadvantage is going down on average as almost every pupil is in school and you've got rates of enrolment well into the 90s in most parts of Ethiopia now. So on average, as the country has economic growth, you've got improvements beginning from 2018 on average and maybe that just takes time to feed into learning outcomes. If we look at the uh, improvements in teacher inputs which are associated with the GQIP program, you can see that there's been quite significant improvements. Perhaps the biggest changes have been the recruitment of new teachers. So the average teacher age has declined, average teacher experience has declined, as much more young teachers are coming into the, uh, into the system. But improvements in content knowledge, uh, in specialization, in training, and in degrees, university qualifications, are all notable, even if not statistically significant. They're all pretty much positive, and in many cases are statistically significant. And if we take just one example, that's the teacher pedagogical content knowledge test, you can see that particularly in rural areas, the teacher's content knowledge in mathematics has improved quite dramatically between 2013 and 2019. And then both in urban and rural areas, it's improved slightly uh, between 19 and 21. So teachers in that sense are better prepared to teach maths than they were in the past. Now, to unpick this puzzle, we've looked at it in several different ways. And one question is, who's, where is the progress coming from? So everyone is, in a sense, making average progress of about 45 points on our scale, but you've got, in a sense, a redistribution of where that progress is coming from over time. So survey one, the Young Lives survey, it's still the case that the weaker students, those in the, in the lowest decile of the baseline score, are making more progress on average. Now there's parts, part, lots of reasons that could explain that, some of which uh, relate to the test conditions. It may be easier to make progress if you're already at the bottom of the test than if you're at the top. But that pattern changes, and it's pretty much the same test. The test we're using in these three cases is a linked test with many of the same items. So by the third survey, almost all of the progress is coming from the weaker students, those who had lower scores to start with. Uh, and in the second survey, you can still see a strong trend that 
students with low test scores are the ones who make the most progress. So they catch up and there's a redistribution during the year. Now, as I said, this partly may be to do with test effects, but it's also a possibility that more qualified, more professional teachers are better equipped to actually improve students who are further away from the production frontier, if you like. Those students whose knowledge is further away from the curriculum maybe need a teacher who can better adapt. So then when we ask the question about whether or not you know, this, this can be explained in a, in a value-added model, we still find that students uh, with lower test scores are the ones that make more progress and that they tend to be in schools which also make more progress, but not necessarily schools which are uh, adding more value. So when you prepare a value-added model which separates out school effects from other things, it's not surprising to see that students who are more advantaged with higher test scores actually are in better schools, as it were, because those, school, those students live in urban areas, they have more supportive parents, etc. They're better able to select the school that they attend. But there is some reduction over time between the Young Life Survey and the RISE Survey in how much of a gap school effectiveness creates between weaker and stronger students in terms of disadvantage. So, again, it's a complicated picture. What I'm saying is that there may be an improvement in equity in distributional terms. There may be a narrowing of gaps uh, in progress made between more and less advantaged pupils. But on average, progress has stayed the same. So you could call it a zero-sum outcome. Finally, so uh, questions on this one go to Jack because it's getting a bit complicated by now. But this question is... To what extent do students in the same schools benefit more or less from teacher and school quality? So what we've done here actually followed an example that comes from a paper by Paul Glevy and others, including me, where we did this uh, for the Young Lives data in Peru and Vietnam. And we just estimated separate fixed effects for schools, uh, sorry, school fixed effects separately for children in more and less disadvantaged groups. And we've got three groups here. The, the more and less advantaged in SES terms, more and less advantaged in starting scores, and more and less advantaged in terms of gender, male and female. There's no difference on gender, and there's only a difference in the RISE 2018 and 19 survey on students' ability. So students coming in with higher test scores benefited more from school quality in that survey, so that's where the difference between the fixed effects is statistically significant. But in all of the other surveys, there was no difference. And ideally, you would hope in this sort of analysis to see no difference because that's telling you that schools benefit pupils equally, whether they're boys, girls, whether they are more or less able or more or less uh, advantaged in socioeconomic terms. OK, so finally, to comment on the equity implications of all this, in one sense, the disappointing thing is that the absolute sense of equity in terms of what children ought to be entitled to, the learning that ought to be possible for everyone, has declined. So in that sense, on average, everyone is worse off. In another sense, equity of access has certainly improved, and access to school and teacher quality indicators has improved. So it may be just the question of how long that takes to feed through. So there has also been an improvement in the relative position of lower performing and more disadvantaged pupils in some sense, and that is, again, I think, an equity improvement. It also suggests something similar to the paper by Natalie Bao and Jishnu Das, which kind of contradicts Lant and Amanda's paper about the overambitious curriculum in the sense that you see pupils furthest away from the curriculum frontier making the most progress. And that's something, I guess, which really does depend upon the ability of a teacher or at least other materials in use. And then finally, so that question of are teachers better able to adapt is one that we are looking at further through other kinds of analysis. But in general, overall, I would say these findings, in a positive sense, are consistent with a system that is turning around and beginning to put in place all of those things that might improve learning outcomes, but that's not really yet feeding through. Thank you. OK. <clears throat> Can I ask the other presenters to be a bit more disciplined with the time? Uh, you went over by about two minutes which is, I can't calculate the percentage. <laughs> um, so, initialist, uh, let's go.
Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present this paper on the joint role of school and home inputs in children's learning in the context of Vietnam. It's a joint work with Pedro, Michele Gianola, and Sonia Kutikova. It is. Oh. <laughs> it's well established that development during childhood is critical for lifetime human capital. Uh, accumulation, and there is a growing body of literature trying to understand the role played by key actors, schools and parents. However, the roles have been studied in isolation. The childhood development literature focuses on how important parental investment is in child skill development, but doesn't talk about the role of schools. On the other hand, the school value-added literature focuses on how having access to good quality teachers and school could have a positive impact on children's learning outcomes, but do not talk about the heterogeneity in home inputs and how they affect uh, children's skills. Clearly though, children's learning outcome is a combination of both these inputs, and in order to understand how skills are formed and what drives formation of inequalities between children, we need to bring these two literatures together. So we do so in the context of Vietnam, which is a particularly interesting case. Uh, here we plot the log GDP per capita and average PISA score, and we see Vietnam, which is on the top left, is an outlier among the low income, low medium income countries with respect to its high learning achievement for its low income level. So in order to understand, understanding this achievement is both policy and academically relevant question. And in a, in a companion paper, we tried to estimate teacher value added, and what we see is that variation in teacher quality alone explains less variation in primary school pupil attainment as has been seen in other contexts like in Ecuador or Pakistan, which suggests that differences in home inputs and furthermore how they interact with school inputs or how they are dependent on school inputs could play an, an important role in understanding variation in children's learning outcomes. So this motivates the aim of a paper and we model the joint role of school and home inputs by estimating child skill production function separately for mathematics skills and verbal skills. We also do that for the combined academic skills. We are only aware of one other paper by Augustin Reddy, which looks at this joint role of home and school inputs. However, they do so for a very for a developed country context, US, and look at children who are joining, who are just entering kindergarten. We also want to study whether home inputs adjust to the quality of school inputs by studying parents and children's responses to this input. There are a very handful of studies that look into this response of parents' behavior to school inputs, and the finding, findings have been mixed. For example, Darcy all in the context of India and Zambia find there's a perceived substitutability between the home and school inputs. They find that parents reduce uh, private educational expenditure with respect to anticipated increase in school grants. On the other hand, Atanasio and all find the case to be completely different or the reverse in the context of UK. They find that there's some, there's a, uh, there's a complementarity between home and school inputs. So for this study, we collected data from two adjacent cohorts of students, the one that started grade two in 2017 and the ones that started grade two in 2018. And we test, we sampled 20 students per class from around 140 schools, so we have a two-class, two-cohort design that helps us to disentangle the school effect, teacher effect, and classroom effect. We tested around 5,000 students per cohort from 140 schools, and we test them on mathematics and reading skills in the beginning of grade two. At the end of grade two, grade three, and grade four, we, don't, we not only test them on these cognitive skills, but we, with the, for a subsample of students, we also test them on non-cognitive skills, and we also collect detailed information of the children. So we interview the children, we interview their parents, we also ask teachers particular questions with respect to those subsample of students. So this detailed data gives us some measures of the home inputs. So in order to estimate our skill production function, we need these two key measures, the school inputs and the home inputs. So using the education literature, we capture the quality of school using the latent fixed effect and leveraging a rich data set which has two classes per school, we redefine our classroom effect with respect to the average 
school, if, uh, with respect to the average school effect. And this gives us variation in classroom quality at school grade year level. So we capture the school input with this demeaned classroom effect. For the home input, we use the detailed caregiver interview and we measure home input through three, to three measures, material, parental material investment, which is the educational expenditure on the child in the last 12 months on a range of inputs, including study books, tutoring, extracurricular activity, et cetera. Then we also have child time investment, which includes the time spent by children studying independently on their own at home or doing homework on a typical school day in a typical school week. And the third measure is the parental time investment, which combines the time spent by parent with the children on several activities like reading or telling stories, doing uh, art or playing sports. So we use these three measures as to uh, proxy our home inputs. So this is our empirical specification where we regress the end of year test scores. So it, this could be mathematic test scores or reading skills or the combined math with Vietnamese skills. And we regress it on a vector of home inputs as described before. The C is the class fixed effect which captures our school inputs and X is the vector of all the controls for the home environment like maternal education, uh, students' age, gender, household wealth, et cetera. In order to address any um, issue of omitting inputs, we also control for students' prior skills, which is my Y at T minus one. So we exploit this two class, sorry, I should have mentioned this before. We exploit this two class per school setting in order to address any issue of sorting of teachers and children into schools. So the results from this regression is presented here. What I want to point out is that there's a significant and positive relation association between our school input and student skills, which is my leave one out combined value added. So one standard deviation increase in school quality leads to almost one tenth increase in students' test score. The, if you look at column three and four, what we see is that the returns to home investments is moderated by the school investments. So in the column four, when I control for school investments, the returns to home investments, which is material and time investments, goes down, but it, and also one of them loses significance. But it still shows that parental time investment and child time investment are positively associated with children's test scores. We also want to see how the returns to home investments vary with children's latent ability. So in this table, we interact um, different inputs, both school inputs and home inputs with students' baseline score, which is from column five, six, seven, eight. And we also interact home inputs with school inputs to see how they change with the different levels of input. The first result I want to point out is the positive relationship between baseline score and parental material investment. What it suggests that parental material investment has higher returns for more academically able children. We also see that there's a positive relationship between child's time investment and baseline score, which also suggests that children's return to child's time investment has higher returns for more academically able children. The other res result that I want to point out is the negative relationship between the school input and child's time investment, which suggests that having access to good quality school is more important for students who spend less time studying independently at home. Um, then we want to see how parents perceive the school quality to be. In order to do so, we asked parents questions about how, what they think about the quality of the teacher and the school, and they have to rate them from one to five. So we take the average rate for each teacher, averaging over all the parental responses who were in the same class, and we regress this average rate on the actual quality captured through the class value added, and we see there's a positive relationship. So one standard deviation increase in the quality of classroom leads to almost 0 0.04 point increase in parents' rating of the teacher. So 
So this suggests that parents have an accurate perception about the quality of the teachers or the classroom. We then want to see how they actually respond to the school quality. So to do this, we estimate the following model where H is my measures of different home inputs and we regress these home inputs on the school input captured through classroom fixed effect and all the other control variables. So what this, the results from this is presented here and we see this again a positive relationship between school inputs and home inputs. So in our context of Vietnam, these parental material investment and child time investment, so the home inputs are complement to the school inputs. So one standard deviation increase in school quality leads to almost 0.12 standard deviation increase in parental material investment. So this suggests that both parents and children do respond to improvement, to respond to the school inputs. So the results we have so far is that both school and home in inputs are important for the development of academic skills. Specifically, parents as well as children own time investment are strongly associated with this attainment. We also find that the returns to parental material investment and child's own time investment is higher for, for children who are more academically able suggesting that for child's time spent studying to be conducive to learning a, minimum, a minimal baseline level of achievement might be required. We also find that parents have correct beliefs about the quality of school input and they respond to improvement in school quality by increasing both material investment and time investments at home. So to conclude, we, we, uh, we want to point out that whenever we, we in order to in order to estimate the skill production function, we need to take into account both the school, school inputs and the home inputs. And it's also very important to recognize that parents' decision making is dependent, is determined by their belief about the school input and their preferences for children's utility and their utility. And we need to take, and we need to take into account that if households adjust home inputs in response to school input, then taking this response is important in order to have consistent estimates of scale production function. Okay. That's it. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Kane, you owe her $100. <laughs> she gave you two minutes, 25. <laughs> huh? Hundred dollars or $50 a minute. $50 a minute, yeah. That's what I'm gonna start charging people. <laughs> we create a little market here. <laughs> So, uh, next speaker, um, Alice Danun, uh, will be talking about uh, cognitive and social emotional skills in what country? Do we know? In Pakistan. In general? It's going to in be Pakistan. Pakistan, yeah. I would um, love it if people put the name of the country in there. Because one pet peeve of mine is how we put papers out that say, you know, Parental attitudes matter in one country. So, suggestion for the future. Thank you. <laughs> Name the country. Okay, so. Huh? <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to present our paper now, now called Cognitive and Social Emotional Skills in Pakistan Construct and Predictive Validity. <laughs> this is joint work with Jishnu Das, Andy De Barros, and John Filmer. Okay, so we have two goals in this paper. The first one is to carefully measure cognitive and social emotional skills, for example, of young adults who are originally coming from rural Pakistan. And we focus more specifically on the measurement of social emotional skills because they have proven difficult to measure in low income settings. And then we want to describe the relationships between education, skill formation and labor market outcomes, taking into account the prevalence of migration for the population of interest. So what do we find? First, we make considerable progress on the measurement of social emotional skills. I will show you that our measures satisfy desirable psychometric properties. Then we also find that years of schooling are strongly correlated with cognitive skills, but not with social emotional skills. And finally, the three measures of human capital that we use, so education, cognitive skills, and social emotional skills, are all strongly correlated with labor market outcomes for both men and women. And the relative roles of the three measures is closely linked to migration status for men. 
So, uh, what's the motivation for this study is that research has shown that social emotional skills are a key component of labor market outcomes in high income economies. But the patterns in low income countries are unknown, especially for rural samples. One of the reasons for this lack of knowledge is that social emotional skills are difficult to measure in these settings. For instance, in a study um, of far or farmers in Kenya, Lajaj and Makur find evidence of systematic measurement error and low internal consistency for their measures of social emotional skills. So here we are able to show for the first time how different skills measures, including social emotional skills, correlate with labor market outcome in Pakistan for an unusual sample of children who all come from 112 villages and then fan out to more than 1,000 locations 15 years later. So in the next part, I will show you the context and sample we study. Then I will turn to the measurement of skills. Um, and finally, I will describe the relationship between schooling skills and earnings before concluding. So we have a sample of 5,865 young, young adults who are originally coming from rural Punjab in Pakistan. The sample is coming from the LIP study, which is a longitudinal study of education that started in 2003. As part of the first round of the study, the team surveyed 1,807 uh, households and collected information on 5,865 children who were between 5 and 15 years old at the time. There were four follow-up surveys of the households between 2004 and 2011. And in 2018, we decided to conduct a long-term follow-up of the child sample from 2003 who were no longer children, but were young adults and on average 24 years old. And we tracked them to wherever they were now living in order to survey them. So we managed to collect information for 84.5% of our sample, which um, gives us an implied attrition rate of above 1% per year. So here I want to draw your attention to a very uh, important aspect of our sample, which is migration. So as I already told you, the sample had moved to more than 1,000 locations by the time we conducted the long-term follow-up. Um, so it, it, and we really tracked them to wherever they moved. So it took us two years to do it. Uh, it was very challenging, uh, but our field team did, really did an amazing job. And so we have pretty clear, a pretty clear view of migration patterns for our sample. Um, so here I'm presenting you the pattern separately for men and women. Numbers for men appear in purple and for women in uh, green. Uh, so the first thing we can see is that 35% of men have migrated, while 43% of women have. And uh, men tend to migrate to big cities such as Karachi, Lahore, and even go outside of the country. We have 10% of the sample uh, who now live outside of Pakistan. Uh, women, on the other hand, tend to move within their own, uh, their, their original district. And the reason uh, for these different patterns for men and women is that they don't migrate for the same reason. So female migration is mostly uh, due to marriage, while male migration reflects uh, work opportunities. So um, I will now turn to um, the measurement of uh, skills. So we measure both cognitive and social-emotional skills. Uh, for cognitive skills, we assess the competency in Urdu, mathematics, and, and, uh, and English, sorry, uh, using both a test on paper that we had used in previous rounds and an adaptive test on tablet to capture the variation in cognitive skills in our sample. And for social-emotional skills, we relied both on self-reported instruments and tasks that we administered on tablets. So the, we use two self-reported scales uh, I'm sure, that I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. The first one is the grid scale, uh, which was developed by Duckworth and Quinn, and where grid can be defined as the combination, the combination of passion and perseverance for long-term goals. And then we measure the big five personality traits that encompass five dim dimensions of personality, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extraversion, agreeableness and emotional stability. For the tasks, the first task was called the go-no-go -no -go tasks and measured impulse control. So the respondent has a tablet and on the screen there is a square that appears that can be of different color. 
And if the square is of any color but black, the respondent has to touch the screen as fast as possible. Then the second task measured risk-taking behavior and is called the balloon and other risk, risk task. This time the respondent is presented with a balloon that they can pump. Each pump uh, earns them real money, but also increases the likelihood that the balloon might pop. And if the balloon pops, they lose everything. So based on these different instruments, we construct one cognitive skills index and one social emotional skills index. For the cognitive skills index, we simply aggregate all the items, uh, all the questions for each subject into an Urdu, mathematics, and English scores using item response theory. And then we average the three subject scores into one single index. For social emotional skills, we aggregate the items from the self-reported scales and the scores from the tasks using principal factor analysis. So we assess the validity of the social emotional skills measures in different ways. And I'm going to focus on two, on, uh, two of them in this uh, presentation. So first, we conducted exploratory factor analysis. So we analyzed the patterns of correlation between the item variables to infer their relationship to the uh, index of so social emotional skills. And unlike previous work, we find that the items mapping from factor analysis closely matches the theoretical construct of the scales. Then we also evaluate the internal consistency of our measures using the Kronbach Alpha statistics. So these statistics measure the intercorrelation of the item of a scale, and so we can interpret it as the extent to which uh, this it the item of the scale measures the same underlying concept. And so we find Kronbach, uh, the statistics ranges between 0 and 1, and the rule of thumb is that it has to be greater than 0 0.7. We find Kronbach alphas uh, from ranging from 0 0.53 to 0 0.75 for the different scales and subscales. So some are, slightly, uh, some are slightly above the rule of thumb, some are below. Uh, but as a comparison, in their study in rural Kenya, Lajaj and Makur found Kronbach alpha for the same constraint ranging between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. So now, in the remaining uh, five minutes, I will walk you through uh, the relationship between the, I will describe the relationship between schooling, skills, and earnings. And I will st we will start by looking at the relationship between uh, years of schooling and skills formation. So in this table, I'm presenting you uh, in the first column, the correlation between years of schooling and cognitive skills. And in the second column, the correlation between years of schooling and social emotional skills, where we also control for the respondent sex. Uh, and what we can read is that there is a very strong correlation between years of schooling and cognitive skills. And additional years of schooling is associated with an increase in the cognitive skills index of 0 0.17 standard deviation. On the other hand, the correlation between years of schooling and social emotional skills is very low. Then I'm going to present you two sets of descriptive correlations. So first, I will show you um, a regression of the monthly income on our measures of human capital. So schooling, the cognitive skills index, and the social emotional skills index. And we also include age fixed effect in the regression. And then in the second specification, I, we interact each of the human capital measures with an indicator for being outside of the village which uh, that will allow us to look at the patterns separately for uh, those who stayed in their village and those who migrated. So uh, in this figure, I'm showing you the outcome of the regressions for the sample of men. Um, in blue, you can see the coefficients from the first specification uh, together with their 95% confidence interval. And so, what we can see is that an additional years of schooling is associated with an increase uh, of about $2 in their monthly wages. For the cognitive skills index, an increase in, of one standard deviation is associated with uh, about $9 increase in monthly ages. And for social emotional skills, it's about $15. Uh, and so, so that you have an, uh, an idea of the order of, the, of magnitude, the mean monthly wages for men is of $135. 
But then the second thing that is really striking from the graph is that there are very different patterns depending on the migration status of, the, uh, of our respondent. So in green, you can see the um, outcomes for people who left the village and in uh, red for those who stayed. And so for men who stayed in the village, there is precisely zero correlation between years of schooling and earnings, while the correlation between social emotional skills and, and earnings is very strong. Now, if we switch to looking at those who left the village, the patterns are completely reversed. So there is a very strong correlation between uh, years of schooling and earnings, but no correlation between cognitive skills or social emotional skills and earnings. Turning to uh, women, the first thing that is important uh, to note is that labor force participation in the sample is extremely low, so of about 6%. So I won't show you the, spec the specification uh, with the interaction terms because most of the women who left the village are not working. They got married and they're not working. Uh, so if we look at the full sample of women, we can see that an additional years of schooling is positively uh, associated with earnings. The coefficient is of one uh, dollar approximately, uh, which represents 17% of the mean wages. Um, and this reflects both higher participation and higher earnings. So then we can switch to looking only of the, at the sample of women who are working. It's a very small sample, sample but uh, we can see that there is also a positive association between schooling and earnings for uh, those women who are working. Okay, so just to conclude, I just showed you that the, all of our measures of human capital are strongly correlated with earnings. And I, j I want to leave you with three uh, thoughts. So the first one is that our measures of human capital can explain at most 13% of the variation in labor earnings for men and at most 26% for women. So we, um, even with these comprehensive measures of, of human capital, most of the variation in labor earnings is left unexplained. Then the second uh, point is that if we were to interpret our estimates as causal, uh, one standard deviation increase in cognitive skills leads to uh, an increase in lifetime earnings of about $800, which is more than five times the current annual spending of $132 per child. And so it provides a useful and fairly high benchmark for how much we should be willing to spend. And the third point is that if, we are, if there is a program that is able to improve social emotional skills, then we should be, we should be willing to spend much more money on that. Uh, but of course, our correlation patterns also reflect selection. And so I, we think that the next uh, important step is to assess the plausibility of these estimates as uh, reflecting causal links. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next presenter on centrality-based spillover effects is uh, Michael Lasopoulos from the internet uh, somewhere in space. <laughs> or he's not here, right? No. no yeah. Not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, please proceed. Thank, thank you. Hello. I, I hope uh, you can hear me. Hello. Yes, hello. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me in the room. Okay, so um, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, you have 15 minutes starting whenever you start speaking. Yes, thank you. When you're at about 10 or 5 to go. Okay, I, I hope you can see the, the slides. I'm going to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for... Um, uh, including the the paper in uh, in the program, and let me uh, express my uh, regret for not being able to be there <clears throat> in uh, in person. So I was uh, planning to make the trip uh, this morning, but alas, the train strike uh, prevented me from from doing so. 
So this uh, paper um, is joint work with Asad Islam, Yves Zenou, and Zing uh, Zhang, and they're all uh, who are all based at uh, Monash University in Australia. I'm uh, Michael Vlasoblos, and I'm based at the University of Southampton. So what we're uh, interested in this uh, project is on understanding the role of uh, social network structure in peer-to-peer -peer, uh, educational spillovers. And we're gonna study uh, this, uh, this question in a sample of, uh, of schools in uh, rural uh, Bangladesh. So by means of, of, of uh, introduction and, and motivation, uh, let me, um, uh, our starting point is that there is indeed a, a, a large uh, literature on uh, the role of peer effects uh, in, uh, in, in education. And it, this literature has uh, established <clears throat> quite, you know, quite, dip, uh, quite range of different settings that the composition of the classroom, whether it's to do with gender, with, with race, or, or even ability, uh, matters for the educational outcomes of uh, of students. Uh, yet the uh, the of overlaying the uh, composition of of the classroom uh, is 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 a is a net of um, uh, social uh, relationships that uh, connect uh, the the students. So students are are embedded in the in uh, in in a, in a social network within. Uh, their classroom, and yet the role that those social relationships uh, play for uh, the strength of uh, peer or educational uh, spillovers uh, has not uh, received a similar attention in the literature. So, uh, in other words, one, one might imagine that in classrooms where uh, students are uh, connected strongly with uh, with social uh, in, in with friendships with friendship with each other we might expect that peer effects would be stronger relative to classrooms where these uh, relationships are are weaker that's the the underlying uh, motivation and why studying a network structure for a knowledge uh, spillovers uh, is important uh, is because if, if, we, if we can better understand, um, how uh, the uh, uh, network structure impacts those uh, those spillovers, we can uh, inform the design of uh, uh, targeted interventions, so interventions that would target target uh, most uh, influential, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, students in order to to maximize the uh, benefits from the spillovers. So. Uh, let me come to uh, spe more specifically uh, what we do uh, in uh, uh, in the paper. So we are asked the question of do more uh, central students, central in the sense of how um, popular, um, uh, if you will, uh, they are um, socially, uh, whether uh, those students generate stronger uh, spillover effects to their uh, classrooms, to their to their classmates. I'm sorry. And we um, study this question by uh, carrying out a large uh, randomized control trial with uh, primary uh, school students in rural uh, Bangladesh. So our sample includes about 14,000 uh, students, grade three and grade four students across over 200 primary schools in uh, rural uh, Bangladesh. And in a nutshell, what uh, we do is to uh, offer an educational intervention, which in our case is private after-school tutoring, uh, to a random subgroup uh, of uh, students. We do that in 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 a randomly selected uh, subgroup of the uh, schools in our sample, and then we compare uh, outcomes uh, relative to a, another scenario where we target. In a, in another subgroup of uh, randomly selected uh, subgroup of schools, we uh, offer the intervention to the most central uh, subgroup of students in each class. And then we uh, collect at, uh, this is um, a, a two year uh, program uh, or a program that um, takes place over two years. And we collect uh, both uh, educational outcomes measured by standardized um, um, tests in uh, English and math. Uh, but we also collect 
uh, information about their non-cognitive skills as assessed by the tutors and also crucially for uh, what we're interested here, information on the friendship network of the students in, in the baseline before the intervention takes place. So uh, what we, uh, how we proceed with uh, the analysis is given, given the uh, description of the design I've just uh, presented is to uh, exploit the exogenous variation across classrooms in the degree of network centrality of treated students to be able to uh, causally identify the spillover effects of this uh, uh, intervention. So that's one type of analysis uh, we're, we're, we're interested in. The second uh, type of analysis, which is possibly more policy uh, relevant, is to compare outcomes of treated and untreated students when uh, the intervention is offered randomly to, to, to a random subgroup of students to when it's um, uh, targeting the most uh, central uh, students in, uh, in the classroom. And in, in terms of the uh, findings, the answers to these two uh, questions or to these two um, uh, types of analysis. So for the first um, issue, uh, we find that uh, centrality-based spillover effects are indeed uh, uh, large. So we find that one standard deviation increase in the average centrality of treated students to leads to improvements uh, by, um, and I'm sorry, this is a typo here, it's about 0.3 standard deviations in English and, uh, and in math test scores of untreated classmates. Uh, so we find and we, we therefore document that um, uh, so more central uh, students do exert uh, stronger uh, spillover effects to uh, their classmates. And then uh, with regards to the second question, we find we find that uh, the uh, offering the intervention to most central students improves improves the average outcomes for both uh, treated and untreated students relative to the random uh, intervention. So it does seem to be the case that the targeting uh, approach, uh, offers a larger educational benefits than uh, the one that randomly uh, selects stu target students. So I'm going to uh, skip the, the literature and come to um, um, covering a bit more ground uh, in, on, in terms of what, uh, what we do. So to give you some uh, flavor for the context, the study uh, took place in two uh, districts in the south uh, of, of, of Bangladesh, which you can see highlighted here at the uh, south um, west corner of the of the country. Um, and in terms of the intervention, uh, as I said here, the uh, I'm, today I'm mainly uh, interested in uh, presenting you the um, uh, spillover uh, effects effects of this intervention. So really. We are uh, aiming to, to engineer an increase in knowledge of students, of, of treated students, to be able to, to examine to what extent those that increased knowledge gets uh, influences their, their, their classmates. So the, the intervention is a free private tutoring um, that was offered outside the school, after school, uh, over the course of the two academic years. Uh, it took place over three days a week for um, uh, two hours in each uh, uh, for each session, and the uh, people who uh, delivered the um, the tutoring were private tutors that uh, were hired by the program and who were uh, local uh, recent university uh, graduates and received training at the start and regularly through the program. So. Let me uh, come to uh, the experimental design. So the schools uh, in our sample are randomized into uh, four groups. And I want mainly here today to talk about treatments one and three because they are similar in the sense of the content of the intervention. It's this private tutoring intervention. The only difference across them is that in treatment one, a random sample of uh, subsample of students in each classroom receives the intervention versus in treatment three, we um, offer the intervention to the most central uh, students as me measured by eigenvector, their eigenvector centrality, which measures, measures not only how connected they are, but also how connected 
their uh, uh, connections are. Okay, so uh, so this is an overview of the experimental uh, design. As I said, we have in to a total of uh, 14,000 students and in terms of uh, treatment saturation, about 80% of uh, students in each treatment arm receive the intervention. That uh, rate is a bit lower in, uh, in treatment three in the, the targeted uh, intervention. Okay, so the, the, the tight line, this was a two-year program. So we have pre-program um, uh, test scores, and then we collected test scores in uh, halfway in the, at the end of the first year. And then at the end of the second year, we collected also various types of uh, household and uh, network uh, information. Now, uh, I'm going to um, focus uh, today on the spillover effects. So the, the program had um, important uh, direct effects on treated uh, students, but I'm mainly um, interested today in presenting you the spillover effects. So here is a table presenting uh, regression results where the outcome of interest is either uh, the English test score or the math test score, and then the main variable of interest here is this uh, capital E bar, which is the average eigenvector centrality of treated students in one's classroom, and um, the columns present the test score uh, 2013 is the, the baseline, so before the intervention, so we see no, no effect as we would expect. Um, so it's a form of a, of a balanced test. And then 2014 is the midline and 2015 is the end line. And you can see that for both English and math, we uh, find about a 0.3 standard deviation uh, uh, improvement for a one, one standard deviation improvement in the average centrality of treated students that leads to a 0.3 uh, improvement of um, the test score, 0.3 standard deviation improvement of the test score of an untreated uh, student. We then uh, ask the question of uh, how do these um, centrality-based spillovers come about? And we look at the characteristics of the most central students uh, to try and make some progress on this question. So what we see is that uh, they are both uh, academically, academically on average stronger, so on the basis of their baseline test scores, but also in terms of the non-cognitive skills, they have strong um, social skills. And then in surveys we conducted, we found them to report to engage uh, with, uh, uh, with their classmates in schoolwork related matters, uh, more so than non-central students. So we think that uh, centrality uh, not only captures uh, these uh, the the um, connections that students have, but also captures some sort of latent ability of the students that makes them more um, um, more able to uh, to transfer the knowledge that they receive in the tutorial groups to their um, untreated students. How am I, how am I doing for time? Uh, you have about one minute left. Okay, so I, I, the last thing I want to uh, say, which I think is quite interested, interesting, is comparing uh, treatment one and treatment three, uh, so the targeted versus the random approach. One might be concerned that if you target the most central students who are already, as I've shown, uh, more um, able or educationally able, uh, that might lead to uh, inequality. So what we did is uh, compare um, and this is what, what this uh, pictures of vigor shows is the uh, CDF of, uh, of um, uh, T1 schools, the, the test scores of T1 schools and T3 schools. And what you can see for both treated and untreated students, and what you can see that the red line, which corresponds to uh, T3 schools, right, lies uh, to the right. So we don't see um, any uh, evidence of increased dispersion. So there seems to be an overall improvement uh, taking place in the targeted uh, schools for both treated and untreated students. So let me uh, conclude. Uh, we study the role of position in social network for uh, education spillover effects in a large field experiment in uh, primary schools in Bangladesh. And we document that exposure to more central classmates generates larger uh, benefits to untreated students. And we also show that targeting central students generates more benefits for educational benefits for both treated and untreated students than random provision. Uh, so our kind of conclusion here is that targeting seems to be 
uh, a promising approach for educational uh, interventions, and but of course, more uh, evidence is needed and we are uh, working towards uh, producing that uh, additional evidence and we hope that other colleagues also uh, will join us in. Thank you very much for your okay. attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael, for managing the time uh, so well. Um, well, these papers are so interesting that only I will ask questions. <laughs> just, just kidding. Uh, but, but I certainly could do it. I, there's at least 10 points that deserve 30 minutes each. So we could be here for 300 minutes, uh, but we won't. Um, so two from the room, two from Abuja, that I don't know if they'll come in verbally or, or in yeah, text. Virtually. virtually, but verbally or, or in text? Video. Video, good. So two from the room, two from Abuja, and then uh, online, uh, if there are any, the, from, from the broader internet. So two from the room, uh, let's see. Uh, why don't we go with people that I don't know? Let's just use that as a, <laughs> as a selection factor. The gentleman over here with the hand up, and the woman over here with, uh, right there, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know actually whether I know you or not, <laughs> maybe, maybe we've met. Let's go with these two. Thank you. I'm Peter Hinton. I'm a student here at DPhil at Oxford. Um, I'm very interested in Vietnam, and I'd like to ask you a question because my reading on Vietnam is there's a thing called socialization, socializing in Vietnam, whereby parents are encouraged to contribute 20% of the cost of education to the school, either in cash or in kind. The schools are better equipped with materials and so forth, um, which is a funny way round of doing uh, public-private partnerships effectively. So I'm interested in whether you looked at that as being part of the explanation of why parents are contributing materially, because it's actually a, a cultural norm that people are encouraged to do that. Okay. Uh, let's take the second. Let's take all the questions just to be efficient. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Sopatnika. I'm a master student at the UCL IOE. At the Institute of Education, and my question is also regarding Vietnam. Thank you, Anusha, for that talk. Uh, I was wondering what you found about private tutoring in Vietnam and how much that has an effect, and how you basically included that in, in your analysis. Is the cost of private tutoring uh, included in the parent investment? Um, and if so, is there a relationship between private, the the expenditure on private tutoring and learning outcomes. And also I had a question for Alice very quickly. Why is it difficult to measure social emotional skills in low and middle income countries? I know you just kind of like mentioned it in passing, but I didn't get why it should be difficult. Human beings are the same everywhere, no? Okay. <laughs> tricky, tricky asking two questions in one. But we'll, we'll, it will be allowed. Uh, so two questions from Abuja. And hopefully you've self-organized to select which two. We can't hear. You're muted, it seems. Yep. My name is Dominic from CC. Uh, my question is about the study on uh, joint through of schools uh, and home input uh, in children learning. I want to ask if the um, are the school continuous in terms of they are all government or all private or in mix and if it is mixed, uh, the result varies by the nature of school. In the sense that parents naturally Sorry. Would, would send their kids to a school whereby uh, they return to education. Uh, that, that, because the finding shows that. Um, I'm sorry, guys. The, 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 the sound quality, quality, the sound quality is better. The sound quality is terrible. Nobody can hear. Can you put it in, uh, are they able to, can you please put it in writing because we just cannot understand. It's a terrible sound quality. What? So uh, what, what, you? What, while you guys get organized to send them by text so do we don't waste a lot of time, we're gonna text, uh, we're gonna take a question from the internet. Why don't you guys get organized to be able to put in, uh, your questions in writing, please? Um, okay. So let's take one from the internet then. Um, so we have two online. I can just do both. Yeah. So Alice, the first is to you from Matthew Dukes. He says, you are lumping together very different skills. 
for example, those that can be improved, such as impulse control, and those that can't, such as big five, can you disaggregate? And then to Michael, um, there is a question from Andrea Doger, and um, they are asking you, what are the implications of teacher classroom instruction? So what can teachers do to maximize these positive results? Okay, Abuja, did you have time to get organized to type your questions in uh, text? If not, we'll move on to the answers. Uh, I'm going to pressure them to answer quickly so that there's a guarantee that you will get your questions asked. Please put them in writing. So uh, please, uh, let's just go in this order from you to you to you. Uh, I, was there one for Michael? There was a question. Okay, so then let's just go in the, in, in the order in which they're seated then plus Michael. And answer quickly so that Abuja definitely has time. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I, th I thought all the questions were targeted to people. Were they? They were. Uh, the targets are sometimes mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, Ken. First question was. About the material and the, like parents are oh, socialization in Vietnam, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that I can't answer the question about how you've accounted for that in your paper. Obviously, I haven't read it, but I mean, it is a big thing. Um, so, socialization is. Uh, a, a way exactly as you described of bringing parents income into the school um, and I guess how you how you're going to account for that as a contribution it's going to look like that was uh, school expenditure yeah so, so what so we uh, agree that we, they have to invest in like some kind of give uh, donation and stuff like that so we only look at the discretionary material investment like things which they like we're removing the school fees and whatever expenditure they have to make we only look at discretionary educational expenditure like extra study materials or desks, computers in their home, and we only look at the material investment in that regard so that we can see variation in that regard, but not the ones which is compulsory for all the parents. Okay. Let's move on. Why don't we take your questions? If, yeah. there, if there was more than one, I can't remember. Uh, so the first one is was why uh, was uh, social emotional skills difficult to measure in low income countries? I think the main answer is that um, we usually use self reported skills in high uh, in developed countries to to measure these skills. They have been developed in in <laughs> for high income countries and tested there, and then we just transpose them to another setting. Uh, a lot of these concepts are abstract, so sometimes it's difficult to translate in the local language. Uh, the other thing is that usually there is an enumerator asking the question in this context where it's like rural samples from Pakistan, not everyone can read, so there is an, an, an enumerator bias entering in, while in high-income country you just self-report you know, on your computer. Um, but, uh, and, and, uh, Lajaj and Marcor find uh, evidence, for instance, that uh, their respondents in rural Kenya tend to say yes to the enumer enumerator and things like that. Uh, and I would actually refer you to their paper, which is uh, very uh, good and gives a lot of insights about these questions of why it didn't uh, work. Um, and then on the second part, I agree, we are uh, lumping together uh, different skills. Uh, first, on the big five, I mean, there is a question on whether they can be improved. I think something like conscientiousness potentially can be improved as we uh, studies have shown that grit can be improved, for instance. Uh, but yes, we can disaggregate to some extent. The more we disaggregate, the less reliable our measures become. So there is kind of a trade-off uh, there. So we didn't want to push too far on uh, exactly, uh, you know, on disaggregating, but uh, we, we can do that. Um, okay, I was, thank you. Was there one more question? Yeah, about private tutoring. About private tutoring where? To me. To you. <laughs> Good. Go. So, yeah, so in Vietnam, there's a full day, half day culture of students, and a lot of students who do half day actually go for private tutoring and extra, extra classes. But this is like part of their school time, time spent in school. So when we look, we are finding it difficult to disentangle what private tutoring and extra classes are because they asked questions about, do you go for extra classes or do you go for private tutoring? And we don't see a lot of variation across students. Almost everyone who goes for either extra classes or private tutoring. So given that there's not a lot of variation in this, in the student, in the sample, we are not able to see the effect of these particular private tutoring and extra classes on. Sorry, but it's the same thing. It means the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but then we, we don't. Almost every student in a sample either goes for extra classes and private tutoring, so we do not see variation coming because of that in the skill development. with respect to socialization, which is better termed societalization, 
frequently that occurs within the school sometimes is discretionary spending if the parents want to put their kids in a quote quality classroom or a quote selective classroom within a public school there can even be variation within a single public school okay um, wasn't there a question for michael yes michael go yes thank you so uh, the question is uh, what are the teacher um, classroom instruction implications of of the findings and um, this is this is a, a very good question so we we think that the targeting uh, results uh, suggest that if you're operating in an, an environment with uh, resource constraints which is a very common feature in, in in developing countries and and beyond then as a teacher you might be in a position where there's some activity or some benefit you can offer to the students but you might not be able to offer it because of the resource constraints to everyone, or you might need to introduce it in a staggered way. And I think the results here, our results would, would suggest that you might want to prioritize st students that are more central because th not only would they more benefit more from, uh, from the intervention, but they would also uh, be able, they're better placed uh, to uh, impair the, the the knowledge they acquire from the intervention uh, to their classmates, so you might get uh, the kind of uh, highest uh, uh, return from uh, from in terms of learning. So to go back to um, the initial discussion, this would kind of maximize learning uh, per unit uh, invested. Okay, great. Um, so Abuja, um, did you type the questions? You're not able to type the questions. Well, they have not got a question? They, I think they're having some technical issues. Oh, technical issues. So, um, well, then let's take uh, two more from the room and maybe one more from the internet, something like that. Two more from the room. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to continue the process of asking questions from people I don't know just to create more of a chance. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Moses, um, here. And, well, I may need to, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, my name is Abish. Uh, I'm a D for the first year D for student over here in Oxford Department of Education. Uh, so I'm Babesh and I'm, I'm a D for student over here at the Department of Education. Uh, my question is towards, uh, um, I know it's a stats project completely, um, but uh, mine's a bit of qualitative. Um, and I wanted to understand that during your research in, in Vietnam, um, uh, and you were talking about the involvement of the home uh, and the involvement of uh, the school uh, for the child uh, and the investment of parents uh, towards. Um, in the Indian context, um, there are cultural differences as, um, amongst people from the higher and the lower sections of the society classes. Um, and even if somebody who's from a class setting which is not um, the dominant section, let's say a minority, even if they're putting in more time and more effort, um, still the student is not doing very well in the classroom because of certain skills and certain abilities and certain cultural values that they're not able to trans transfer. Um, do you see something like that in your study in Vietnam? Um, I know it's a bit out of... Uh, okay. Thank you. Sorry, we've got a few questions from Abuja. Okay, so let's go to Abuja. Uh, two questions from Abuja, please. Read them both at the same time. Yeah, so the first one is from Michael from Cynthia. It says, were the children observed and how were they able to affect learning in untreated children? Um, and then for Alice, any special intervention for illiterate parents? Okay, thank you. Great questions. Uh, why don't we go uh, Vietnam, Michael, Alice. Um, so we haven't looked at the differential impact on of these inputs with respect to the minority and uh, majority, but we control for household wealth, and we don't we haven't seen that being a major reason driving the variation. We also have a good majority of minor well, there's almost twenty five percent minority students, so we have a good sample of that, but we haven't disentangled this effect yet. I mean, I, something to consider for sure. Okay. Michael? First, did you get the question? 
Yes, uh, yeah. let me repeat it just to make sure I got it right. Were children observed and how did they uh, impair uh, knowledge to the untreated students? So um, no, children uh, were not uh, directly observed. This, was, this is a large project, as I said, it involves about 14,000 um, children. So we, we, uh, we didn't have, um, uh, observation was not part of our uh, design. Uh, we did though um, survey uh, the students at different points uh, in time, and what uh, we can uh, we can see, what we can tell, is that the uh, more central students report to um, differ in in how they uh, they go about uh, how how in, the, in their social schemes and how they go about interacting with uh, with their classmates. So they report to report to to uh, uh, talk more to uh, other classmates, uh, to uh, approach others with, when they uh, face difficulties uh, regarding studying. And so there's, I, I, I think uh, there's some, some evidence of, of them having these uh, um, both higher social skills and also a tendency uh, to uh, interact with other classmates for uh, sc uh, schoolwork. But of course, I think uh, we need to understand this, uh, this better and some uh, interviews and qualitative analysis would uh, would definitely uh, help us better understand uh, these uh, these mechanisms. Okay, thank you. And then Alice. Uh, so, so the question was interventions for illiterate parents, right? I think uh, so. I'm not too sure how I can answer that question with the paper we wrote, but uh, because we have a sample of young adults who are not parents necessarily, uh, but I think a promising uh, intervention could be something uh, trying to move uh, social emotional skills. And so basically anything that can help us understand uh, how these skills are formed and if we are able to um, affect them would be a promising intervention. I'm not sure I'm answering the question. Okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you did your best. Um, okay, we actually have two or three minutes left, so Moses? You had your hand up, and I neglected you in favor of. <laughs> <laughs> then it must not have been that important. Good one, I liked it. But the question is to Alex, actually. I wanted to know did you find, did you capture the type of jobs these people do for the honey? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, they do very different jobs with, uh, depending on where they live. So, most people uh, inside the village, uh, for men, do like daily jobs while people in living in cities do, are more like likely to be salaried and stuff like that i can't I, we also have more details about like the exact occupations but i don't have them in the so top of my mind so i we didn't look i could look the only thing i know is that farming is a very small share of the sample so even for people who stay in their village uh, not a lot of them are uh, in farming but uh, we didn't look at the variation depending on the occupation so we can do that from Kane. the internet? Uh, from Abuja. From Abuja, okay. Yeah. Um, so to what extent does the socioeconomy status of the student help in dealing with equitable access? I'm not sure I quite get it, but I may, maybe there's several ways of answering that. Does, does it mean, for example, that our socioeconomically more advantaged pupils better able to get access? I mean, yes, they are, but that's something that is improving. So in Ethiopia, regardless of socioeconomic status, access has improved, and particularly for the least advantaged. We don't know if that answers it, do we? Yeah, it was probably typed really fast. I think that's about it. <laughs> okay. There's literally two minutes left. So if anybody had, I think Amanda had her hand, okay. hand up. Ready, yeah, <laughs> go. For Kane, I was just wondering if he could maybe just thoughts on maybe why learning went down. Um, you know, in, in Indonesia, we don't we don't think it's due to enrollment. We have some hypotheses about curriculum changes and time spent on math instruction, but it's challenging to kind of pinpoint it. I think that for us, what we can say is that it's not happened in grade four. So learning hasn't actually declined in grade four in any of the ways of looking at it. So if that were also true in grade three, which it seems like it ought to be, then it, it logically looks to me like a lot of it must be to do with what's happening right at the beginning of school. So students are coming into school with lower levels of school readiness, poorer quality uh, pr pre-primary schooling. Now, 
that is something which has exploded really in Ethiopia in, in the sense that, you know, back in the Young Lives days, less than half of the students had access to pre-primary schooling. Now there's more access, but I think of a much lower quality. It, would that be fair, Joe? So I suspect a lot of it is, is going on right on at the early stage. There may be some issues of, of spreading the resources, like Lewis was implying, thinner in the school. But if that was the case, we would see decline in the progress made in grade four. So I suspect it's not that. So foundational learning and skills at entry. So thinking about all of the foundation kind of together uh, would seem to be a, an important bit. That uh, puts, puts us at 12.30. And I have developed an ulcer in my tongue from biting it so that I wouldn't abuse the question <laughs> session. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm such, a such a giving chair. I haven't abused the chair to ask my own questions, and now I have a little bleeding in my tongue. But go lunch. out there is for us and then the military people are somewhere else um, apologies for the long line at coffee we've split the food up across the forum so split yourselves into different lines to try and make it a little bit more efficient and we will start bang on time at half past one with the session on positive and negative <laughs>
Hello. Are we on? Not yet. Okay, welcome back from lunch. Let's get seated and start the third session. So this is a session on positive and negative deviance and outliers. So I put up this premise to engage with it from the beginning. The point is that in every community, you will find a few individuals or organizations practicing uncommon but accessible behaviors that allow them to successfully overcome intractable social problems without access to extra or special resources. So these are the positive deviants, the islands of success. So this session is about the PDs. I don't know who is keeping the time. Yeah, sure. So we have four nice papers that we are going to have in this session that are talking about positive deviance and negative deviance. And they come from different countries. So the focus is to identify positive deviant behaviors and also say something about how those behaviors can be replicated in neighboring and similar contexts. So we'll hear from Vatsal presenting about Tanzania and focusing on lower primary grades, grades two and three. And he will tell us about teacher practices, teacher beliefs, and teacher preparation. Then we'll move on to Simon King, who will tell us about early grade reading in Kenya, Nepal, Uganda, and Tanzania. The focus here will be on the non-positive deviants. The third one will be from Sierra Leone, a study of Sierra Leone, a very nice case study in Sierra Leone, focusing on secondary school, English, and math. And we'll hear PD strategies that are being used. And then finally, we have Sheena and Mina Hill online, who will take us through uh, a study from Ghana, focusing on five districts, a study of management practices and routines. So. Without any further ado, I'll ask uh, Vatsal to start. And I'm very conscious that we need to recover the five minutes we lost at the beginning. <laughs> so where's the yeah, clicker? Yeah. Awesome. OK. The clicker works. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vatsal. Um, and today I'll be presenting a paper where we use machine learning techniques to understand which teacher characteristics best predict student learning outcomes. Um, and uh, my co-authors on the paper were uh, Dion, Filmer, and Shvetlana. Uh, I was basically a research assistant for Shvetlana for two years um, until very recently. And this, this is where I was fortunate to co-author the paper with her. Um, and both of them couldn't come here because end of fiscal year is a very busy time at the bank. So here I am 
<laughs> awesome. So I'll get I'll get started. So our our basic research question was um, what what does make a teacher effective? Um, and and when we were researching the literature, what we found was that there's very little evidence on which teacher characteristics exactly matter for student learning outcomes. So whether it be um, teacher experience, teacher qualifications, teacher practices, what exactly is it about a teacher that ensures that their students end up learning? Um, and this is basically a lot um, in the teacher value added literature where people like Raj Chetty, um, have, 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 Jishnu Das have, have written a lot. Um, and what they've found consistently across countries is that observable teacher characteristics like age, um, experience, gender are never um, uh, consistent predictors of student learning. And even when they are, they don't explain more than 5% of the variation in student learning outcomes. And most of the evidence based is also in developed countries. You have a few studies in Pakistan, uh, India, but uh, Ecuador, but all in all, it's, it's mostly based either in the, in the United States or other developed economies. So the main question is, what is it about a teacher that best predicts student learning outcomes? And the context of our study was, how do you figure this out when you have a very high dimensional data set, right? So you have 50 variables, 60 variables, 100 variables, rather than like 15 or 20. In such a scenario, um, OLS um, uh, does not perform as effectively um, as it should. So in, in such a scenario, when you have very minute data about every teacher, right? You know, you know so much about that teacher, how do you filter out what is effective and what is not? And in this scenario, um, how do you conduct variable selection, right? And teacher effectiveness, the literature um, is based uh, mostly on teacher value added, where uh, the variables, the functional forms are a lot based on the discretion of the researcher, right? So you can have a linear model, you can have a log linear model, but it's based on the discretion of the researcher. So the way we thought about this is, we don't know which factors or what about a teacher can interact in which type of way to actually affect student learning. Uh, and this is where we wanted to apply more flexible techniques and which is why we chose machine learning. And it's not like um, very um, advanced machine learning, right? So it sounds like a very intimidating thing, but uh, it, it's actually like, very applicable and, and quite simple once you get into it. Um, and like why we chose machine learning is because firstly, there's no, there's very limited researcher discretion on how you build the model. So like one of the models, which is a random forest, you don't need to specify how the variables interact with each other. Um, how do you figure out like, are they additive or are they multiplicative? It's all done by the algorithm basically. Uh, and you can incorporate very flexible and interactive relationships. And the, the good part is it can actually take in like 50, 60, 100, 200 variables on and, and operate on any data set. Some cons um, are that it can sometimes read too much into the data. So any, any signal, um, any signal it picks up, even though it's just random white noise, uh, it can actually take as a, as a, a as a meaningful relationship, right? So our study was basically based um, out of Tanzania where uh, what we basically did was we had students from grades two and three uh, across um, six regions in Tanzania and the schools and the teacher cohort and the student cohort was very representative of the national sample. Um, and we basically tried to analyze it for two subjects. So for math and Kiswahili, we had about 2,300 students and about 340, 50 teachers based out of 270 schools. Um, and the dependent variable in our study is basically, we tested the students at the beginning of the year, we tested students at the end of the year, we calculated the differential, um, and what we did was, if a teacher is teaching 10 students, we average that differential across those 10 students. Right? So if I'm teaching 10 students, what is the average student learning gain from the start of the year to the end of the year? And that becomes my dependent variable. Uh, and this was broadly like the distribution we saw uh, in terms of what's the percentage improvement in mathematics and Kiswahili from the start of the year to the end of the year for uh, children in grades two and uh, in grades three. And we, and we do find like there's an average improvement about, of about like 15, 14, 15%. Um, for, for Kiswahili and, and a little higher than that for math. Uh, and the overview of the explanatory variables, like the independent variables, we had 52 of them. Um, so we had student level controls, uh, we had school level controls, and we had teacher level controls. Uh, and uh, focusing on teachers, we had very minute data on 
who these teachers are, how they think, what their underlying belief systems are, how do they actually practice in the classroom, are they writing things in, in, in the notebooks of students, are they reviewing concepts after class, are their students afraid of these teachers, and, and we also try to capture very internal beliefs, uh, which is something my, uh, which is something Shwetlana is uh, very passionate about. So we had a module in our surveys capturing um, uh, very minute details about teacher beliefs, right? Um, so these are th this is uh, a broad overview of like the kind of teacher variables we had. So uh, teacher characteristics like basic, like gender, years of experience, education level, in terms of knowledge, we, we tested the teachers as well on their math and uh, Kiswahili competencies. And we also tested teachers on what's the knowledge of like, how much do they know about their own students? And we also uh, incorporated teacher training variables. In terms of behavior and practices, again, as I said, we have very minute variables. So um, for example, with teacher beliefs, right? Uh, one belief that we really uh, asked them a lot about was what do they think about underperforming students? So we asked teachers, um, is there, um, can you really help a student learn if a student comes from an underprivileged background or if the, their parents are not as well educated or if they have too many personal problems and there was basically an agreement or disagreement sort of Lichter scale uh, uh, variable that we have, right? Uh, before turning to the results, I'll, I'll spend some time explaining the machine learning models, right? So we applied, we wanted like some robustness and stability. So we went for two different types of models. One is Lasso, which is very basic. It's basically um, a, a linear OLS, but you have, um, you have some penalty term and I'll come to the equation in the next slide. And that is a linear model. And the other model is basically a conditional inference forest, um, which can incorporate very flexible uh, uh, patterns in the data. And our idea was if, if both of these models are selecting similar variables in terms of which teacher characteristics best predict student learning outcomes, we can be reasonably confident that they are picking some patterns in the data, right? Because one is linear, one, um, one is nonlinear, right? So this is a basic like, under, uh, like overview. So Lasso uh, is basically like the, the, you have the OLS minimization problem, plus you add, um, the, the first, the L1 norm of, of the beta coefficient. And what this does is it, it, it actually biases the beta coefficient to go towards zero, right? So if you have 52 variables, what it will do is it will only select those variables uh, to be non-zero, which have a, a, a much stronger relationship compared to the other variables. Uh, so it ensures variable selection in that way. The second model is a conditional inference forest where what it basically does um, is it ensures that every student is bucketed into one category or the other, right? So you have, you have n number of variables, and it selects a couple of variables for each tree. So this, for example, is one tree, and it selects these three variables, and it partitions the data as per the value of each of those variables, and then it decides, okay, like, what's the value of the dependent variable based on each branch? And, the, and because it's a forest, right, there are like 500 or 1,000 trees. So what it does, it, it, it aggregates the dependent variable values of like all those trees. And what it also does is, if we, if we create like 500 trees, it will select variables at random uh, to create like those splits. So it ensures that every variable is getting a decent shot at proving itself, whether it's um, actually predicting student learning outcomes or not. Um, and we also like we run this model 20 times and we run the lasso model 200 times to ensure like uh, that supposing if we get one variable to be important it's not at random right we run we run the model 200 times and then we see out of 200 times which variables are occurring as important in 140 of those runs and for random forest um, we did it um, 14 and I'm like uh, running one model takes like about 50 minutes in hours so that's why we we did um, 20 um, and what we're basically trying to do is evaluate predictive performance, right? So what we're doing is we're benchmarking these machine learning models to ordinary least squares. Where what we're saying is uh, we will have two types of, we'll have, we'll split the data in two ways. There'll be a training set and there'll be a test set. Um, so in the training set, you're basically teaching the model, okay, what's the relationship between the variables? Once it has that, it predicts, um, it predicts uh, based on the test model, which it has never seen. So it's actually, trying to calculate what is, can I predict something I haven't ever seen before? So if I know 20 teachers, if I, if I see 20 teachers I've never seen before, can I predict what their students are going to uh, 
achieve in the next one year. And we benchmark the performance of OLS, um, Random Forest, and Lasso, right? And the way we uh, evaluate like how good the model is is basically by checking their mean squared error. And what we do is, uh, for each model, we divide the mean squared error of the OLS model by the mean squared error of the respective machine learning model. And if the value of that is greater than one, or significantly greater than one, it means that OLS is not doing as good a job as compared to the machine learning model. Um, and the good thing about the mean squared error is, um, I can't go into more detail because of lack of time, but it shows that um, it, it, there's a good bias and variance trade-off that the MSC is able to capture. Now, so, so the key results that we found in this paper was that machine learning was able to outperform standard OLS by about 14% to 24%. So these numbers are basically 95% confidence intervals where, for example, for math, uh, 1.21 means that the machine learning model was able to outperform the OLS model in predicting student learning outcomes by about 21%. Um, and what we also saw is that teacher covariates were better predictors in math than in Swahili. And one hypothesis could be that these children learn Swahili at home as well. So the, so the degree of substitution or the degree of complementarity that the teacher does vis-a-vis -vis the parent is um, much, much higher for Swahili than for mathematics. And this is just the distribution that we saw um, of the relative mean squared error. And we can see that uh, the majority of the distribution is greater than one. So across like consistently across model runs across like random subsamples of of our study uh, the the machine learning models were better at predicting student learning outcomes the second sort of key result um, that we found is both machine learning models were picking like 95% the same variables over and over so if random forest was telling us that this variable is important for student learning outcomes lasso was telling us the same and it was telling us across different model runs so there was definitely some true um, relationship that these models were able to capture, right? And again, as the teacher value-added literature has consistently said, we also found that common teacher characteristics were not able to explain uh, or do a good job um, of finding teacher effectiveness. And what we found is minute teacher beliefs, specific teacher practices were very important in ensuring um, how well the model predicts student learning outcomes, right? And these were some of the results where uh, in every model we found like that the baseline score was, a, was an important factor because across like teacher evaluated studies, it's been found that uh, the baseline score acts as a, as, acts as a very good control. Uh, so that was, that, that was an important variable. But the other results we found was uh, that especially the teacher belief that they can help struggling students learn was very important. Now this can come across as a very obvious point, right? If a teacher believes that uh, a, a disadvantaged student can learn, that should be a good predictor. But Across our surveys, we found, um, for example, we found in Argentina that about 60% teachers agree when we ask them, um, is, there, is there, like, so the question was, I can do little for my students if their parents are uneducated. And 60% teachers agreed with that. And that is quite messed up, right? Because if teachers have that prejudice that they don't have the internal belief that they can do something about these teachers, uh, about these students, um, that is a sign, that, that is something that education policy should focus on. So we uh, did find in our paper that these teacher beliefs were very important in, uh, for student learning outcomes. For Swahili, we found um, that uh, we, also, we also sort of uh, went after uh, how do teachers believe about their performance? So we asked teachers, should strict action be taken, taken against teachers um, if their students don't perform well? And we found that this variable was very important in uh, students. So we literally asked like each student that after classes, is your teacher like um, helping those students who are lagging in the subject? And those teachers who did that had like better learning outcomes. Um, and again, in terms of robustness and stability of results, as I said, the machine learning model not only predicts better, but it also finds the same variables. So both models ended up uh, predicting with the same set of variables. And we did this across multiple model runs. And, to, uh, and this is just the last point I'll make, but uh, to also ensure that it's compatible with the literature on teacher value added, what we also did was we found the teacher fixed effect um, that's, that's basically what teacher, that what teacher value added does. And we regressed, we ran the machine learning model on that teacher fixed effect as well, and we found very similar results. So, um, you have time. yeah, uh, these are some teacher beliefs, as I was saying, like how many percent of teachers do what in terms of practices and beliefs. 
Um, and yeah, that's the conclusion in terms of which variables are important for math, for Swahili, um, and some limitations. Uh, we did have some. Uh, we did have some attrition, but those attritions were fortunately random on observable variables. And um, with machine learning, the more data you have, the better. So thank you so much. Uh, I hope this was insightful. Thank you. All right, um, good afternoon. My name is Simon King. I, uh, I work for RTI International. Um, I'm also an EdD candidate at uh, UCL uh, in perpetuity, it feels like right now, because of <laughs> COVID and of things. And I'm sure my supervisor is fine with that as well. Um, so I'm going to start you off with a little passage to read. It's after lunch. I hope you didn't eat the cake at all. Um, you got a little bit drowsy. But if your reading level is kind of average for your age group, it should take you about 20 seconds. Now, to make this a little bit more competitive, I'm going to ask you to do a few things. First of all, guess the country where the passage comes from, the, the origin. And then the second thing, I've left a, a word out purposefully. If you can guess that missing word, the, the RISE director has agreed to give you the gold medal prize for RISE 2022 as well. OK? So 20, 30 seconds, then we'll get, see what people can actually figure this out. All right, go for it. All right, about five more seconds. If you think you want to guess the country, put your hand up. <laughs> be brave. It's OK to be wrong. We all learn together. Is there a hand over there? Go for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I give, this, I give this to a bunch of Americans. And they're like, oh, it must be this place in Sub-Saharan Africa. But I've got, the, I've got the wrong audience today. All right, very good. Um, when? After COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, nowhere near, nowhere near COVID. Decade? Well, why isn't it after COVID? Because they refer to COVID. Um, because they're making a link to COVID about how schools have to basically get together and figure things oh, out. It's that, it's that, something yeah, yeah, yeah. A long time ago. Okay. All right, so you guys are obviously too young, but this is from the 1980s when uh, national curriculum reform was put into place in, in England on an education system that had been autonomous for 40 years and suddenly change happened. What's the missing word? And that's an absolute giveaway if you actually know what it was. Come on, this is for a gold medal. Anybody, at least guess and try and get it. No, go on, get more creative than that. <laughs> quick, quick, I'm running out of time. <laughs> Donkey's ears. All right, I took it out. The word is yonks. yonks. <laughs> All right. Um, but this is an early grade, grade literacy advisor from Northwest Norfolk. You can tell it in the accent as well. Um, <laughs> But welcome uh, to educational change, which is what we'll be talking about right now. And the reality about educational change, that it's fundamentally emotional in, our, in how we respond to it. We respond to any sort of change emotionally. Okay, so bear that in mind. This is an um, unashamed framing effect. All right, so what do we actually get, get to do some work now? Um, what do we actually do? So we start to look at a lot of over, uh, early grade reading programs over time and then across schools to really start to understand what's happening with these programs and kind of a metadata look. And then um, as part of my thesis to basically figure out what's going on and what we can ultimately do about it where there's some kind of blockages. Um, so what I deliberately brought in was kind of a uh, behavioral science lens, like behavioral economics and that sort of thing with systems thinking. But I brought in a lot of theories into this framing of this that didn't just kind of give a, a, a stationary look at saying this is how what's going on, but they also give a hint towards where the solution is as well, and that's important, or at least an improvement anyway. And then we start to look at variability about how teachers respond within an education system. All right, if you don't know um, early grade reading programs, there it is. 
Um, so, impact over time. Um, so, this is Kenya Tusome, baseline midterm follow up, effect size on the left hand side. And this is a common theme that we have of our reading programs. When they have impact in midterm, they don't continue that upward trajectory. Okay, now Kenya has gone down a little bit. There's some very good reasons within that country why that happened, though, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. You can all approach Ben afterwards and ask him about it. This is Nepal, same pattern again. This is Uganda, same thing again. There is no reading program that's improved at two consecutive time points. Okay, so why? Let's keep looking. Um, we start to look at variation across schools as well. So all you do is you take uh, it's cross-sectional data, uh, school here, school here, take the average, distribute them out. So this is Kenya. Uh, between 2015 and midterm in 2016, um, there's some schools with some huge, great big impacts, individual schools. Now, try and look at this holistically because there is standard errors involved in this. So you're looking at the overall pattern to get a sense of kind of what's going on. Each one of these is a school. And this is the nicest pattern I've seen by a, by a huge margin. Most of them look like this. This is Nepal, and what you have if 80% of the actual impact is explained by a very small number of schools, normally 15% or less. This is Uganda. Same sort of pattern again as you see in Nepal. This is very common. This is uncommon. And so the question is, what the heck is going on here? Okay? So what do we do? This is the whole point, I think, why I'm doing positive deviance here, is that we looked at these guys here in Nepal, the ones who are getting the impact. And what did we find out? That it was teachers, head teachers, community members, different people who are the catalyst for change within those schools and within those communities. And they're all doing different things. So to bottle it up and use it somewhere else, I don't think is particularly possible at all. So what it really comes down to is this. The commonality across all these positive deviants is a personality type. If you look at... Um, Everett Rogers' um, Diffusion of Innovation, he defines very well early implementers as having a lot of positive personality characteristics that lines up with these guys up here. Communication behavior, rationality, empathy, ab ability to deal with the abstract, ability to bring other people along with you as well. That's your early implementer. So there's not a lot we can do here. And so really where we had to look instead was down here. That's where the bottleneck is for reading programs, and that's probably the case for many, many systems in places like Sub-Saharan Africa as well. How to unlock these guys down here. So we went to Tanzania instead. Uh, 12 schools, 17 teachers, qualitative. I'm a statistician by trade, but this is behavior. I'm not a big fan of, quanti of quantifying behavior at all and motivation. But we had a look at what was going on here, so we used a classroom observation and then tagged that into a teacher interview and didn't look at fidelity, but just looked at and used the classroom interview to say, sorry, the observation to say to the teacher, what were you doing here, what were you doing here, and so on. Okay? So let's have a look at what we found out. First of all, six years into the program, and that's really important. Um, teachers were happy, they were content, they loved the program, the reading program. No problems. And also, there's no variability here. 17 teachers, they all said the same thing. And these are the low-performing schools. The homogeneity was actually shocking when we first saw it, because it was not what I was expecting at all. OK, but it's six years in. There's a good reason why they were happy. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what else? Um, they could describe student learning expectations. By the end of grade two, every kid has to be a uh, low-proficiency reader. They knew that. They also felt they had support. Now, they didn't just say it was from an external coach, a WAO. They actually said it was from head teachers or a peer, all over the spectrum. No single sort of source that way. Okay? And then they all described their learning process. Someone would come and observe them. They would get feedback. They would do, go and work on it, try to improve in some way. They described the process. They talked about communities of learning or working with other teachers or their head teacher coming to see them. So they're, they're learning. So what you've got is a lot of good stuff going on here, potentially. What else? Um, they felt that in their teaching that it was highly participatory. Par God, I can't say that word. Someone else said it for me. Partisa. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, 
they felt that was going to go in the classroom. Um, and they also believed that their students would achieve, the, major the majority of the students would achieve the expectations of that reading expectation at the end of the year. Okay? And they were all observed modifying the program in some way to make it fit to context. So, there's a problem here. Nice little things going on seemingly, but we've got a contradiction. We went to the schools with low outcomes. But the indicators came out quite nice. So what's going on? Well, just like the World Bank presentation earlier on today, the teachers are totally unaware of the actual level of achievement of their students. Not even close. Uh, the schools that we went to have fluency reading proficiency levels in the single digits or even lower. OK? The teachers were focused on curriculum de delivery, but not pedagogy. That's a critical clarification to talk about where they took the phonics-based reading program, they were doing it. But they weren't doing any of the pedagogy they were taught. They were keeping what we call the, the previous method that they had been taught at teacher training college. And then next, and this is systems thinking, learning was not focused on results. They were checking through the little exercise books, but, they, but all the kids were doing was writing things down by rote. There was no actual focus on individual learning and the teacher was really focused, the teachers were really focused on the, the good learners at the very front. Okay? And teacher learning was not focused on results. In other words, what are the key things that a teacher should be able to do to improve their instructional practice that then leads to improved learning outcomes? Pedagogy. They weren't focused on improving their pedagogy. They were focused instead on improving on bits of the curriculum, bits of the phonics stuff instead. It's a huge distraction. So if you uh, apply a behavioral science lens to this, it's, it's a socially norm thing, and it was absolutely across all the teachers. And that's what we couldn't really get our hands around. They, um, they adopted curriculum, but they kept their default in effective pedagogy. And that's something I think that's really important. It's all about pedagogy, and it always has been about pedagogy. And then what they do, and this is a behavioral economics thing, it's a heuristic shortcut. And it's like, well, I can adopt the content. And teachers always adopt content. I did it in my career as well. But changing pedagogy is something you hardly ever do in a teaching career. And it's hard. So they didn't do that. They just did the easier part of it. And so there's a kind of a what, and this is the second time we've mentioned this in the last two days, because I think um, Yamini mentioned it yesterday as well, cognitive dissonance. It's when you have a disconnect between what your beliefs are and what your actual practice is. So the teachers think they're doing something, but they're actually doing something else instead, but they conclude it in their minds that they're actually doing the right thing. They think they have some participant to part that thing that's going on in the classroom, right? But, and that's why the teachers are content, because they think they're implementing the program, and nobody is telling them otherwise. This is from Nepal. And this is accountability systems. This is when you've got the external coach goes in, has the checklist, and then check what's going on, and then moves on, and so on. And this is from the poll. So this is observation fidelity to the program of a checklist like this, an average school learning level gain. If you had this in a multivariate regression model, you'd have a beta, you'd have significance, you'd have an effect size, you'd have something to talk about. Put it like this, it's horrible. So what's going on over here? Well, they're getting good marks, but being ineffective because it's focused on compliance, which is something that was mentioned earlier on today as well. Focusing on compliance, accountability systems, that's what we get. All right, so well, here's one recommendation, and this is the Lewis Crouch page that he'll like is the role of statistics is to describe variation. It's not to make averages and proportions. That's a tool that we apply to statistical variation. And so if you're describing variation in your data, so what we've tried to show you how to talk about today, then you need to think about variation in the solution as well. And this is from RTI's own work to do with Gates, and it's, it's a very nice, gusky thing that no one ever questions about a nice uh, cycle of learning. But I'm not that happy with it. Um, I think it's great for certain personality types. But the reality about change, that it's messy, it's icky, it's hard, it's demoralizing, it's not that easy to do. 
And so there are other models of change that are actually quite good that I think need to be looked at as well as far as teacher change. This is fine for positive deviance, I think, maybe. All right, a couple of slides to finish up on. Um, behavioral science. This is what we do a lot in development work. If we see an observable effect, we whack it with a mallet of change. And then we're surprised when it bounces right back at us again afterwards. Because we're looking at the observable effects, but we're not trying to diminish the, um, the restraining forces, the social norms that already exist. And unless we can diminish the social norms, adding all this new stuff isn't going to do anything at all. And that tends to be what happens in development work, or it gives a small little impact. And then this is from uh, Michael Fullen, and this is really important as well. We always talk about in development and in uh, education research about the teacher. And that's important. Teacher capacity is critical. But then we take that into implementation as well. And that's a mistake I think we make. I think we have to then focus on not the individual, but the collaborative instead. And that was something that I think was mentioned by the Zambia group this morning about thinking about collaboration. So what are we trying to scrape together money to do? Yep, almost there. Scrape together money to do, to do next is there's nothing wrong with implementing a program top down. It's the quickest way to get it into the system. But then you need a plan at that point. And that plan has to be thinking about replacing a social norm with a positive social norm, and the only way you can really do that is diffusion. But if the effective pedagogy isn't there, there's nothing to diffuse. So we're going to look at social network analysis to see if there's a way to actually, where are these effective pedagogies and how we can diffuse them. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, so we'll move on to secondary grades now. Um, and what I want to do next is to uh, talk about the story of this one school, uh, a, secondary, a junior secondary school in Sierra Leone, which is, uh, it somehow has managed to deliver effective teaching and learning despite facing all the same broad-based challenges of you know, uh, teacher management and, and school leadership and so on. Uh, and of course, in the end, we'll talk a bit about replication. And in particular, we'll hear the voices of the principal and the students from that school as to how they have managed to um, have, have the principles of positive deviance within the school. Um, so just a bit of backstory. Um, for the last sort of six years, every year we've been doing um, a large national learning assessment for secondary grades in Sierra Leone through an FCDO funded um, uh, secondary education program. And um, the general pattern has been that overall, the levels of learning are quite poor. Uh, we test junior and senior secondary students. And what we see is that they often leave school with around primary grade level um, maths and English skills. Um, and if you're a girl, if you're a pupil from um, a poorer household, if you're someone from a very remote school, if you're a child with disability, you're even, uh, your scores are even worse. And in particular, uh, across the schools, I think it's worth um, not, not undermining the fact that even those schools that are demonstrating positive deviance face some of the same challenges that other schools are facing. So massive pressures of enrollment after the rollout of fee-free education in 2018. Quite pervasive gender-based harassment and violence in schools, which almost without fail we saw in all the schools that we went to, and we talk about that a bit more. And also the issues around managing volunteer or community teachers who are not formally on the government's payroll, very limited instructional times, so only 50% of the timetable actually being used for instruction um, and then the effectiveness of that instruction obviously is also under question. So we went with these results sort of every successive year and then at one point the chief education officer in the ministry who's the highest in in terms of the technical cadre in the ministry told us you know I don't want to see this anymore can you please go and do some research in some of the schools in particular every year despite the broad-based um, uh, dismal picture, we used to see that there are some schools, even in the worst performing districts, 
who are scoring sometimes even better than the elite schools in Freetown. How is that happening? So basically, he asked us, go and do some deep dive study. We picked nine schools, did a deep dive, particularly uh, using quite a bit of ethnographic research skills, so um, including giving little digital cameras to the principal and the teachers and turning the gaze and asking them to tell us how they were managing to deliver learning and teaching in those schools. Um, so that's what we are going to do. We're going to look at one school. This is a school in a very remote district called Karene District. It's called Barmin JSS, Barmin Junior Secondary School. And as you'll see uh, uh, in, in the film, there's, um, the, there's a very strong principal, a group of five motivated, unqualified teachers, a strong community. But overall, the school is performing better than the Eton of Sierra Leone. So, so there we go. Uh, Sam, if we can have the documentary. Thank you. Not meant to be a silent film. But. between the DBA and Sandra Mabolonto chiefdoms. This documentary is about a school which is succeeding against all odds. Once known as the Athens of West Africa, due to the pivotal role Sierra Leone played in education in the sub-region, education in the country has been declining in recent times with pupils performing poorly in external examinations. However, we have found success in the most unexpected place a remote community in the Karine district. Join us on a journey to Bamin GSS in a village called Bumbudu to find out why they are succeeding. The journey to Bumbudu is not for the weak and faint-hearted. It is a long and difficult one. From Potloko, the road is good and paved with tarmac. Soon, the route vars off to an untarred and dusty road, amid fields dried by the searching sun and sometimes burned by bushfire. Besides the rough and dusty road, the traveler has to contend with the sparkling green Mabanta River, which lies majestically between the Dibia and Sanda Mabolonto chiefdoms. Here, you either use the cable ferry to cross or take a ride on one of the dugout canoes littered alongside the river's bank. The road to Bumbudo is rough and sometimes almost impassable. Finally, we arrive in Bumbudu, a remote community nestled in the forest of the Sanda Mabolonto chiefdom. Welcome to Bamin GSS. Here, we find a treasure hidden in the forest, a school which is low resource, but is determined to succeed against all odds. They were sixth in the Karine district in the 2018 UK-aid-funded secondary grade learning assessment. In 2019, they were the best performing school in both mathematics and English in the district. Similarly, Bamin JSS has been performing well in the basic education certificate examination. 
getting 100% pass in 2017, 89% in 2018, and 90% in 2019. Bamin, it means it, it is ours, it belongs to us. Na elimbanim, so na we get her. This school, Bamin Junior Secondary School, na Bobodo, and they began to start in 2006. Members of the Bumbudu community and its environs played a great role in the school's establishment and continue to play an important role in its existence. The school, because secondary school not been there around there, and the people then they sit down together as community level and then decide, say, therefore open a secondary school now. Yeah. Because waiting at the thing, the distance is the way then picking them the cover from here to Cambia District, it's too much. Now we meet the primary head teacher. We talk to her and we able to accommodate with, if not three classrooms. In a community where the only economic activity is subsistent farming, support to teachers may not mean much. The, the teacher then, like they talk so no more, not to pay with the pay, they pay them more. But oh, if you tell if you around, sometimes they go and take like, one, one cup, two, two cup, so the comrade for let them make, let them you give the eat, the eat. In a school where there is little or no supervision from the ministry, support from the community, no matter how little it is, gives them the chance to hold teachers accountable. So the chairman and other members of the community then can come and see, see the school it run smoothly. The way they get teaching and learning material for teach, we they get her in different way. Like for the chalk we side, the community then can help. For long we will get chalk at times. Then for the books on side, like mathematics and English language, they will learn we don't help we. Then can supply we help them there. Together with the picking there. Sometimes na making buy. Some materials work can go na luma. I see any book like business, agriculture, other subjects, I can able to buy and bring out some pamphlets, then I can buy and count them. Continuous teacher development is important in enhancing teachers' ability to teach. I'm fortunate for going training, but this level land training, the LPM, on the 15th April 2017, I go then go teach with. Then due to that training, they, it helped me, like how the steps for just teach, let people understand, simple, and the, the class could be interactive class. After what I come out with me, as without this trainee, as I can as class, and for just right, just right, if possible, I explain. But due to this trainee, it don't help me then, I call me other company, since I for go about teaching. They make it simple for we the teachers there. Simple in the sense, um, then based on CCTT, that meaning child center teaching technique. Wherein the teacher no go able, the teacher no go uh, take the body in all. When they do the teaching together with the, the picking them at the class, if they ask them, they answer you. We say they no go able, you correct them. Let we learn in our mathematics and English no more they be prepared. But since the method we don't get them from English and language, they would not implement them. We don't still implement them by the other subject there. Like social study back, Nasu back with the teacher. The same, they follow the same method. Research and anecdotal evidence shows that school time is not enough to cover the syllabus. In most cases, teachers are unable to complete the syllabus before the end of the term. Um, looking to the syllabus, we will cover a large. And looking to the time we we'll get in school, is small for the syllabus. So we thought and fit say, Together with the principal, he said, Lord, we will conduct extra classes so that we will push the, the syllabus. Sharing premises with the primary school has its own challenges for the JSS pupils, especially the girls. Bami, in guess, in get primary and secondary. But with the secondary, now, not get building. Now, now, Pram, primary school then I then get building. I make uh, we, we they come on lunch 
uh, 11.30, then they come on lunch, ten, break, 10 o'clock. When they come on, they don't make noise for we. They don't, and if, some people say, if you need to forget, they go inside, when they go inside, then they teach you, you need to forget. They go inside, they, then they all look in more now. We all can come sometimes, self. We they meet the place, so so toilet them. Like we saw, so we na matured picking them. We can get some probably working there, but we pass you go na toilet. We get ready for do that, we to self. They pass you. Like so now, where then they, where then they ala ala, but we pass you the shame now. Because you now, any way they pay time, you now I let pass you talk talk, but you pass you go na you also. Take excuse, you go na you also. Because of its remote location, Barmin GSS finds it difficult to attract and retain teachers. There are teachers who have been to come and go. Since now community school, they're not able to stay. And again, the area, they say they're not able to stay in this area. So they may be left with and they go. But we moon, we stay because this place now we homeland. Barmin GSS currently has six teachers, none of whom is on government's payroll. Even though parents have agreed to pay some amount of money to support the teachers, most parents cannot afford to pay that little amount. Bamin GSS is the only secondary school within a 10-mile radius so children walk long distances to attend school. My name is Komrabai Kamara. I come from Mache. I walk a four mile for come on Mache for Kana School any day. There are some cultural practices that require the closure of schools. There is loss of several days of learning and teaching. And they get the, that in society. They go there for the whole week, nobody can school. They could decide for lock the tongue and just perform their own society business. Even we will work. When I tell you the society, they don't pull them, pass it for weight sometimes. Other cultural practices in the community encourage child marriage. They get one style now, where beginners are born no more. Because it, it says this is a woman. We initially, when I say this is a woman, I begin. So I need to take a play, but then I need to take a play. The beginning gets this, the, the stage where they reach. You see, you tell and say, this man and I say, want you. You go see, maybe, maybe you go want to take a Then they put on a school. A key distinguishing factor of Bamin GSS is teacher commitments. Teachers say it is the principal that motivates them. The principal is so transparent with the teachers there. Anything will happen at the school, if they communicate with we. And anything will come for the school, if they make a known to we. So your relationship with the principal is good, actually, because we work hand in hand with them. School leadership and management training is important to get the principals to work effectively. It is possible to train on some aspect of the principal's role in pre, in-service training, effective school and teacher monitoring. Giving feedbacks after monitoring, management of the teaching staff, motivating teachers. school like Birmingham, where four out of six teachers are untrained, there is heavy reliance on in-service training. Whenever a teacher receives training from any organization, he in turn organizes training for colleague teachers. Even though Lewi Lan's training is for English and mathematics teachers, all teachers in the school, irrespective of the subject they teach, are using Lewiland's teaching method and it's working well. Extra classes are organized after school hours to help increase instructional time and to assist teachers to complete the syllabus. CTA support the school in cash, all kind, so they are able to hold teachers accountable. The community school relationship is that kind of mutual respect and the willingness to make the school succeed. This kind of relationship leads to what is called virtual circle of learning. Here, improved learning boosts communities' confidence, which allows them to give more support to the school, which in turn leads to better learning, which eventually leads to community development and the circle continues. Schools and communities can't wait 
whilst the government is doing all it can to improve on education, no matter how resource poor they are, schools and communities can do the little things which are in their means to improve on education. As they say, little drops of water makes the mighty ocean. Can I take a minute to just conclude? Thanks. So I'm sure the question on all your minds is, how do we now replicate this success? And I'm afraid I don't have an easy answer to that. I think that's the hardest question with, with, with not a straightforward answer, mainly because obviously there's a constellation of actors, behaviors, cultures, norms that has come together for this particular school, which is helping them to deliver teaching and learning. But I can't guarantee that if you did exactly what the school is doing in another context, that would work. But I think something to note here is that routine might be a bit boring, uh, but they are actually doing all the daily routine stuff well, and they're focusing on the fundamentals. So I don't have a single silver bullet or technology that they are using, but they are doing the daily stuff really, really well, you know, ensuring that roles and processes are well communicated, ensuring there's transparency, and ensuring that teachers are all you know, motivated and looked after by the community. Um, and of course, sort of preaching to the choir here, yeah, really, but um, um, you know, they are thinking of the school as a system. It's not just about the principal or the teachers, but it's about the entire community and the co-investment and productive coalition that they've been able to form here. Yeah. So thank you very much, and also thank you to several of our Sierra Leonean researchers who are watching this uh, on YouTube live streamed. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So the next presentation will be online. Do we have the presenters on? Minahil and Shina, are you there? Yes. Yes, okay. we're here. Please, take it. Uh, I can't share my presentation until the other one's taken off. Are you able to share? Okay, it's coming up. Good. Um, great. So I'm assuming that you can see the slides, and I'm not sure how the, yes. the session is, but, but is my face also just blasting on one of the screens? Yes, that... we can see you, okay. and we can see your slides. <laughs> great. Um, um, so we're going to pivot a little bit from the previous presentations and talk about um, a, a, a different level of education service delivery. Um, so our presentation is about understanding how districts plan and implement education policy in Ghana. Uh, next slide, Trina. Um, the motivation for this project also comes from the idea to align systems of education towards learning from all. And we draw a lot from the implementation and um, you know, education delivery, delivery literature to understand how, um, what roles and responsibilities different actors along the education delivery chain have to improve the quality of learning. Um, and, and there's very limited literature that talks about the middle tier or the sub-national actor. So anything between the central level of governance and the school, what they their roles and responsibilities are to bring about improvements in education quality. Um, we also know very little between whether or not there's this disconnect between what is in, uh, in policy, in legislation, in regulation versus what their management practices, their engagement looks like on the ground and what are some of the constraints uh, in terms of resources or capacity to deliver that they may be facing. Uh, next slide. Um, so here, um, uh, our research is in the Ghana context, uh, but it's but the project is part of a, of a large multi-country study. But here we study um, districts in Ghana, and districts are uh, a key level within the education hierarchy that are responsible for policy implementation and school support. Um, so Ghana has a decentralized education system. So there are two parallel structures. Political decentralization happens through, uh, is, is present there. And there are district assemblies that um, have educational oversight and, and responsible for infrastructure. But then there are district education directorates on the side that are responsible for planning district activities, monitoring school quality, and implementing central policies also related to teaching and learning. Um, 
Um, however, there is a gap between bit policy and practice of decentralization. So, for example, district education offices feel constrained by, um, you know, uh, the autonomy that they have because of, you know, other policies that that are centralized, um, uh, centralized in governance at the national level. And over the past uh, many years, Ghana has been subject to many reform efforts that have been taken by both the government and the donor agencies to, to strengthen their capacity um, at the district level to deliver. Um, however, you know, our, our research is trying to investigate what those practices are and how we can um, support uh, policy implementation and improvements in education quality. Uh, next slide. So we asked two major questions. Um, the first is what management practices do district education directorates use to plan and implement policy? And second, what factors enable or constrain their ability to plan and implement policy? Um, and we try to look at it through the positive negative deviance lens, which I'm going to explain in a second. Um, next slide. So our conceptual framework draws from the literature on educational bureaucracy, and we try to use these five management functions that you see on the screen as the basis to understand management practices in Ghana. Um, and uh, again, the, these are can be understood in uh, in in a way in in terms of like ideal type management practices that uh, you know facilitate bureaucratic functioning. Um, so we look at target setting and prioritization, which basically means what measurable indicators exist to track. Pro, uh, progress towards certain objectives. Uh, measurement and monitoring draws from ideas around data collection and reporting about performance on those certain targets. Um, accountability and incentives includes establishment of um, accountability routines that change behavior and performance towards meeting those stated objectives. Um, and problem solving refers to you know, routines and practices that facilitate discussion uh, and collaboration across a, a range of, of different stakeholders. So they could be at the school level, at the district level, um, at the community level, et cetera. Um, and political sponsorship is, is um, a, a function that we define as the role that political actors play. But for the context of this study, we think of it as a cross-cutting theme across the four um, uh, management functions that I've just described. Um, so in this uh, uh, paper, we, did, we think of deviance as understood in light of these ideal type management functions. So positive deviance is districts which exhibit strong evidence of these management practices, and negative is that exhibit uh, no or opposing evidence of these management practices. Uh, next slide. Um, so our methodology is qualitative research. We look at five districts uh, in three regions in Ghana and 10 schools. Um, so we've collected a lot of documentation, reports, plans, meeting minutes, and 40, we, we conducted 43 semi-structured in, in person. When I say we, it wasn't actually we, it was our colleagues at uh, the University of Cape Coast, IEPA, who, who, who led the charge on conducting the interviews. Um, and we, we spoke with the regional directors, the district directors, their entire teams, the school inspectors, head teachers and teachers as part of these 40, 43 interviews that we conducted. Um, on the right-hand side of the slide, um, we're looking at um, uh, five uh, districts uh, that, that are part of our sample, which um, you know my colleague Sheena is just going to talk about in a little bit. But this is just to give you an overview that they differ in their uh, in in their context. Um, so there are some districts that where a large population lives below the national poverty line, um, and there are you know districts that are doing really well in, in, in passing the basic education certificate exams or the BEC scores, whereas there are other districts that are not doing that well. Um, uh, uh, next slide. Uh, I'll take it away, Sheena. Thanks, Manohel. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the findings as a result of our interviews. So similar to the previous presentation, we wanted to start just by saying, so what are district responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis these different management functions? And then what did we see sort of across the five districts as common practices and challenges before we get into what we consider a positive deviant case and a negative deviant case? So districts are responsible for determining and developing district and school annual plans. In terms of measurement and monitoring, they are responsible for collecting it, routine administrative data or EMIS data, conducting school inspections and classroom observations. In terms of accountability and incentives, there are quarterly and annual reporting processes upward to the regional and the national level. And they also participate, as Manaha mentioned, in these political and sort of bureaucratic oversight committees at the district level uh, for education. There are also specific routines in the Ghana district context around problem solving. So these are called SPAMs, the school performance appraisal meetings, which are large community stakeholder meetings, which can take place at the district circuit or school level, as well as those um, education oversight meetings that I mentioned 
mention under accountability. So these are the responsibilities they have. What are the practice um, on the ground in reality when we did our data collection? So we see that these plans are used widely uh, at, the at the district and school level using national templates aligned to national priorities. However, we see a lack of prioritization of the targets um, in these plans with hundreds of annual targets for a district in any, any given year. And that learning is typically narrowly defined as the basic education exam pass rate, which is actually something we saw in the previous presentation in the Tanzania case as well. In terms of monitoring, we see a strong input focus with few indicators and in education quality and a lot of paper-based data collection with maybe only limited digitization in terms of using WhatsApp, for example, to collect data from schools and inspections being infrequent. In terms of accountability across all five districts, we saw regular structured upward reporting being very standard. However, in terms of incentives, there were limited rewards for good performance and sanctions only for the worst performance. And these problem solving structures existed um, in theory in all districts, but were infrequent and, and varied. Another cross-cutting challenge across all five districts are capacity challenges at the subnational level. Every single district and school we met um, had either in, had delayed allocation of the funding that was due for, to them at, to the district or school level, and on those budgets, even when received were often incomplete, which meant a lack of money for fuel for inspectors to conduct and travel to schools to conduct inspections. And many of the working environments, whether at district or school level, were actually unsafe. It's frozen. Oh. Okay. So let's take an example of a negative uh, deviance case. This is a this is a district which is considered deprived according to the national definition. Uh, based on its poverty and on other indicators of access to basic services. In this district, what practices did we see compared to those ideal type management practices that Manahal mentioned? We saw frequent district management turnover. This is a very unattractive district to work in. The district him, herself had not um, seen budgets despite starting the role five, five months prior. So there was real disconnect at the management level. The director could not um, produce a written vision and could not really tell us what were the clear priorities and targets uh, for that district. And then when we looked at some of the key staff that support uh, teaching and learning in the district, the district school inspectors and first year teachers, we found that they had received no orientation when they began their role in the district. So the district was not supporting them uh, to, to, to be able to implement um, and, and do their roles properly. This is a district where the basic education exam pass rate is 40%, and actually 50% of their junior high schools have a 0% pass rate. So 0% of children pass the BC exam. And yet there was no specific strategy for low performing schools in this district. However, this district did benefit from a lot of support from, from donors such as USAID, the early grade reading program and UNICEF. Um, and we saw that some of the underlying factors there were the centralized teacher deployment issue, so that many teachers that were posted to this district actually never showed up because it was such an, an unattractive district to work in. And even if they did, they often tried to transfer immediately. And this was due to two factors. One, poor working and living conditions, being it very remote, no teacher accommodations. And second, that teachers posted there often didn't come from the region, didn't speak the local languages, and were very, very far from their families. We also saw that this district suffered from lack of resources, so that at the time, a four-month delay so far in the reception of their district operational budgets, um, and that inspectors complained of not having fuel to be able to conduct inspections with an 800 kilometer square uh, district size. Um, fuel for inspections was absolutely crucial. And this led to shallow, infrequent visits by school inspectors to support and visit schools. So they did things like visit five schools in a day and just check attendance uh, and never conducted any sort of classroom observations because they didn't have time. And you can see this quote at the bottom, a school inspector saying, we feel demotivated because this kind of monitoring is not really doing anything. And SPAMs, these, collect, these um, collective stakeholder meetings were held infrequently also due to funding constraints just to provide some food uh, for these meetings. The picture on the right hand side, you can see a junior high school, probably the opposite case, uh, similar context, but opposite case of what we saw in the previous presentation. This is a 0% school where 0% of grade nine students passed the BEC exam, fully staffed by first year teachers uh, who had never received an, an orientation and were brought to this very challenging context to do their job. 
How about a positive case though? So this is a different district in our sample. In this district, the director had a very strong vision and, and leadership style and directly around improving BECE scores. Um, so the director uh, themselves said that they didn't sleep because there was really strong political pressure from the region to improve their scores. And what we saw in their management practices was this very clear focus on setting achievable targets with low performing schools and actually organizing a district office wide monitoring program for those schools. So on the right hand side there, you can see a sort of schedule where every professional staff, not just inspectors um, who were supposed to do visits, but all professional staff were assigned specific circuits where they had to to do intensive monitoring and support to low performing schools. And that had happened over several years. And so their um, basic education exam pass rate was 60%, which is not great as an average, but they had been formally ranked last in the region, had made steady improvements over the three years and were being hailed as a success story. We also saw very clear examples of two-way information sharing and problem solving structures that they had set up within the office, which was a really great method to share problems and also have people react quickly um, to the issues that were raised. However, it did also suffer from a lot of the same funding and resource issues that we saw in our, in our negative deviance case. They had not held any of these stakeholder performance um, appraisal meetings um, since UNICEF had stopped funding uh, these programs in 2018. Um, so this office too faced these same budget delays. Um, the things that they, they received were not sufficient and they were unable to get the kind of funding that they needed in addition from the district assembly, which could often supplement in some cases district education office funds. However, we see, for example, in the quote at the bottom, the very different approach that school inspectors had to the way that they worked with schools. So they say, we do coaching and mentoring for our teachers, especially when we do sit in observation when they are teaching. After that, we do debriefing with them and then discuss what they need to improve on. On the right hand side, you can see the lower picture of a school in this district. Um, the teachers there feel very motivated and supported. They had an active professional learning community, which is a national policy, which should be rolled out uh, across all districts, but um, fully realized in this district and not at all implemented in the previous district that I mentioned. So what do we see? We see that there are positive deviance management practices which exist in some districts, despite resource and contextual challenges that cut across all districts in the Ghanaian case. So district actors have agency and find ways to operate effectively, and they themselves perceive these practices as a positive impact on their district's educational performance. But we can't then say that it's just management practices. Although resources are not a binding constraint, the irregularity and adequacy of funds that districts and schools receive hampers the efforts that districts can make to plan and implement education reforms. This picture on the right hand side so is a dilapidated, actually condemned district office where one of our district's uh, staff had to work in uh, uh, to deliver the same things that another district would. So what's the next steps here? We've just completed a week ago a follow-up qualitative field work in these five districts. Um, uh, the focus of my PhD research is uh, district case studies of effective district support to teaching and learning, where I'm going to be looking at these management practices, the role of politics and relational trust. But I think most importantly is that this was a scoping study, a qualitative scoping study, which gave us insights onto management practices. And these insights were embedded within a larger large end survey as part of the Deliver Ed project in Ghana. So this is a nationally representative survey of 154 districts and around a thousand schools. And the idea is then to look at variation in performance and the use of these different management practices uh, across these districts to understand sort of you know, what explains the difference in performance and, and get us insights towards um, system reform and how we can improve the delivery of education priorities in Ghana. I will stop there, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've had uh, the four presentations, and for me it's a little bit sad because from, I mean, from a few days ago I did actually email these presenters and said, please make sure you tell us something about how those PD practices can be replicated in other contexts, neighboring contexts or similar contexts, and Vatsal didn't say anything about that. <laughs> Simon said it's impossible. And then Surovi said, no, it's almost impossible. 
Minahil and Shina, they didn't say anything about it. And that's really the big problem. OK, so we are going to take questions and comments, but I want us to talk about that issue. So we'll take a few questions from the room, then we'll go to the hub in Nigeria, and then uh, UAE is uh, curating the questions online. So any questions from the room? Yes, Jacobos. curious of the interactions between said knowledge and, and capacity. Um, I'm also curious the, um, for the Ghana team, there was political pressure to improve that one district, but what was the driving force for that political <coughs> pressure? Okay. Yeah. No, 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 we'll take another question. Can I move this way? Abhijit? Yes? Yeah, I mean, my, uh, my question was Simon, uh, where there was, there was this motivating chart, right, which was that uh, anyone who has really great effects until midline and then it always flattens out or declines, that's just mechanical test score decay, as far as I can see, which is that you would, never, you would never end up being on trajectory because in order to stay on that trajectory, you would require every gain between baseline and midline to have persisted. And that doesn't seem to be true in any panel we have. It doesn't seem to be true in any treatment effect. So is that maybe just a case of us collectively, as people who work on interventions or people who research on interventions, just having an unrealistic expectation, which is that literally everything, that uh, there was an increment between two points in time, would persist? Any question this way? Then I'll return to Dave. So this is kind of a broad question, but um, Something I've always struggled a little bit with the positive deviance, negative deviance literature is exactly this point that uh, that our chair just made that, like, what do we learn from these in terms of doing something anywhere else, I guess is the, I mean, I'm always fascinated by success, success cases, but I also really struggle as, you know, someone who does applied statistics in terms of like, what? So I'm just curious, you know, we've got teams who've done a bunch of these, like case studies. So in general, how would you say we think about this kind of positive deviance work and how it should inform our sort of broader analysis for educational change? That's will go to all the panelists. Okay, so let's answer these questions. What's up? Yeah. Uh, so Jacobus, could you repeat, like, I couldn't get, you're saying in terms of knowledge and capacity. Um, so just, so any interactions right so because it's very flexible right the, the machine model. learning so it's not just that variable x is predictive but it, it is only predictive if it interacts with y right so mm -hmm. were there any important interactions that you picked up yeah, yeah. so um, i think like the picture of like one sort of tree that i showed was that um like there's a certain cutoff below like the baseline score so supposing if your baseline score if the kids baseline scores above say 50% or below 50%, then there were consistently like two different types of variables interacting. So like for kids below a certain baseline, uh, teachers reviewing concepts or teachers um, helping lagging students helps. But for, for um, those above a certain baseline score, the teacher's own competency, the teacher's own competency score was, was more effective. So I think um, uh, if you can like, when we aggregate like a lot of trees, we can see patterns uh, that dependent on one variable, what the other is doing. Um, and I'd also like answer David's question uh, from, from my perspective. I think this is something that Shwetlana has also like spoken about a lot is um, we should make a case for understanding teacher beliefs um, and, and teacher practices in a more minute way. So um, just, a, just a good thought experiment would be as if I'm an education minister, right? Um, I would really care about what the prejudices and beliefs of my teachers are. Like, um, and and if, if there are studies where we can make it more mainstream, where so more and more surveys are capturing teacher beliefs about, do teachers think that um, kids from poorer neighborhoods or kids from, uh, or like kids whose parents have a lot of personal problems, can they actually make a difference or not? Like if, if an education minister can get that kind of data, uh, more can be done to orient these beliefs or more can be done to motivate teachers differently. Um, so that is one thing I think that our paper uh, really tries to highlight is that teacher beliefs um, are, are, very, are very important. And 
they should be surveyed more and brought more mainstream into into like education research. Okay. Simon, do you want to make any comment or no, it's fine. From yeah, I can you. answer the comment about the, the, the plateauing and isn't it to do with just researchers being idiots or something like that, I think you were kind of saying. Um, and for me, often the time the answer is yes. Um, but, but here's the thing to break it down into. Yes, we do plateau. Why is because a small number of schools go boom, the rest of them are just flat, right? So what do you expect the schools that are moving in the right direction to do the following year? Well, they're not going to double up that effect, right? And that's your point, and I totally agree on that. But what we're trying to do by studying the variation of the negative deviance is basically saying that's where we unlock quality education on a larger scale. So if you can get all those schools that are showing no impact whatsoever to move the needle as well, then the curve starts going up again. But if you're saying that, OK, well, once a teacher for cross-sectionally does increases by 30 words per minute in year one, the following year it's going to be like five, if anything. Right? Because, you know, I, I remember a, a newly qualified teacher years ago when I was in a school basically saying, she was very bored in her second year. I said, why? I said, because I figured out most of the problems, 99% of the problems in my first year. The second year, I'm just tweaking things. Right? So you're right, but focus on the schools, focus on the negative deviance instead. That's where the impact can increase. So, Minahil and uh, uh, Shina, anyone who wants to respond to Dave? The question of what do we learn from positive deviance and at the level of your study, and what can we do with those findings? So I can I can try to answer the question on, on replication, and then, Sheena, maybe you can take Jacobus's question. I think that's also a very important part, the, the political pressure question. Um, so I think that... Um, so, so our, the takeaway from our study is that there are some universal capacity challenges that all districts are facing. So, for example, untimely um, funds and budgets that are that that the districts don't have to essentially do their job. So, I think that um, like, even though it, that's not a binding constraint in the positive deviance case, it's still I think across the board is something that that needs potentially to be fixed. Um, but we also like to say that, that there is something to be said about uh, leadership training for district staff and they're, you know, giving them the agency to make decisions about um, how they spend their money and how they um, approach, um, that, like how they uh, approach their performance targets towards the schools. Um, so we do think that there is potential there. Um, and another thing that, you know, that's, that's that Ghana has done um, uh, really, really well, and and you know, it's, it's worth mentioning is is this is the idea that school monitors essentially were called circuit supervisors for a really long time, but they've completely rebranding how they approach monitoring. So now they're called school improvement support officers, and that shift in mindset from the role of the district to to being from being a monitor to to a to, to an organization that supports schools. We, we did see evidence of that in uh, more so in the positive deviant case than, than in the negative deviance case. So, so I do think institutional changes like rebranding um, the role of the district from a, from a monitor to a support uh, is, is, a, is potentially an, 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 a good step and, and something that possibly can be replicated in other contexts. So Nigeria, I'm told there are some questions there. Can we get the questions from the hub? Nigeria, are you there? Abuja Hub, are you there? Yeah, but I've been told they have some questions. Do you have anything online? Not yet. Okay. Shina, I can you want answer to say something the, very quickly. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the question about political pressure for the basic education exam results. Um, so we saw a difference. We saw across the board that all you know districts did were interested in improving their BEC score results. This is because there are really only two milestones in the, the 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 educational trajectory where they get some sort of outcome variable this is a great or measure which is a grade 9 and grade 12 however in this region the regional minister had created a special ranking of districts and had uh, an annual forum where district directors were invited and the last ranked district uh, was not invited to the lunch that happened so there was huge pressure 
from the political side uh, to improve the EC scores. And this was actually in contrast to what we saw as the, the, the annual district planning that they were to do. They had a hundred different um, targets that they had to, to complete on the sort of bureaucratic or ministerial side. So we did see the very strong accountability drive for and prioritization of BEC results from the political side. However, districts responded differently to this pressure. In our positive deviance district, they worked on really sustainable monitoring and support of low-performing schools. In other districts, they just responded by organizing mock exams right before the grade nine uh, exam, just to try to boost the scores. So. Okay, are we ready, Abuja? Yes. Go right ahead with your question. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm just wondering, um, the, 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 can you put the microphone a bit away from <laughs> your, extend it a bit away from you? There's a lot of echo. No, could you write it down? Could you write down the question? Can you hear me, please? Yes, but you're not very clear. Okay, so I'm just wondering about the external external of the of um of no, we can't get to you. It's a network issue. Please type the question in the chat and we'll read it. Is there any other question in the room? Is the Ghana paper going to be available? I didn't see it on the, on the program. Could you, just, could you just explain the context of why they're presenting and not the one that's yesterday in the program? I think that would help. Oh, yeah. So about the Ghana, the Ghana, oh, yes. So we, sorry about that. We. We had one presenter fall out of the original plan because they could not travel and they were not well. So we got uh, Ghana to this presentation from Ghana and uh, it's a district level. All the other papers were school level, but still we were able to fit it in the context of PD and negative. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yes. Sorry, yeah, into this. <laughs> so. Something at some point, but cut them some slack. Okay. <laughs> sure, thanks, Claire. Yes, Alec. Just a real quick point on the issue of the value of positive deviance. I think people are kind of missing the point. In very complex situations where you don't necessarily know what to do, looking at positive deviance can, for instance, tell you what you ought to be doing a randomized control trial, right? And so, you know, it's really about discovery of potential ideas in very complex situations. I mean, there are cases where simple distribution of knowledge that they find through positive deviance cases, you know, this case of like parents feeding shrimp to their kids in Vietnam in the early 90s. There are cases where it diffuses, that's all that's needed, but it's also just a, a way of ideation. I couldn't agree more with you, Alex, so that's spot on, yes. Yeah, no, just to, um, just to follow up on that, I was also thinking about the question that you posed and the leader you posed. And I was also thinking that we can't study high dimensional complementarities when we, you know, do applied statistics. But what if there's a bunch of things that need to go together for us to get the outcomes that we want? And I think these cases are a good way to see, okay, if these kind of high dimensional complementarities exist, what do they look like? And I think that can be really useful for us to understand what is it that we need to be looking at, which is what we're also saying. So yeah, I just wanted to. Yes, Joshua? Yeah, uh, so thanks very much. I, I think I'd like to agree with colleagues that are concerned, including the chair, about, about so what? How do we scale up? Because that's really what we need at the end of the day. And RISE should, should give us an answer. It is, research, <laughs> it is research on improving systems of education. So for you to improve a system, you need to go all the way to a point where you have a way of scaling up whatever you are doing in order to improve the system. So, uh, as a, and I was very, very hopeful when I heard about, when I had uh, a few titles mentioning machine learning, because now they're talking about high capacity where you can look at uh, 
the different dimensions and relationships that are here because machine learning has some robustness that other approaches may not have. So I'm, I was really hopeful and I was really looking for that. Um, but I understand you can only do so much uh, when, uh, within given limitations. So I'm really hoping that we're gonna take that next step to see how we can use the positive deviance uh, uh, case studies uh, and build them up in order for us to move forward. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to comment on the positive deviance because um, I spent so much time looking at this. It's it's a distraction and it's an assumption that it can be diffused, mm -hmm. yeah. and it, it's not as simple as that. If you look at the if you look at diffusion theory, it's about opinion leaders in society that that do the diffusion, and that's more often than not not a positive deviance. Like I was talking to Ben yesterday saying, you know, we'd like to be a positive deviance like Lewis, but we really can't do that. We can't be a Lewis Crouch at all. You can be a deviant. No, but... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it, what the positive deviance does is ignore the noise around them. Mm -hmm. But to unlock everything else, you have to understand what the noise is and release that instead. And that's a very different concept to saying we can just show everybody what positive deviance is and, and let them all replicate it. It just it, it doesn't work that way in diffusion theory. And that's, that's why I think that we are jumping into the whole idea about positive deviance. It just seems too easy, because it is. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder than that. Well, I'll have to be the chairman and end this session. <laughs> we are out of time, but I think obviously we are provoked. And well, uh, tomorrow I'll have a presentation here that is built on positive deviance work that was done in Uganda, but I'll be presenting it in COVID-19 situation because many of our original goals were diverted. But I think we'll have a few more discussions about that. It's very important to know how we can get these lessons to neighboring schools. Thank you so much. Let's go for a break. run over by five minutes, but we're starting on time. <laughs> <laughs>
can hear you well. Thank you. Just going to.
it failed? Because it was a test case. It was a pilot. But it didn't move into politics. So let's assume the BDN movement does
Again, as a reminder to you, our online participants, please do send us your questions via slido.com. Uh, the instructions are on the Twitter feed. Um, uh, Jason is going to be handling those questions um, uh, so that we get them into the general discussion at the end. Right, let, let's get started on time. So welcome to the final regular session of the day, session four on long-term trajectories of change. Although, of course, you're not going to leave after this because we have our invited session um, uh, after that at 5.15. So what is this session about? Well, we have a diverse set of papers, but they're all addressing the issue of, of long-term and sustained change in learning. Um, the first two papers, roughly speaking, are asking the question, did it happen? And we'll have a specific paper, that's a paper that uh, Leonie's going to talk about um, from Nigeria, looking at the impact of the free primary education program and trying to get into whether there was change and what the mechanism was there. And we'll have a more global paper presented by Justin, who's going to ask the question, is the learning crisis new? what happened to education quality over the latter half of the 20th century. So really long term. Um, and he's doing this by uh, some fantastic data, careful data work, linking cross-sectional surveys. Then the second two papers are going to ask a slightly different but related question, what's needed to make it happen, to make long-term change happen? And Ben is going to talk about, well, he's going to give us an account of the collective wisdom on this issue um, from his interviews with senior, ed senior uh, education sector leaders. And Michelle is going to talk about a series of case studies um, informed by a conceptual framework. So did it happen? And then how do we make it happen? Is roughly speaking the tenor of the session. So um, I'm going to hand straight over online to Leonie to tell us about the first of those from Nigeria. Okay, thank you everyone. Are you able to, to see my screen? Could you hear me? I please could you share your slides on the screen without saying anything? Could you hear me, please? Yes. 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 Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm Leonie Kumasabun. I'm from the African School of Economics in Benin, and I'm presenting this work as part of Rise Nigeria CRT. So the long-term effects of the free primary education program in Nigeria and in neighboring Beninese community. I will present this work through that agenda, motivation, may food result discussion and conclusion and implication. So as a motivation, it has been known globally that the free education is a key input to boost the quality of education, increase student enrollment, and keep children at school. But there are also some studies that show that there are some time free education programs that fail to achieve their, their goal. For instance, in Nigeria, the federal government and some several, several regional governments also set some free primary education that fail to, to achieve their set goal. For instance, we have the FP program, free education program that was in the SM region that is not sustained. And there were also the universal primary education program at the national level that did not get much important than the one in the Western region. So the one that was implemented in the Western region from 1955 to 1966 has been seen as a benchmark of education expansion in Nigeria and the most unprecedented education reform in Africa so far. Sahara. When we look at the numbers, we can see in that table from 1953 to 1966, the number of girls and boys that were enrolled in school. And particularly for the year where FP was implemented, we can see on a big increase of 77% in the enrollments. And mostly this was for girls. It was the same at the financial level, we can see in the last column of this table that the share of education that was within the, within the regional budget was high, 
and this remains slightly high till the end of the program in 1965. And within that share, which is about 40%, 80% was devoted to a primary education only. So in the literature, we can see that there is evidence in the increase in enrollments of the people from five to 40 year old in the year that followed the FPE program in the Western region. But we lack of evidence on the long run life outcome of these students. And we are asking also ourselves if there is an impact in the next generation. And we lack also evidence on the spillover effects within. Hi, Leone, it's Fred here. Just, um, we're not seeing um, your slides at the moment. Um, we can share them this end. If you could just tell us which slide you're on, we can move them forward for you. Okay. Or I'll, I'll let you share. Let's try that again. So if I stop sharing, if you'd like to try sharing again, that'd be great. Thanks. So I, I can stop sharing. And, and, well, and if you could start sharing, that'd be great. Thanks. Let me stop sharing and pick it again to, to see. Um, if you prefer, we can share our screen and you can tell us just to move forward. Should we do that? Will you see now? Yeah, that's perfect. We're getting that. Yeah, brilliant. If you go full screen on that, perfect. Well done. Thank you. So, so can, can I continue with the motivations? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh -huh. So I was here, I was saying that the share in the budget was a bit high. And this remained the same till the end of the FP program in the Western regions. So I was saying also that in the literature, we have most evidence that there is an increase in enrollment, enrollment rates for people from five to 14 year old in the year that follow the FP program. But there, we lack evidence on the life, long run life outcome of those students. We lack also evidence on the intergenerational impacts of the program and also in the spillover effects in directly impacted regions in Nigeria and also across the national border in Benin. So in this study, we are examining the effect of the free primary education program that was implemented in the Western region of Nigeria from 1955 to 1966. And that program has the goal to, to improve only the access to education, but also the quality of education, because at that time, the education was the purpose of the missionary school, and people did not believe a lot. It was also a kind of system of trade, reading, arithmetic, and also religious study. So the government that came into power at that time has seen this like the other other religious group was excluded and then it set this program and it was education as its first priority of that government so we are seeking to know if this program was successful if the program has persisted over time and also how did the program influence the demand of education in nigeria and the neighboring community in Benin dash chair cultural and historical relationship with Nigeria. We are measuring the outcome, schooling outcome, such as the attendance and the primary completion. In terms of life outcome, we have work on fertility. We, we work also on occupational choices and political participation. But in this presentation, I will just present the preliminary result on political participation. And also we work on the next generation. So the method, I will show the identification, I will show the theory of change, identification strategy in the community specification. So as I said earlier, there was a challenge in Nigeria that at the time of FPE, it was to respond to the modern economy requirements, not only increase education enrollment, but also the quality as in the population, the education was perceived as the Christian purpose and population, population didn't say, see itself involved in that, that kind of purposes. So this necessity for the government that came into power to depart radically from the existing educational structure and make the education free, not only to make education free, but to make instruction in local language. And then there were a massive teacher recruitment and also a lot of school facility building. 
And from this reform, what, were, what was expected as short-term outcome is that the introduction in local instruction in local language facilitate the community engagement and participation in schooling. That will increase the people enrollment and also make people stay in school. As long-term outcome, it has to improve the labor market outcome, children school outcome, demographic characteristics such as fertility, the living standard, and also political participation in social network. And then the supporting factors that we have at school level, as I already said, we have school infrastructure building and there the were a massive recruitment of teachers. But also at community level, the fact that the, the reform was made in local language, we need to send our kids to school in local language. This facilitate the community integration and community belief to that purpose of education. And also the last thing is that this was a commitment of the government that set this as the first priority of its, its government. So how do we do to identify our subjects? We identify five locations. The first location is the direct literate location in the Western region of Nigeria, where the FP program was implemented. And then we have two spillover locations, one in Nigeria that is near the Western region, and in the other side in Benin, the community that border the Western region and speak the same language as the Western region communities. And also we have two other control community, control zone in Nigeria that are far from the Western region, and also in the other side in Benin, the community that are far from the border and do not have proximity and closeness with the Western region in Nigeria. And we also use the variation across the four to identify our subjects. Those who were born before 1940 were at 15 year old at the time of FE and were not and were not able to attend school. They were much old to attend school at that time. So those people constitute our pre FP courts. And then we have the FP court involving people who born from 1941 to 1960, and also those who are post FP courts who born before, after 1961. Uh, in all the locations that I described earlier, we use school records to identify the subject, to make the list of subjects who attended school during the time of the study. So in some locations, we were not able to get all records. And we wanted also to survey people who were at of school age at that time, but did not go to school. And we use focus group discussion to get them. And the focus group discussion involved people who were at the who were at school age at that time and were the influential people in each big family in the community. So about 76% of our subjects are alive, and where they are not still alive, we use key informant to inform about them their life and also the, the life of their descendants. Overall, we, we survey in six states in Nigeria and seven Yoruba speaking Beninese municipalities that share the border with Nigeria. And we have 3,340 subjects in our sample. So here I'm showing you the map of the survey location. You can see the map of Nigeria here and near that one, you have the map of Benin. So the, the, the part that is highlighted in Chadon here we can, is the Western region where the FP program was implemented. And we got that, we got survey in that zone and also in nearing location here and far from that location. And on Benin side, you can see the community that are bordering that region here, we show them as spillover zone in Benin and we show also some other communities that are far from the border as control zone in Benin. We model each outcome variable. Really? Wide. You have a little bit less than five minutes left. Okay. In function of the treatment variable, the quad variable, and the crossing of the two. So gamma here is our main estimate that we are looking for. And we, we model also in function of the descent to the Western region and also the set of control variables that involve the age, sex, and also the, an indicator of the subjects being alive or not. So I will present here 
pro some preliminary result on school achievement attendance in primary completion on life achievement that I also mentioned political participation and result on next generation. So in terms of school attendance, the line which is in blue here is for the Western zone where the FP program was implemented. So we can see that the FP program has increased the probability of people to attend, of people who belong to the Western zone and from the FP core to attend the school comparatively to the control zone, those who are far from the Western zone. So you can see the, the line for the control zone here, which is in yellow. And then for the spillover zone, there is not that we don't we don't find a positive a significant impact on the FP cohort, but we can see after the FP cohort, we can see on a positive impact on the school attendance, which is in the in the in the red line here. Regarding the school completion, we have the graph on the left hand side for ulcers combined and this for femal. So the results are more conclusive for the femal who have who were likely to, to attend and to complete primary school in the location where the FP was implemented in the Western region comparatively to a zone which were control zone. And then I will move to a life achievement in terms of political participation. So we asked subjects if they participate to political meeting, even though they're not involved in a political party, and also if they used to vote. So we can see in the line that I color in red here, that for female party, clearly we can say that the FP program is associated with increase in political participation for female in the Western region. And regarding the, the effect on the cohort, there is also positive impacts for FP cohort and also after the FP cohort. Uh, the result on next generation, we have asked people about the number of children that they have and the number of children that they enroll to school. And we compute the percentage of children who attend the school. So the results show that for FP cohorts that belong to the treatment one zone, meaning the Western region where the FP program was implemented, we can say much involving of parents in the education of their kids. And overall in the treatment one zone, zone the zone where the FP program was implemented, we can see also on impact. To conclude, the FP program has increased the school enrollment and the probability of completing education, primary education for FP cohort within the Western region compared to the same cohort in the control location. Overall, the, the effects are larger for female, and there is a strong evidence of spillover effect in neighboring community in Nigeria, but no much, not much to say about the cross-country spillover. The FP program is also associated with an increase in community engagement. The awareness of the program, given its size and popularity, likely instill increased education in the subsequent generation in neighboring areas, especially for female. So, what that is implies that the step that the government has taken to increase the access and quality of education has been followed by population. But what is important to notice here is that this it's because this meet the requirements. First of all, the missionary school they didn't trust to that. And as we, this was moved to something that they can rely on, it was in the local language, and the, the government participates a lot in it by increasing the share of the project devoted to education. We noticed that the population also participates. We also find impact on the next generation and the neighboring community. That is something that is useful for, for intra-regional how can I say, infrastructural collaboration. So thank you. I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Leonie, and perfect timekeeping. Uh, Justin, the bar has been set. That was impressive, <laughs> uh, as well as interesting. Um, right. Like me. Yes. All right. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody. Good to be back at RISE after being away and seeing so many people after so much time. Um, so this is a paper with Alexi, who is here, um, and Laura, who is not, um, on the long-run decline of education quality in the developing world. 
I think the existence of a learning crisis around the world is sort of one of the motivating facts of the RISE program and of a lot of work that happens in global education now. Um, and when we started this paper, we realized that like, well, we spent a lot of time trying to improve the measurement of learning outcomes around the world and even the comparability to be able to say that kids in poorer countries are lagging so far behind. We realized we didn't really have a good notion of whether that was a new phenomenon or something that's been around for a long time. Both are bad, we want to remedy it in either case, but it is informative in terms of diagnosing the causes if we understand whether this is something that can be attributed to recent policy reforms or is sort of a long-standing um, situation. So what we set out to do in this paper is to try to put together long-term trends in education quality for as many countries as we could. Um, and, I, and I want to also say that like, we're coming to this at, towards the end. I mean, we talk about a learning crisis, whereas we all know, and we can look up on the WDI and confirm it, that like, there's more literate people in the world now than there's ever been, right? We're in a period of like, the highest learning levels the world has ever seen in absolute terms. And I think what we all understand is like, what we're concerned about is conditional on going to school. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe we're not in the best of all times. Well, that's where the end of the question mark is, and that's what we kind of want to establish here. So we're going to try to establish some really simple descriptive facts um, at a very 30,000 foot level. Um, how we do it, uh, this kind of <laughs> went viral from one of my former colleagues, Pam Jukila, on Twitter, the XKCD, you know, types of development economics paper. I've written many of these. Like, look, I randomized. Um, uh, I won't go into all of the others. But this one is really, did you know you can combine lots of DHS data sets <laughs> into one? Uh, Pam didn't even know I was working on this, and like, sure enough. Um, it also fits some of the others. I mean, Lance, Lance written some of these. Um, so maybe it's not the unadulterated schools, they're good, but I still do want to come back with a schools, they're good being the message of the paper at the end. But we are, I mean, this is really what we're doing, which is taking all the DHS data sets from 87 countries, 300 and some rounds, putting them together, so repeated cross-sections. The key for us is going to be to have at least three rounds of DHS surveys, you'll see why, from a given country to be able to put together the trends that we want. Okay, so it's really three parts. First, how do we measure education quality? A graph from like the beginning of RISE, I really, I didn't even do it again, I just pasted it up here. It still has the typo, that's Liberia, not Lebanon. Um, uh, so, Highest grade attained, zero to eight. Just to measure what proportion of women aged 25 to 34 would be literate with that many years of schooling. You'd hope that shoots up to 100 pretty quickly, but of course it doesn't. Um, and as you can see, around the world, you kind of span the range from Sierra Leone down here at like 10% of women with five years of, sorry, with seven or eight years of schooling can read a single sentence up to Burundi and Rwanda with you know, 100% literacy conditional on that level of schooling. So the, the quality range is huge. And that is, if you draw a line through this at five years of schooling, that's essentially the measure of education quality that we're going to use throughout here. How literate is an adult woman predicted to be with five years of schooling? You can say that's not education quality. Fine. But semantics. I think we're measuring very well what we're doing. Whether you want to call it education quality or literacy conditional on schooling, you can I search and replace my entire presentation with literacy conditional on schooling, if, if that's more acceptable. Um, OK. And if you look at that, it like that measure correlates quite well with the World Bank harmonized learning outcomes. It correlates with per capita GDP. It correlates with lots of stuff in ways that you would expect it to across countries. Now, to trends, because where we're headed is trends. And the question is, how do we get trends out of repeated cross sections? And we need to talk about three kinds of time. Age, period, and cohorts. Are there any like sociologists or demographers in the room? There must be some. I mean, for demographers, this is like what you do. And economists don't do it that often. But there's a little corner of economists who do it. The challenge is that we've got this is literacy rate. We've just taken the women with four to six years of schooling. This is the raw literacy rate. And this is all the different DHSs. And this is the year of birth. And so Indonesia is a really simple case which is like, can you read a single sentence? That level of literacy, if you've made it to four to six years of schooling, is pretty good in Indonesia. And it seems to have been pretty flat. 
And so is it survey effects? Is it age? Like, yeah, Indonesia, we can spend a lot of time, but it doesn't make a lot of difference. It's all kind of flat. Um, but you get to other countries, and you can see things get very messy. So here's Ethiopia, which has had these five rounds of DHSs. And you can try to say, like, well, what's happening to literacy rates in, in Ethiopia? And you can pick a single survey and kind of look at the different women of different ages and try to do it that way. But if you take a woman born in 1970 and interview her in 2000, and then you come back five years later, the literacy rate seems to be very different. right? So that's either something's happening in Ethiopia that everybody's forgetting how to read, or something happens over your life cycle. Right? So there's cohorts. Well, let's, talk, let's go to my slide. The real problem here is there's three different kinds of time we need to worry about. In our context, age. Literacy could accumulate or decay over time. If you're a farmer and you got educated 10 years ago, maybe you've forgotten things. Period. In other contexts, period effects can mean different things. In our context, I think it's best to think of them as just survey round effects. A given survey, survey round could produce quirky statistics. If you talk to the DHS people, they're very open. Like, oh, yeah, no, the 1999 Nigeria DHS is a mess. Why did you use that? Like, oh, OK. Um, uh, and that one's actually true for our Nigeria friends <laughs> online. Um, the cohort effects are what we're really after, which is that some cohorts generally got better education than others did. That's what we want to try to distinguish. The problem is like the <laughs> fundamental culinary here. Your age is the period in which we're interviewing you minus the year you were born. So you cannot, if you want a really flexible functional form, you cannot identify all three of these things. And you just have to assume your way out of the problem. And the literature is full of different ways of assuming your way out of the problem. To make a long, <laughs> Alexi's crying is like months of work figuring out the right way to do this. And I'm just going to skip over and say, the deaton Paxson kind of recommended solution is just assume that there are no trends in the period effects. Like some surveys may be wonky or whatever, but like the surveys are not getting systematically better or worse over time. Those are mean zero survey effects. Then you can identify this. We go a little further, and we say that the age effects are quadratic to simplify things. But um, OK, so then you go back to that Ethiopia picture. And if you apply those assumptions, then you can disentangle. Over time, as we saw, if that woman born in 1970 does seem to be losing literacy over her life cycle. Right? There is, it could have gone the other way. Could have been, do you leave school, you get a job, and you need to read, and you accumulate literacy over time. And there are a couple of countries in which that's true. But for the most part, it's usually flat or slightly negative. Um, period effects, you know, there is sort of a consistent shift right there in Ethiopia. So it seems to be mostly an age effect and not a period effect. And then once we've extracted all those things, we get what we're after, which is the quote unquote quality of education in Ethiopia over time from the cohort born in 1950 all the way to the cohort born in the late 1990s. And we see there kind of flat for about two to three decades in Ethiopia, and then since about the time that I was born, declining. If we can, we can do the same thing for Nigeria, where again, it's really not that difficult because all the surveys seem to stack right on top of each other. There is a little bit of an age decay effect. Surveys bump around very slightly, but what we see is from about the 1950s that we were just talking about, which is as far back as we can go, there's that decline through the 60s to the 70s, kind of flattening out in the 80s and the 1990s. That's basically what we're doing in this paper. I have six more minutes to just talk to you more about it. But, um, Indonesia, you know, I think we can have a conversation. Like, we, what we're seeing here in Indonesia is perfectly flat, no decline. And I know, whoop, there's Amanda. Um, uh, it could very well be that we're seeing, or you're seeing, declines for higher order skills which could be consistent with people still knowing how to read a single sentence. Um, but I think it's probably worth us. I'd love to understand more what you guys are seeing from the Rise Indonesia team. Um, so pooling those all together, the two facts that I kind of started off with. Unconditional literacy rates, all these gray squiggly lines are an individual country. Pool them by regions. Unconditional literacy rates, up, up, and up, right? Um, the ranking of, uh, of regions kind of staying constant, except for South Asia, kind of pushing up above Sub-Saharan Africa. 
think that's what we knew and expected. What I think we didn't really know or necessarily expect was if we start looking at expected literacy at grade eight, five, our measure of quality, we see kind of flat lines in Latin America, East Asia, and the Middle East, and these fairly steep downward trends in both South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Those are the cohort effects, and that's our measure of, of education quality. Men, DHS sometimes does this with the men and sometimes doesn't, so the samples are smaller. We don't have enough surveys even to do the Middle East um, or Latin America, but the African and South Asian result looks fairly similar for the men as well as the women. Okay, now, um, <laughs> half of you are sitting there going, yeah, 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 but it's entirely <laughs> that there's a bunch more kids in school now, and you brought in all the kids who didn't make it into school before, and the schools haven't gotten any worse. It's just, you know, different kids in and different, kids, different learning results out. Um, my answer is going to be, yeah, maybe. Um, I still think we should care about the downward trend, even if it is affected by the composition of kids. But I, don't, I think there's some evidence that it's not entirely that. Um, but I want to be clear that we're like informally bounding this wondering whether we should do a more formal bounding exercise. But for now, just suggestive evidence, two pieces of evidence. One, selection patterns have for sure changed. We need an indicator uh, of your health or wealth before you went to school. Remember, we're doing this all off of interviews with adult women. And we don't care what their socioeconomic status is now. The question is, what was it before? DHS doesn't give you a lot to go with there. But what we do have in a candidate suggested in the literature, used in a lot of papers, um, is to use adult height as a measure of deprivation when you were a kid. Um, the idea being that your height was mostly determined before your schooling was. Overall height is rising in the sample, not for every country. So this is trend in height, change in centimeters per year in the average woman um, over multiple decades, rising in most countries, but not all. Um, and as you can see, for the most part, the, the trend for all women is to the right of the trend for women with schooling, which you have to squint and think about this every time, but is what you would expect if the disadvantaged kids are moving into the schooling system. And so that brings down the trend in height for women with schooling. Okay. So we are seeing a change in selection. There is a, as we would have thought. Long story short, fine. Throw that into there as a control is the best we can do for now. And my story about what happened to the quality of education in Ethiopia changes like not at all. Um, and to some extent, it's because height only has so much explanatory power, but it doesn't seem to move the needle at all on that trend. The same thing going for Nigeria and across the board. That global picture I showed you doesn't change. Um, finally, did quality trends change when fees changed? Back to the FPE experiments we just talked about, or natural experiments. If you think it's all about when bunches of kids came into the system, um, this is percentage of women with five years of schooling. The line is at the FPE reform. This is Ethiopia. And sure enough, years of schooling kind of kinked upwards. And yes, some evidence. So I cherry picked countries with the biggest kink here in terms of years of schooling. Where did FPE have? punch on schooling. And then the question is, did it change the quality? Maybe there was a kink there in Ethiopia. I'm not going to live or die on that hill. All I really want you to take away is that it wasn't going up beforehand. Right? That's the story. This doesn't need to be a selection story. Maybe FPE made the schools worse and up the TFB of the production function of schools went down, about overcrowding or who knows what. My story is about this was already a decline even before that, even before that reform. And that's true in all of the cases with the most biggest kinks in terms of enrollment with FPE, Madagascar and Mali and so on. So to wrap up, over the last 50 years, literacy in the developing world has boomed. Never been better. Education quality, measured here as literacy per year of schooling, has stagnated or declined. And the cross-country gaps in education quality started off huge from a 90% chance of being literate after five years to a 10% chance of being literate after five years. And that's mostly just stayed the same. The countries that were way behind are still way behind a half century later. Selection certainly drives some of that, the downward trend. That said, students are healthier and wealthier than ever before. 
Um, and the decline predates the abolition of fees in most countries. There we go. Oh. Nice job with the timing, Justin. Um, I think you pressed the button. It couldn't have been that perfect. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Piper. Uh, I work with the Gates Foundation, and I want to greet everybody, but particularly the team in Nigeria. I feel like you've been left out for a while, so greetings from me. Um, I'm going to talk today about a set of interviews I've done with um, educationists from all over the world. So the title is The Wisdom of the International Education Sector's Elders, Lessons for How to Improve Learning. Now, if I interviewed you and you're not an elder, don't be offended. <laughs> you're an elder with respect to your wisdom, not your age. But um, the, the motivation for this uh, study and presentation today is that I'm, I have a new job. And the thing I know to do when I have a new job or an old job or a new thing is to do some research around it. So this is a very simple attempt to understand the sector's view of what you would tell a new person entering into a new role on the donor side of things. So basically what we have are a bunch of interviews with experts across the sector. And I asked those of you who are in this room who are part of this study, I asked you a bunch of questions, but they were bracketed and bucketed into four different research questions that I wanted to know. Number one. Before I became a donor, I wanted to ask you this first question, which is, what are the characteristics of an effective donor? And some of these people are on the donor side, some are on the research side, some are on the policy making side, and some are on the implementer side. And so you have a range of experiences. And I really wanted to know, before I became one, what you think made someone good at this? Because I think you might tell me a different story now than you did then. Uh, what are the characteristics of an effective donor, as well as what are the characteristics of a bad one? <laughs> people had a lot of things to say on that level. Um, and then particularly for the foundation, what would you say that we should do to improve or change in, uh, our work in the sector? Critically, what are the key technical things that you thought were an opportunity to support? What are the things we should do? And then critically, what are the things we should stop doing? Uh, not just us, but the overall sector. And then I had a, a research question that I won't spend a lot of time on, but I do want to call out that I asked everybody I've talked to since then, what are the technically strong local education partners in Sub-Saharan Africa? And the results of that portion of the study were pretty sad uh, um, as far as the, the new things. So that's a task for us, as, uh, both here in, the, in RISE as well as us in the broader sector. So let me headline for you some of the key findings. By the way, this first one was somewhat of a surprise to me. I was expecting that. Uh, working for an organization that's focused on improving learning outcomes that the people I talked to would say, by the way, this is the wrong direction, you should go a different way. But there was resounding, not unanimous, but resounding support for prioritizing improving learning outcomes and lower primary as the fundamental thing that the sector should be doing and us in particular at the foundation. There was real guidance on the attributes of effective and ineffective grant makers, which we'll see how well I apply. Um, the third one is that there was quite a bit of suggestions on what we should continue, supporting teachers. There's been, that's been a theme for a lot of the presentations so far, that the teaching task is difficult, teachers need support. Another one was about the idea of connecting research and implementation. How does RISE and RISE researchers and RISE affiliated researchers or just RISE, people are here at RISE today. How do we make sure the research that you're doing is connected to the daily tasks of implementation, fundamentally touching those teachers? And then critically, given the title of RISE, how do we embed change into systems? There are a bunch of things that uh, the sector should stop. Uh, I'm just bucketing them right now. One is the ineffective teacher training, just having a, a conversation over tea about, is it that all teacher professional development, is it all in-service teacher training that's ineffective? I think Dave and others have a paper that showed that there are some teacher training, in-service teacher training programs that are effective, but those are not the typical ones. There are some design considerations that make some trainings more effective than others, but not all trainings, if not most trainings, are not designed that way. Uh, a second one's really important uh, in an organization like mine. It's the short program cycles. How can we 
and the funding that we do, as well as the sort of pushes we make in the sector, how can we make sure that we're not just doing this one-off and then moving on quite quickly? How do we make sure we stick with something to deal with the complex changes that Simon talked about? And the critical one is, how do we stop imposing Western and Northern perspectives? Now, a lot of this is selection bias. Maybe this is because, as someone who's interested in these things, I talk to a lot of people from Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and South Asia, which are the, the technical areas of focus for the foundation. But I think that's a really resounding one, is that we're going to be effective. In my experience, we're going to be much more effective if the ideas, perspectives, uh, designs are driven by people from the context that we care about. So, so let, me, let me go back to the top first question, what are the characteristics of an effective donor? Here are some quotes from, from the uh, International Education Elders. Respect those on the ground who have a better knowledge of what's happening. On the other hand, respect and leverage the donor's global knowledge. I'm not sure where you think the balance is between those things, but I think that, that's number one. Be clear about the thesis about what you're trying to change and be consistent and work around that change. This one was uh, humbling as a, as a new Gates staff member that we have undue influence. Uh, how do you acknowledge that dynamic but really find how to be humble? I want to be a learner from, from all of you. Don't move the goalposts or change the rules of the game. This is, I think, a cl complaint about a lot of the donors in the room, including us, at least not without fair warning. Obviously, things shift, but how do we treat partners in shifts? Uh, the, the bottom one is really about the size of our particular foundation. Our funding is quite small relative. Well, I can say both sides of that. It's huge, but it's also really small uh, in, with relative terms with respect to other donors in the sector. So our influence is more likely to be about ideas and capabilities than actually funding physical things, the trainings, implementation ourselves. The, the, the next one is about the idea of silos, um, how to programs connecting. Uh, and then I think this is in general terms for anybody in the room. What can you do that others can't? That really goes to my view of development. The only reason I'm sticking in this space is because there are things that I can do and support that others can't. That means I have to learn fast because people in these contexts learn the skills I have quite quickly. So if I'm going to validate myself being in this field for a long time, I need to learn something new. Otherwise, I'm not either learning or I'm not being effective in making sure those things are shared. Working how to bring together collaborative, uh, creating a community uh, practice. So uh, I, I didn't put some of the negative quotes, but uh, these are some of the positive ones on the characteristics of an effective donor. Um, in particular for us, and I, I suppose this is in general, what are the things, what are the, what are the things that the Gates Foundation should do? These were kind of related to just us. What should we be doing differently? If you have 100 priorities, you have exactly zero definition of priorities. Um, stop teaching things that aren't reading if they can't read. Uh, and I think really importantly, the connection between foundation literacy, numeracy, and skills. It's nonsense for us to say that we are choosing between skills, socio-emotional learning, and literacy and numeracy. That's nonsense. These things are fundamental to that. But whether you are doing it just because you like seeing little kids read, which is a wonderful experience, or because you want to make sure that the broader community in the international education sector has a strong pathway to the workforce, the kids who are going to eventually become young people who are eventually going to be uh, workers need these basic skills. These things are not dichotomous. You have to have them connected and focusing on NFLN, as I've heard from you, is really important. And then the space of, for data. Some real challenges um, that we got and the, the work that the foundation has done. There's too much focus on reading. FLN, if you call it foundation literacy and numeracy, a full half is about numeracy. So how can we push more for numeracy? And I have kind of adapted that slightly. It's not just pushing more on numeracy. It's considering the experience of an individual teacher who is both supposed to improve literacy and supposed to improve numeracy. And in the few programs that have both, the design of the numeracy interventions are often completely contradictory to the design of the literacy programs. So we're saying FLN, yes, do both. But the teacher says, oh, here's a program that looks one way for literacy and is fundamentally different for numeracy. So how can we simplify the task, the instructional change process that many of you talked about? How can we make it easier for the typical rural teacher and not cause the problem ourselves by the lack of integration between these things? So others raise concerns about positioning FLN as the only priority. Uh, making sure we're linking it to other outcomes. And as I've said earlier, kind of the, the, the literacy numeracy stuff being a stepping stone 
to improving upper primary and secondary. We don't have the same amount of data on secondary and upper primary learning outcomes. I think that Sierra, Sierra Leone study we saw is one of the few that really has strong relationships between the sort of structured approaches that they tried and learning outcomes. That's one to study if you haven't looked at it in much more depth. But my hunch is the sort of things are gonna work at scale inside of government systems to improve learning outcomes in lower primary are meaningful lessons in upper primary or secondary. And it would be a, I'm going fast, but stay with me. It would be heartbreaking for us to not have enough success in the, the, the primary foundational phase, we say, oh, let's just move on to another thing. And we, we start off in secondary as if we've learned nothing about how to improve learning outcomes on, on, on lower primary. Are you with me? Yeah. So we have to do well. If those of you, not everyone in this room is bought into this FLN stuff. But regardless, we have to do well to improve lower primary outcomes so that the lessons from that, not all of them are gonna be the, exactly the same, but there are some lessons for that, particularly the systems and scales point of view that can be useful for the broader sector. Sorry, I got excited. So our third question are kind of ideas. What are the technical things that we should support, not just we, but the broader sector? Number one, on implementation, the implementation bucket. Narrow the gap between policy and implementation. The circular that's written from the capital means a very different thing for the teacher implementing it. How can we connect those things? Uh, and how do we get evidence actually integrated into program designs? Um, that connection of, even in my team, making sure that when they have an idea of a new thing we can fund, what's the evidence for that thing? It's not straightforward. Learning will come from doing. We know enough now to do good work. So working with government. If you don't work within the structures of government, there will be inefficiencies. The, the typical task of a mid-level civil servant, you saw those Ghana districts that were talked about before, what does their daily life look like? And how does this learning improvement emphasis that a lot of us have, how does that affect the daily life of that mid-level civil servant? Often it doesn't at all. That's a design issue. Help us improve systems and capacity so that the, the talented people in Sub-Saharan Africa can have the institutions they deserve. Uh, and outcomes will happen. Teachers, 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 I focus on teachers, I focus on pedagogy. Training teachers is essential to scale. Supporting them, doing that in a way that's evidence-based is fundamental. Partners, we talked about yesterday, for those of you who were there, the importance of investing in the capacity of the next generation of African researchers. That's what the quote was. But they also, for us, we're thinking about the research side as well as the implementation side. There are very talented people who know how to improve learning outcomes much better than any single one of us who are in these countries. How can we make sure they have the place and ability to do the research that applies to their sector as well as to design, lead, and implement the programs that are gonna make the biggest difference. So those are some of the things you told me. Now I'm saying it's strong, but these were your ideas. Uh, the fourth one, um, oh, what are the things we shouldn't support? Short sprints, we gotta stick with this stuff over time. Uh, how do you work in a way that builds capacity as opposed to taking it away? And this idea of Northern and Western ideas. Where, where's the germ of an idea? I'm, I'm proud that so many of the things that have worked well and, and the things that I've been connected to are not my idea. I said yesterday in, this, in the session, my job is to be an idea person, but that is not new. That is my view for a long time. The ideas are gonna solve the quality of education in Sub-Saharan Africa and India already exist in these countries. How can we find the people who have them and validate support, make those things work better? Someone should say amen to that one because that one's very true. Yeah. Number four. Uh, going to the last point, who are the technically strong local education partners in sub-Saharan Africa? In particular, we're also working in India, but we really have strong partners there already. We have strong partners in sub-Saharan Africa, but how can we make them less underrepresented, both on the research side and implementation side? Uh, I'm proud to be connected to a few of them and are really doing a great job. Um, there's, when I asked this question, a small number of partners were mentioned multiple times, uh, and uh, they often had a very Anglophone bent. Maybe that's a selection bias given my very American language abilities. You know what I mean by that. Um, and then how do we make sure we're doing a better job of connecting with organizations working on FLN across the continent? I'm wrapping up soon. Here are my, our overall conclusions. I have one slide after this. We, based on this evidence, as well as the analysis of the foundation, we're gonna really focus on improving learning outcomes. That's the, the ultimate story. But in, with particular emphasis in the short term on responding to learning loss. The good thing is that the sector has evidence of things that can work to improve outcomes at scale. We are in a different era than we used to be. 
We have evidence of things that can work to improve outcomes at scale. There's a bunch of reports to show them. Three of the ones that we're really interested in are structured pedagogy, teaching at the right level, and remediation. There's overlaps between those. We have a research focus for global ed. I won't go into all those. I guess I should, because it's RISE. <laughs> Comparability of 4.1.1a and 4.1.1b, uh, research connected to implementation. It is inevitable if you're implementing something, your program will fail in some parts of the country. The question is how fast you find that out. Going to Simon's point, maybe the differentiation between the programs had a lot of, a lot of schools making movement is how quickly the program, the government realized that the ones in the middle weren't doing the program. Are you finding that out two years later? The teachers have already given up. If you're finding that out quickly, you can have impacts happen. Consider scale and systems as we talked about, and as I, as I think it's critical to emphasize, to have an ongoing eye on the typical teacher using the typical pedagogical methods in a typical rural school. That changing that setting, helping that process of change is fundamental. In the paper I wrote related to this, this is the last, sent, uh, last paragraph, I won't read it. Uh, I've highlighted some of the things I want to emphasize. What are the partners on the ground? How do we make sure we're supporting teachers to deliver these things effectively? How do we get into the details of classroom pedagogy, the choices that individual teachers make about how to teach? Kane's, Kane's presentation on, we have increased knowledge, pedagogical content knowledge in Ethiopia, but the pedagogy is bad. My dissertation was in every region in Ethiopia. You ask teachers about this new reform that they were doing 15 years, I won't tell you how old I am, but a few years ago. They could tell you the program. They could talk about student-centeredness. When you observe their classrooms and measure student-centeredness, there was no difference from those that were trained from those who were not. It is not just having these programs implemented, spread. It's whether the individual teacher and the rural area are using those things in their choices daily. How do we respond to inevitable, inevitable implementation challenges? How do we do this you know, with government systems? And the last thing to say is how do we do it at scale? Anything good with this from, uh, was done by Izzy, who worked on a lot of this in the back, as well as all of the uh, international education elders that uh, shared this knowledge. Anything bad was me. Thank you. Well, indeed, it is so great to be back here at an in-person RISE conference. It's been far too long. Um, and I'm excited to present on some of this new work I've been doing on purpose-driven education systems and the role that we believe that purpose plays in how education systems shift. And so to start with, I want to start with a puzzle. And so the, this puzzle is the case of Vietnam, which we've heard a bit about over the last few days and, and this morning as well. Um, and Vietnam participated in the PISA assessments in 2015 and 2018 and just performed exceedingly higher than would be expected based on its level of income or level of uh, development and um, surpassed OECD learning levels on some of these learning measures and just you know, performed very well. This graph digs a little bit more uh, deeply into some comparisons of, with other middle income countries that participated in the PISA D assessments. And when you dig into it and compare these 15 year old students in the other middle income countries with the students in Vietnam, on average, the Vietnamese students are scoring about 200 PISA points higher than the other students, which is the equivalent of about eight years worth of learning. So this is just an enormous gap in achievement that we can see in this country. And so you can see there that Vietnamese students far outperform children, even of similar demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, and even from wealthier countries. And I want to start with a second puzzle. And that puzzle is the case of uh, Sobral, Brazil. So Sobral is a municipality in Brazil. It's among the poor municipalities in Brazil. It's in the state of Sora, which is among the poor states in Brazil. And over the course of about a 12-year period, that municipality undertook a series of education reforms, which led it to rise from, as you can see there, being ranked the 1,366th municipality in the country to the top ranked municipality on a national learning assessment. And so in the graph, you can see that while most of Sobral's schools are in the second lowest SES category, they're now outperforming pretty consistently nearly all of the schools of higher SES status. 
And so what explains these kinds of learning achievements? So in these examples, higher income or resources and or greater knowledge of kind of you know, what works to uh, achieve learning improvements cannot explain the differences that we observe in these learning outcomes. These examples and others that I can point to leave us with these much more complex questions of how and why success was achieved in these contexts. And so in this presentation, I'm going to propose a conceptual framework for understanding some of these drivers of education system performance. And I'm going to use it to argue that a commitment to the purpose of learning is a critical missing link to addressing the learning crisis and to kind of how we think about addressing the learning crisis. And then I'm going to apply that conceptual framework to examples that we have of successful system shifts. And then finally, I'm going to describe some of the efforts that we've seen um, and observed that have fostered and kind of facilitated a commitment to the purpose of learning in a variety of contexts. And so to start, so for our conceptual framework, we borrow from the organizational management literature, which holds that organizations have at their core a technical core that produces the value for that organization. And then that core is supported by support functions that enable it to function. And so within an organization's technical core is that organization's purpose. So this is the set of like strongly held beliefs about why that organization exists, what it's meant to achieve, what the expectations are of people who are within that organization. And then in an effective organization, that's then paired with technical practices, which provide the technical skills and the know-how that's necessary for achieving that purpose. And that technical core is then supported by these support functions, which kind of create the operating conditions and the infrastructure that's necessary for the technical core to produce that value. So human resources and IT and, and legal and procurement and things like this. And so purpose takes different forms as well in different organizations. So in some contexts, this purpose is going to be fairly explicit. So for example, a hospital might have the purpose of providing high quality health care. Um, you know, if it's an effective hospital, it would pair that with technical practices like highly skilled doctors and nurses with the technical know-how necessary. And it would pair that, again, with support functions in support of achieving that purpose. So IT systems aligned for that, hiring practices aligned for that as well. But in some organizations, the purpose is much more implicit, hidden, um, maybe unobserved. And so for, for an example here, just to pick a little bit on tech companies because they're easy to pick on, but you can think of maybe a social media company that claims its purpose it's, it is to maybe change the world for the better, when in fact it's kind of only moderately hidden purpose um, is really just to maximize advertising dollars, right? Okay, so what we hold in this paper is that these same three characteristics that drive organizational performance also drive system performance and in particular drive education system performance. Okay, so if we think all three of these characteristics work together to drive performance, then we can step back and say, okay, what are we researching? What are we evaluating? What are we implementing? And what kind of practice are we doing on the ground? And so when you look at interventions that are done, most interventions uh, focus either on technical practices, things like teacher training, things that increase technical skills and know-how, or on support functions, expanding EMIS systems, procuring more inputs, things like this. But the purpose receives relatively and comparatively little attention, and we argue that it's a missing link in thinking about how to address the learning crisis. And so when we look out across education systems today, there's many forms of purpose that we can observe in education systems. And so these are just a few examples to put out there. And so one form that we see are education systems in contexts where there's been a maintenance of an elite focused education system. So in these contexts, that purpose would often be implicit. It's not usually going to be explicit. It might include uh, expansion of schooling for the masses, but quality education has maybe been reserved primarily for an elite cotter. Um, an example of this would be, you know, the way that our friends Karthik, Murdharan, and Abhijit Singh refer to the India system as not primarily an education system, but rather a selection system. Its main purpose is to select top performers for more schooling and good jobs, provide schooling to the masses, but with much less regard for the learning outcomes. Another form that we take, that we see purpose taking, um, are, are contexts where there's contest, contested purpose, and obviously these all overlap in, in places, you know, these aren't kind of exclusive categories. 
Um, but these would be contexts where the system maybe has too many purposes. And so even if all of them are good and legitimate purposes, the system might be pulled in too many different directions to be able to achieve them all. There might be contradictory purposes, there might be outright disagreement or infighting within the system about what purpose it's trying to work towards. And so an example here could be education systems that maybe nominally have been tasked with providing a high quality education for all children. But maybe that same education system is tasking its teachers with uh, completing the curriculum syllabus every single year, uh, w regardless of maybe the learning levels in their classroom, tasking teachers with preparing children for you know, high stakes exams, and these other tasks that might actually be contradictory with the original purpose of providing a quality education. Another form that we see purpose take is contexts where maybe the purpose has been corrupted. So the purpose has been hijacked or supplanted by other, maybe hidden purposes. These purposes might include things like rents for officials, contractors through uh, procurement, you know, patronage networks, things like this. And then finally, education systems that have been repurposed in a way that encompasses a purpose of learning for all. So these would be contexts uh, that include uh, the establishment of, of learning as a fundamental purpose of the education system, followed by the actions necessary to then support this purpose. Um, and so what we're arguing in this is that this commitment to this purpose of learning may be a necessary, even if it's not a sufficient condition, we're not arguing it's sufficient, but a necessary condition uh, for achieving the kind of large scale learning improvements that we wanna see in so many education systems. And so now I wanna apply that conceptual framework to success cases that we have in examples. So this is the Sabral case that I mentioned at the beginning. And so when you dig into the story of Sabral um, and look at what happened there, what we argue is that what what kind of was at the heart of some of these reforms was an establishment of the purpose of learning. And so an assessment that was conducted by the municipality found that 40% of primary school students were unable to read. That, along with many other factors and conditions that were in place in the municipality, led those municipal leaders to establish learning as a core purpose uh, by setting really clear and committed goals for universal literacy in the first two years of primary school. They set goals for remediation for older children who had already moved out of those first two uh, years of primary school. And then uh, I, I think an important factor there too was that then they kind of filtered that commitment to the purpose of learning through all the other levels of the system. So it wasn't just a kind of a top-down command and control, but they filtered this kind of uh, commitment and dedication to the goal to the other levels of the system as well. From that establishment of this purpose, then they implemented all sorts of improvements to technical practices, right? They supported teachers, they provided new materials to them, they did classroom observations and coaching and things like this. And they implemented improvements to support functions. They, they introduced meritocratic hiring of principals and adapted information systems to include uh, learning-based monitoring. And then from that package of those characteristics, or those actions that were done, is we argue, is how they were able to achieve these large learning gains that they saw. And so a second example, which I won't go into for the sake of time, but just to say there was also a large curriculum reform in Tanzania, which provides another case where we're arguing that there was this establishment of, of the purpose of learning and a commitment to specific learning goals that was followed by um, kind of aligned actions in a way that allowed them to achieve pretty substantial learning, um, learning improvements there. And also just to say, I'm focused here on, on, on success cases because I, prefer to be a positive person and kind of like to do optimistic examples. Um, but in the paper, we also use the same framework to, to kind of ex to try to explain places where things don't work. And so interventions that maybe focus too much on technical practices or support functions in places where that purpose wasn't in place to try to explain some of the kind of null results that we see or just lack of sustainable results that we see in a lot of cases. And so if we're arguing that this commitment to the purpose of learning is so important, how have we seen it fostered or facilitated in different contexts? And so there's a few that we draw out in the paper. There's other ways as well, but these are three that we highlight. And so one is conducting or funding learning assessments to spur kind of this political and citizen-led attention and pressure to act. So a common theme across the success cases that we see is that there was usually some introduction of new information on low learning into the system. Again. There's lots of places where that happens uh, where action is not taken on learning. It's not a sufficient condition, but it might be a necessary condition to start launching some of those processes. 
Um, and, and new information also can help to strengthen and empower people who are within the system, who are maybe already champions of learning, but need that kind of uh, a, a little more, uh, you know, something to point to or pull from to try to bring about change from within their own systems as well. A second example is supporting domestic think and do tanks. Um, these civil society actors, I think many of which we heard you know, Ben referring to as well, can often have an outsized influence on what politicians and other leaders in a system prioritize and act on. We have many examples um, from within the RISE network, but also you know, beyond it as well, where these kinds of actors have played a really significant role in shifting the priorities within a system. Um, and then third, funding programs and scholarships for tomorrow's leaders. So investing in tomorrow's leaders today. And so this takes a long-term view. You know, it's not a typical kind of uh, education project, if you will, but it aligns with the theory of change of some organizations like Teach for All. There's also um, efforts from beyond the education space and beyond the education sector that have taken this kind of approach that I think the education sector could learn from. And then just to close out, uh, this is a quote from a researcher that's a part of our, our, well, it's probably a paraphrased quote, to be honest, but it is aligned at least with something that a researcher from our Vietnamese team said. And you know, I gave the Vietnam example up at the top, and we have a country research team investigating how did Vietnam achieve these kind of outsized learning achievements and outcomes. And, and you know, when asked, how do they do this? How do they achieve this? They could, the researchers can give all sorts of reasons and factors and conditions, and when you say, yeah, but, but what really made the difference? The systems that change are the ones that want to change. Vietnam wanted those high education outcomes. They were committed to it at, at a societal level, and from that flowed the other factors and conditions that enabled them to achieve that kind of change. And so what we're arguing is we think that commitment to this kind of purpose of learning is a key condition that can help drive and, and, and achieve the kind of system shifts that we want to see to achieve the large learning improvements that we want. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, could we, uh, by the way, the women, one on the time. Oh. Yeah, thanks. Oh. Um, uh, could you come and sit down at the front? Uh, ben, Justin, and Michelle. And Lieni, you're still online, fantastic. So what we're going to do, uh, Justin, are we okay to go to Abuja first? Okay, we've uh, obviously had a little bit of um, uh, problems connecting with our colleagues in Abuja, so we're gonna give them the opportunity to ask their questions first. Um, they've been relaying them to Justin, who will read them out, and then we'll go to uh, the floor here. Okay? Yes, great, great. Um, yeah, you'll have lots of questions from the hub because <laughs> they haven't had a chance for a while. Um, so I've bundled a few together. I think they were getting at the same thing. Um, therefore, Leone, um, does the study on free education in Nigeria consider or have lessons for the contemporary challenges in Nigeria, particularly incomplete? primary education and out-of-school children. Um, thanks, Rosti. Uh, and then there was another question for Ben, uh, which was, how, how do we uh, think about balancing so-called, in quotes, education quality and local relevance? For example, assuming students can't read complete sentences in English, but they reside in a context where Kiswahili is the relevant um, local language and, and maybe they are proficient in that language. So how to think about that issue. Uh, Leone, did you hear that question okay? Would yeah. you like to start yeah. if you did? We can't hear you. you yeah, mm. let me repeat it to be sure that I understood. So the question is about the challenge of not completing the primary education in grade C. Instead of, instead they are completing it in grade Five, right? Answer more broadly from how does your research inform contemporary challenges within the Nigerian education system, of which that is one. Okay, so before I start answering, let me say that there are too far to be considering with this study. First of all, we are talking about a study that lasts for the moment my parents were kids. So it's like, it's not the time when my parents were deciding on schooling issue but in the time where my grandparents were deciding so when we were collecting data it was very challenging to get the accurate information on on that period but i can say also that we are still working and we have another round of data collection to be com completed soon so the results are very preliminary we didn't consider 
what the question is talking about in the study from the result that I have now, but we should we should further consider it in, in the next step of the study. Okay, great. Uh, ben, uh, education quality in local context. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the issue of how do we make sure that the assessments and the measures that we are applying to determine quality apply to the con I mean, to the to the local country and in Nigeria and in Kenya. I think the example you gave of assessing kids in English, but their first language is Kiswahili. I think it's actually more complicated that even in Kenya, where Kiswahili is more of an a uh, second language than a first language for a large portion of the population off the, that's not on the coast. So the first study that I actually uh, led in Kenya measured one kid in three languages. So you measure their mm -hmm. mother tongue, you measure Kiswahili, you measure English, and you look at how those relationships differ. And the basic story was kids could decode English, but comprehended their local language better. Just a mess because it's such an inefficient system at the time because they were getting most of their instruction in language that they ultimately didn't comprehend and the languages they did comprehend, they weren't getting instruction in so they couldn't decode. So a lot of the, the languages in Kenya as well as elsewhere in Africa have diacritics on the, on, on, on the letters, but the kids had no idea what those diacritics were, but they could decode complex English words, but they didn't understand it. So anyway. Point being, with respect to your question, uh, I think it's really important to, to start off from an understanding of what's happening locally in design research studies and implementation that takes that into account, thinking of those first languages, second languages, and critically, how they interact. One of the things I'm really interested in at the moment is actually not just whether kids can read, but whether or not those skills for reading can transfer as the children move up uh, throughout the primary cycle, wherever that kind of the transition to the L2 or L3 is that's a really important thing and it has to be related to what the countries want and what the country's policies are with respect to language and with respect to outcomes in, in upper primary and secondary. Let, let's take, we have a couple more questions from the hub. Yeah, yeah two more questions from, from the Nigeria hub. Um, both for Leone, uh, maybe unsurprisingly. Uh, one is what were the policies or strategies the government used to achieve success in the free primary education program? Uh, and the second question, uh, can you uh, explain the reason for the sharp decline in education completion for the control group uh, post FPE? Can I go ahead? Please go ahead if you had them. Yep. Okay, okay thank you. So, the strategy that I can mention is that I already talked about it during my presentation. First of all, the education was made in, in the local language. Formerly, that was not the case. That was not the case, and this is the fact that the, the, due to that reason, parents didn't want to go to send their kids to school because they are think that, they're thinking that a religious study, arithmetic and reading, is like another kind of oppression of the population. Because at that time in 1916, and a year, some year before that, all the West African countries, they are preparing to the independence. So it was the people just didn't want more in a such kind of pressure. So the government that came into power at that time make it to in local language that help population to, to ensure their, their kids. And the second thing, there were, there were a lot of budgets devoted to that. There were massive recruitment of teachers there were also building construction. So all those kind of strategies help to, to ensure that everyone, every family send its kid to, to school. I don't know if I, I answer the, the question. The second one, we didn't find a sharp decrease on completion. The decrease that we find is the normal trend of decreasing from pre-FP time period Till FP and until after FP period. So it's like something that we should see normally in the control region. And we didn't see that in the treatment region because we have, in fact, a policy, a, a reform that motivates people to send their, their, their kids to school. But we, we, we find a sharp decrease in the attendance. 
in this way. The reason I seem to be investigated because I have some reason in mind, but I cannot ensure that this, for instance, in that period, there, there were cutting of some region to another region. For instance, in, in the Western region, there were cutting from of the mid, they created the mid-Western region by cutting some part of the Western region. So I cannot ensure that for the control area, but this needs to be more investigated. But on the completion, with, uh, completion, completion, primary completion, we just see the, the normal train from pre-FP 1935 till the post-FP period. So it's for not sharp. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Leonie. Um, we'll give you a, a pause for breath now, and maybe we could take a question from the floor. Perhaps let Leonie not have a question for a moment. Okay, so two hands went. You've asked a question already. No? Uh, no? Are you sure? She asked two questions. <laughs> I'll take one there. Someone from that side? No? Okay. At the back there and there. Okay. So I'm, I'm rubbish with names. Apologies if you know, I know you, but I can't remember your name. So uh, please, first, could you say who you are? Salman Asim with, with, with the World Bank. Uh, the first comment is just clarification from, from Justin. So when you're using the 50 years data, how has the measurement of literacy changed within the DHS instruments? And when, when you're controlling for the period effect, so is it just the quirkiness and the representativeness of the sample, or is it also the, the way that the measurement has changed for the literacy over the years? Second comment is for uh, Ben. I'm going to let you get away with this, but no one else, OK? <laughs> Uh, so uh, then the idea in terms of like going at scale is very good. I think we have reached this consensus after, after a very long time and that's, that's very encouraging. Uh, the key issue is in terms of like pivoting it to what is happening within the context. So if your PTRs are about 200, so the graph that one of the presenters showed in terms of the Vietnam and Ecuador comparison, I can make a similar graph with Malawi with 10 kilometers dispersion from the trading center that the child that is born closer to the trading center is going to be two years ahead in terms of learning compared to the child that is uh, 10 kilometers away. So in that kind of dispersion, once you start measuring average effects based on the, these interventions, so in five years time, what will be we say in terms of the success of these systems. Great. Okay, quick questions if possible. Okay, at the back, could you say who you are? Hi, I'm Mansi. I'm a student at UCL. Uh, and my question is to Michelle on the last comment about the systems that change are the ones that want to change. So, uh, so we see for some countries that is like a, at, at the policy level, we see that change happening with the focus on FLN and so on. Um, but maybe that's not happening uh, in the implementation side. Whereas in other contexts like the Sierra Leone that we just saw, there's like ground level change. But what would you say is the dynamics of, and Vietnam is an exceptional example where both have happened. Uh, but what would you say the dynamics of uh, bottoms up or top down uh, change are? Just fact you. Um, in the three countries you mentioned, because sorry, I'm Catherine Dom Mokoro um, and also ODI. Uh, in the three countries you mentioned, Justin, on the uh, fact that the decline had started pre the decision of uh, fee free education. So one is Ethiopia, the other, the other is Mali. I've forgotten the third one. Um, can you remind us the dates? And that's because I think that the sort of surrounding factors are matter. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Justin, do you want to take your two questions, one from Salman um, and one from Catherine? Then we'll go to Ben and then we'll go finally to Michelle. Um, yeah, I think mine are easy. So on Salman's question about measurement changes in the DHS, I mean, the nice thing about the DHS data for learning outcomes is, like, you know, they don't do a full learning assessment. They just measure literacy, but they don't do self-reported literacy. It is a actual test with a cue card uh, with a sentence um, and the language of choice of the respondent, and it's whether or not the respondent can read that sentence, um, and it's scored zero, it's scored not at all, or sort of, or, or full literacy. Um, that system has been in place and has been consistent across DHS waves. 
I guess I can't rule out the possibility that in practice the implementation of that methodology has changed. I've asked people at DHS for hints about that and haven't gotten any. But if some of you may know, uh, I welcome your, uh, but in principle, it's the same measurement across survey rounds. Um, so the third country, I think it was Madagascar that I put up there. I could have put others. Um, and you're going to ask me to remember the FPE reform years for all three countries. Um, for Ethiopia, it was 1994. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head for Mali and Madagascar. Um, and so what I was showing you was like the birth cohorts who were 10 years old. That was where the zero line was at the time of the reform. So by all means, other things were going on. Um, the only thing we wanted to illustrate there is if you think, and it, or as I showed, that, you know, taking away school fees did lead to a big influx of quote unquote marginal students. Um, and if you think that that influx of marginal students is why we see quality going down, the composition changed, it seemed that that quality was deteriorating before that big compositional change. Yeah, because, I mean, why I have the question? Mm -hmm. because I believe um, maybe the expansion preceded to some extent, the decision, the formal decision. Mm -hmm. And the second point is that the formal decision might not have translated into active practice. Um, and so, I mean, these are complicating factors. That's all I, the point I wanted to, to bring in. To say one sentence, for sure, I agree with you. And mm, I guess Lee's not here. We have a paper, maybe, coming out, looking at all of the FPE announcements in Sub-Saharan Africa that didn't never go anywhere, right? And so we tend to focus on papers that address the handful of FPE reforms that, that had impact. There were lots of others that were just, you know, dead letter. I totally agree. Great. Ben, on dispersion and average effects. Um, I don't think that was quite the question I was prepared to answer, but the one I heard you talk about <laughs> was in particular around the issue of scale on the one hand and then the Malawi class size issue on the other. Mm -hmm. So I want to be clear, when I'm talking about scale, it doesn't just mean have an idea that you write on paper, then nationalize the program. I think in a Malawi, like anywhere else, you need to figure out what are the sort of pedagogical methods and contexts that will work in extraordinary, extraordinary large class sizes in a pilot, medium scale within government systems, and then think about scaling. Testing a program out in a small classroom and then saying, oh, it works there, let's roll out to 120 on average, just, just never going to work. That said, when it comes to class size, and I want to move out of Malawi, because I do think the class sizes in Malawi are beyond where a normal teacher can really manage on average. But I don't, I've seen a, I've run a lot of regressions that looks at class size and learning outcomes. And the effect is not what you'd expect. If you don't account for location, often, at least in the data sets that I played around with, kids in larger classes have better outcomes. That's obviously because those kids are in urban schools. But even when you control for urbanicity and you're looking at rural schools, the relationship is very weak, if anything. So what does that mean? I, I have really shifted on this issue because I think fundamentally there are countries that have shown you can have, lar you can have effective instruction that works in large classes. Uh, 120, I think that's too large. What the, what the kind of breakdown between large that can work and large that can't, I'm not sure, but it's less than 120. But I do, think that, <laughs> I do think that there are things that are working with not just good teachers, but decent, mediocre teachers who are relatively unmotivated that can still work in, larger, in large classes. Uh, that I think we need, we need to think about designing those country specific and then scaling them up after you've shown that it can work within the context. Thanks. Come, let's do it. <laughs> right. OK, Michelle, do you want to? Sure come to the points on dyna dynamics and bottom up versus top down. Absolutely, yeah, thanks. It's a great question. Um, so I think on your, your points about kind of the, the or if I understand, stood properly, you know, the idea that there are policies set that sometimes don't happen, and then there are sometimes things that happen at the bottom that like filter up, so those dynamics. So, you know, a couple thoughts. So one would be, you know, what I, and wanting to say, you know, the point we're trying to make is that this is that the idea of like a commitment to the purpose of learning is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. Like once it's in, you still have to have all those strong technical practices, right? And then you still have to have all the strong 
data and, and assessment systems and all the other things that come along with it. But if the commitment's not there, and you just start with the technical things and the support things, it's gonna be really hard to get the sustained change on the learning front. So, you know, I wouldn't ever say that it's a sufficient condition, but what we're trying to say is it's this kind of necessary condition that's not easy to measure, but that kind of needs to be in place if you want the other things that you're doing to be able to, to, to sustain and, and keep going. Um, and then, and so, you know, the flip side too is that I, I do think, and, and it, I, I've actually, someone has suggested that I should make the, what's currently a solid line in, in my technical core, a dotted line, uh, to acknowledge that there's flow in both directions. And I, yes, I, I, I agree. I think in some areas there are, like, I, I, I think the, the evidence on that is, is strongest in the case of teachers. Like, if you support teachers to just change their practices, then they actually, their buy-in to what you're doing um, can grow because they're able to have higher expectations of their students once they see their students are learning. So I do think there's a place where you can kind of improve the implementation and that can lead to like setting higher expectations. But I think that that's more, when we're talking about kind of maybe, maybe larger system shifts, it's, it's harder that way at other levels of the system. And so I think, I don't know, for, for people that were here and heard Yamini talk about some of her work in Delhi, it's that changing the, the expectations of the mid-level bureaucrats that are pushing the paper and that their day job is to complete the paperwork by the end of the day, it's not fundamentally about learning. And so to change those expectations and say, to, now your job is fundamentally about how to improve learning. Some of the paperwork still has to happen, but on a deeper level, your, the expectations of your role has changed. That's the kind of shift that I'm talking about. And those are the levels that, at the system at which I think it, it is more important to change these set of expectations and norms. Fantastic. Uh, we have some questions online, so if we could maybe take one brief one. We've got about four minutes left. Great. Yeah, the, the top question online is um, also for Michelle. Uh, how much does Vietnam's socialist past and political ideology today around building a new man through education affect the country's purpose? Um, so. And <laughs> yeah, if you, if, you could, if you could answer that in a minute, that would be great. <laughs> Connects to that question of like where where does purpose cha changing the purpose come from, right? And you prefer to Jonathan. Well, I can talk about the new socialist man, but that was a concept from the '60s. But I think <laughs> what I would simply emphasize to this general discussion is I I know where you're going. I think with your argument, but I wouldn't say that you know systems uh, want to change, actors, people want to change. And I think one of the things that we observe in all the instances that you point out, and it comes up in other research too, is that there's multi, multi, multiple and sort of multi-directional commitment to education across the system. I'm very interested in listening to these discussions about what it means to sort of enthuse a system and what does education as a vocation mean? Because one of the things I've learned through this process is that a lot of the technical stuff, you can go on and on and on, but it doesn't tell us much about what's happening in the classroom. And so what's the, what are the mechanisms, going back to an earlier discussion, what are the conditions under which, as Kane might put it, uh, do we have this enthusiasm and activation of all of these necessary parts of an education system? You know, education is a political practice all the way through and it has to be recognized at all of these different levels, including in the classroom. Michelle, do you, do you want to say any more? I mean, that was an excellent answer. <laughs> but I, I can try, but we probably would get more out of asking okay. another just, question. Just before we thank our, uh, our speakers, I'd just like to say, I thought the papers, they were diverse, but in, in many ways, the session has encompassed some of the key messages that's been em emerging from the RISE, uh, the body of RISE work. So from Justin, he posed the question, the learning crisis, is it, is it new? Um, it's not new, it turns out, from the very careful data work, but it's real. Um, the, the stagnation was, or decline was, was very marked in, um, in what he showed us. And coming out from aspects of Leone's work and, and from Ben's research and um, uh, interviews, foundational literacy and numeracy is key to this. Um, uh, we saw that in terms of um, uh, the primary schooling and having long-term impacts by demand-side transmission and the fact that the, many of the respondents echoed that for, for Ben. Um, but change is possible. 
as Michelle's case studies show, but a commitment and a purpose around learning is going to be key. And that seems to be, you know, these are the messages that are coming out from the wider RISE body of research. So I thank our speakers for, for doing that. And um, yeah, we will go on to our next session. Fifteen minutes. Okay. You can go use the facilities
mistake again.
I don't know when we're on live. Are we on live? Okay, it's wonderful. Please do come in and take your seats for the very last, um, very last session of the day. Well, before the drinks, of course. So, fortunately, I have great pleasure in uh, hosting this last session, my biggest lessons learnt. And luckily, we've got three very provocative panellists, so they're going to keep you all um, awake before your, your drinks. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you all to reflect on something you've changed your mind about due to this research you've done. And I'm asking all of you, actually, because I'm going to turn to, to some of you afterwards. So, I know you all hold prior assumptions and beliefs, as we all do. Um, so when have you been challenged or actually had your views changed? And um, I just wanted to give an example. In FCDO, Stefan Durkin, actually not FCDO, in DFID at the time, Stefan Durkin um, decided that he was all going to make sure that all of us had unconscious bias training. You can imagine the... Um, enthusiasm among some bureaucrats around that idea. However, there you are. Some didn't like it, but we all had to do it. And um, I'm an anthropologist, so you know, we're taught the idea of reflexivity, and we're taught that acknowledging your viewpoint of how you hear or read or see evidence um, will be really influenced by how you interpret it. But are we willing to change our views? And um, I actually, we've been talking a lot about positive deviance, and um, we heard, well, I don't know where Michelle is, but you know, Michelle said, you know, there we are, that you really like the positives. But I think we also need to make sure that we're happy also to learn from our mistakes, and we shouldn't be afraid to do that. And I very, was very privileged recently um, to meet a new colleague um, over there, Jim Asman, who is a fellow here at the School of Government um, and also uh, a professor at UCLA. And he's been doing some very interesting work um, on with children long, in a longitudinal way, videoing them over many years, looking at the impact of a human rights curriculum um, and what that does. Anyway, he was asking children about um, making mistakes. So I'm going to give you a 30-second clip because hearing from children is much more powerful than hearing from old people. So I don't know if we could have the video clip on now, please. Um, IT crew. Hopefully, it will miraculously appear on the uh, on the screen. Anyone? Here we are. These five-year-olds. So, this is what Julie taught us: if you made a mistake, your mind grows, so you know not to make that mistake again. So sometimes it's good to make mistakes? Yeah, uh -huh. because it makes your brain grow. Yeah, because you learn something new. And it's actually new. a good thing when you make mistakes because you learn other things and then it's really good and for when you because then you keep making less mistakes each time you keep growing up. Does making mistakes help you become a better person? Yeah. No. So thanks to Jim. Round of applause to Jim um, Asman. Um, so those of you who are um, like me, um, just over 20 years old, and you're worried that your neurons are in faster decline than they are in growth, this is obviously, according to the five-year-olds, the session for you. So with that, I'm going to hand over to um, Ben to tell us what you learned, and don't be a friend to tell us any of the mistakes you've made, Ben. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everybody, again. Um, so I'm going to give you a small one and then a big one. So I, I go back to grad school and the stuff I wrote, wrote about teaching. I used to say that teachers should have complete control to decide what to teach. They should write their own lessons. It's only the teacher who I was trained by, Richard Elmore, knows the instructional core, the continuous between the curriculum, instruction, and assessment. And so the teacher is the only one who knew the magic. I fundamentally disagree with myself on those points. I have really come around to the power of structured materials to help teachers scaffold the difficult challenge of improving learning. That's a small one. Here's a big one. <laughs> now that I kind of believe that there's some possibility from having some structured materials, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to design those materials. Okay? So I'm going to talk to you about books 
and three big mistakes I made about books, okay? Mm -hmm. So the first one was about book printing. So I'm a technical person. I think about designing bilingual programs. There are two big spreadsheets that interact. I understand I have a paper in uh, Ethiopia that talks about the differences between Giz lang uh, uh, letters in, in Ethiopia and the Latin alphabet and how those are different. In Kenya, the work I was doing was considering how to interact the Kiswahili and English and mother tongue programs as a big spreadsheet in books with pictures. Okay, that's how I think about it. So once you get that done, then just get it out to the schools. Everything is going to be great. I had no idea how complicated book printing and book publishing was. I did not know. I told everybody, oh, everyone should do black and white materials because it's so much cheaper. In Kenya, you spend 3% more, you can get full color. I didn't know that. Uh, I told everybody that you just get the materials right, organize it technically, et cetera. Fundamentally, if you want to save money, you need to have the number of pages be a multiple of 16. Did you know that? What? If you, if you care about book printing and care about things being good, you can have books that last four times longer if you have the right glue. P-U-R. Didn't know any of these things. And I was supposedly in charge of a national scale learning improvement program that ultimately printed 25 million books and I had no idea what I was doing. So problem number one is book printing. Problem number two is book costs. Luis said, oh, Ben was there when we reduced costs. It's true that the books that we ultimately printed, the, the first couple rounds, were costing less than 70 cents printed and distributed at a national level to schools, okay? So that was about six times less than it used to be. But there's a lot of stuff I didn't know. I didn't know that working on developing and distributing the, all the books in grade one to three for the predominant market for the book publishers would actually reduce the book publishing industry in Kenya. I didn't know that. So I thought their you know, real resistance to us was because it was about corruption, right? So I was really, look at Dave over there with his computer. When we were doing the book procurement for the printing and distribution, all of the calculations were on my laptop, nobody else. We had the whole normal kind of um, book procurement meeting and everyone was there, but I said, I, all this is on my laptop, so if you're going to get someone with corruption, it's me. It's probably a terrible idea. I would not recommend that to anyone. That could have gone very badly. But what I think in retrospect happened is we were wildly successful, really reduced prices. I saw everything through the corruption lens, but we really affected the book market in ways that I didn't expect. And so on the one hand, there were some things I disagree with how they were doing. There, were, there was a lot of price gouging. The prices were significantly higher. But in retrospect, I was wrong about the impact that this large-scale book printing thing would have on the book publishers in ways that were hard to come back from. So we did a couple of rounds of, OK, Ben has now get his head around that. So let's do the supplementary readers. So we're kind of working with book publishers to develop supplementary readers and make that work. A little bit of progress. We then tried another one where we did these leveled readers. So the vision was, I want every school in, in every classroom to have baskets of books for Kiswahili in, in, and English at the student's level. So we worked with government to set up this leveled reader marker. And, and we worked with the local publishers to develop their own titles. We had them develop over 600 titles. So all of the things were working. We had them. Um, developed these 600 titles, they were leveled, we had the, the breakdown so that every kid could have the book, but we, I, had affected the book publishing market such that these good books that were in place, that were leveled, that were you know, scaffolded text so every kid at their level could read words that they had, the book publishing market had been affected so much by the stuff that I pushed, there wasn't demand for these 600 books that we got them to do. I had funding to print 30, so the book Baskets were not really baskets. They were like little tiny stacks. <laughs> so that was the second one on, uh, on, on, on uh, book costing. Uh, we actually were able, on the positive side, able to actually have government make substantial changes to the way they do um, book management. So Kenyan government right now is publishing books in a very different way, and it's probably three times less than it used to be. Not the six times, but three times less. That's one of the things I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited about. But then I had a third huge, this is actually the worst one, if you can believe it. So it was about private schools. So I was worried that we were going to flood the market to every public school in the country to get them books. 
But what had happened in the past sometimes is that the handful of unscrupulous head teachers at public schools would take the books from the public schools and put them in the private schools where there was a lot of demand for these new materials. Okay? So what was our idea? I gotta like convince people using my social capital, convince people to give us money. What we're gonna do is we're gonna provide these books to the private schools. So instead of there being temptation to steal the books from the public schools, let's just get another pot of money and distribute all the, to all the private schools in the country. So in addition to the 23,000 public schools, we also got additional funding to, to print and distribute books to all 6,000 private schools. Sounds like a great idea, right? But we had to work through a particular st structure that was supervising those private schools. And so we you know, did what we knew how to do to make sure there was some supervision. Because it wasn't just distributing the books. We wanted to make sure that this private school conglomerate was able to train the teachers on how to use them. So we had the whole cascade model of training and all those things. So we were trying to make sure they were only getting paid based on when they had done the distribution as well as done the training. But what I did. <laughs> Uh, as I set up a rent-seeking market for an organization I won't talk about that basically gouged the prices. They, they, it was supposed to be for free. They created a price market so they would be able to extract funding from all these uh, small uh, uh, private schools. So I can't report. I couldn't report on that for a year because I didn't have the delivery notes. What I heard anecdotally was basically that this there was a structure at the the sub-county level where this group was basically holding the books that we worked so hard to do as a mechanism to pull money out of people. And it was all my idea. There was no person you could blame except for me. So that was an example of I was trying to be bold, trying to be smart, but just did it completely wrong. That was fun. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Ben, for being so honest. I think, um, I think that deserves a round of applause um, <laughs> to Ben. And, and perhaps it's no accident that Ben is one of the members of the Global um, Evidence Experts Advisory Panel on Jeep because that focuses on costs and cost effectiveness. And there aren't that many academics historically in the education sector who, whilst they're doing their research, they also collect costs. And I think that's also a huge advance um, to us. So keep uh, collecting your costs. Thank you very much, Ben. Over to, to you, Banner. What, what have you learned? Uh, that's a tricky one to follow after Ben, who has, who has come up with very interesting mistakes uh, from which we can learn. I guess it's, um, uh, I have to sort of say that I'm one of those ones, if, a team, if I'm part of a team and I'm asked to do something, I say yes before even thinking through whether this is something I really have something significant to contribute to. So it's one of those ones. But I said, I'll think, I'll come up with something. You know, they've asked me, I'll come up with something. But actually when I reflected, and to be honest, I reflected very actively and consciously in the last five, six days that looking at the PETA and stuff, is there something as a researcher that I say I was truly, because I was trying to be honest here, not artificially come up with an example, oh, this is what I learned. And to be honest, I could not. Uh, maybe it's the seniority level I already have. The starting assumptions about PETAI, the problems we had with aid and all were more or less proven right. You know, so we were asked to look at the assumptions we had, starting assumptions, the methods, all of that. So within that research, I could not find methods. We could not do ethnography, which was the original plan. I adapted. We did online material. All of that, that worked. So papers were delivered. So I could not. So I was trying to be honest. And you know what? I stepped back for a moment. And Rachel, I don't know whether you remember at all, but I, I do feel that I've been proven wrong, is the, your whole idea of trying to, the benefit of trying to look at education as a system. Because I was one of those early researchers that um, was engaged um, uh, like 2013 and all when DEF had started thinking about this whole plan. And they, initially, I remember they asked us to give some comments in writing. You know, that was the first consultation, that DEF is trying to come up with this big education plan and uh, looking at it as a system. I was very engaged at that time, and I knew Rachel briefly through Wilson at that time, and I was very engaged with different Islamic and Quranic school stuff in uh, Kanur then. And I couldn't sort of buy the argument that you can get something by looking at the system because the system is so big, so complex, and there's so many questions within subsectors. So my Islamic and schooling component, um, like Quranic school component, in itself had so many interesting questions. So let us do that. You know, why are you pushing for this, especially learning from the health? I wasn't convinced. We went even to uh, this, conf uh, this first session in London, which you were leading. I think Kane was there, if I remember. And I was then really provocative because I made very blunt statements about what can we learn from health. We can't, you know, as a system. Education uh, research is good enough. But I think in the long term, uh, we had started to have this discussion on Tuesday, and I'd like to come back to that, and I will help my comments then. 
because I thought I'll share them today, is this that I do feel, although Karen, uh, Manjay, and you were a bit more cynical about what, uh, you know, focusing on the, have, we haven't really understood the education system despite this, and you're saying, why so? My own view is, to be honest, uh, the pressure to look at it as a system has paid off because I don't think you can ever, these are such complex systems that I don't know what health does because even that day I remember I wasn't convinced by that presentation that was made that we can, you know, really learn from the health systems. Um, is this that I, because I think what uh, the pressure to look at it as a system, what it has done is that it has the, the same kind of country teams have gone in different areas, teacher training, uh, uh, somebody has looked at more at that, somebody has looked at why the political economy sort of reforms work at the, at the, um, uh, at the national level, then the uh, PETA components uh, came in and all. Or well, I mean, other components came in, but I think if you piece them all together, you start getting a sense of the system, you know. And I think that's the best. You, personally, I feel you can do do in education research. And here, I do feel that the uh, synthesis. Uh, you, a lot of you might not have seen the synthesis, the themes team work coming out. I have seen mine. Jason privately has shared with me what he has done with my papers on uh, uh, voice and choice and voice, voice and choice, somewhere like that. And it's brilliant. I think it's, he's bringing together, you know, a lot of themes from the community participation stuff. So once all of them are put together, once all these papers are put together, I don't think you can ever get better system understanding of education than, than this thing has already started. Uh, because what more can you sort of formalize apart from carrying on this way? So I think you have proven me wrong. Do you understand my point? I think that's the only place I can genuinely, I genuinely thought I've been proven wrong because I took a very vocal stand at that time that it uh, doesn't work. But I think I'll take two, three minutes to share my view. Other people share their view uh, why they, they think the system has worked, and which I think for DFID or FDO planning this future big prob program helps might help in my reflection as a PETI person when I came in. Um, yeah, because I think what has helped, everybody has talked about the leadership role. And I don't want to embarrass uh, Lant by analyzing his leadership style even further. But I do want to add two more dimensions, which others have not added, which didn't, I think they did not add on Tuesday, in my experience, which have really paid off. Which is this, at Lant, you do pick on the best uh, researchers. You know, whatever you call the guerrilla style. I, I'm not going to repeat those words. I don't understand. But like where you let the, you know, you, you, point, you select people who you think you can, they can deliver, and you delegate a lot. But in that one, I think two other features which I have found personally very uh, useful from you is that you communicate that trust to that person. You know, just like you said, communication that day is important. I, in my case, he came to me. I have never applied for a competitive grant, but I came later. So it's it's the way you cure that confidence in my work that you you know you wanted to be on board because of what you have seen of my work or what people have told you of me or my work. It 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 raised my expectation to deliver because I wanted to live up to those expectations. So I think that you might have that impact on many people. I'm just saying as a leadership style, it's worth realizing that because you communicated that confidence in me I in return wanted to uphold that confidence so maybe I gave a bit extra to Petai then I might have bothered with a typical different project to be honest <laughs> because otherwise you get your payment and you move on you know to a, a journal article or whatever <laughs> And also, I don't, I'm one of those researchers, I have to admit, and maybe that's why I couldn't find any fault in my own research, is if I'm honest, I submit my res major research grants, I submit my monographs, I, uh, which are with the leading presses, and I submit uh, to leading journal articles without ever taking any feedback. I'm one of those researchers. I don't take feedback. I, I do my work, I submit, even for large grants. I'm honest, I don't. But, uh, but I want to mention here, that's, uh, it has made a difference to me, is this that, uh, and that's why I feel maybe leadership styles are very difficult to replicate, that land, uh, again, one is not being good to you, on your face, but you, I'm, I'm a qualitative researcher, I do ethnographies, I would do in community participation, but you were able to always pick on each paper on very fine points, you know, points that made me think, and Lewis also read some of my papers. So I think to have a leadership that has that mindset, maybe because you, you also had a lot of experience in the ground, did make a difference, because I hardly am a person who takes comments seriously, but <laughs> all your comments on every paper made me think. So I think that's something to be said. And then not to take time too much um, more, I think two, three points I'd like to highlight. Um, um, I think a question we should ask, Lant, is how does he identify good people? Because I'm, I did a lot of bigger research grants too, not this big, but say two million, three million. And identifying good people is an uh, art. I don't know how you do that, but anyway. But one or two, three points I'll finish with is that I think uh, in terms of structure style, uh, it also came up before, but I think the fact that you kept the OPM uh, uh, reviews and the payments quick, and, and a longer time to absorb the, the directorate feedback uh, worked quite well. Because if you pushed us to do that directorate feedback along with the payments, then the university would have come down to do the payments. And while this, these uh, comments, I used to just let them sink and you know come back to them much later. So I think that style worked. And finally, I think the, everybody has said that before, but I also agree, um, the, t the team meetings uh, help bring the, the system kind of understanding together, at least in my mind, I could connect things. And the conferences have been great. Sorry if I took long. <laughs> Thank you very much. Lots of uh, lessons there on how to uh, run a, a research program and uh, 
credit given there to, um, to Lance. You can, I think, tell everyone why you've told uh, Masuda that you were a gorilla, because I think that's otherwise an in-joke, Lance. So perhaps you could start with that. But I've learned a lesson, a gorilla. Oh, yeah. I thought I had something on Tuesday about it. It was, it was, and, 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 and it would be helpful if you could share. Um, share. However, I've learned... Gorilla, not a Not a chimpanzee. But I've also learned that um, Masuda has a very clever trick, or a, a good way of managing when you say she's got 10 minutes to actually get 15, <laughs> because she works, she talks twice as fast. So we've all learned that about you. Um, so thank you very much, Masuda. Um, Land, over to you. So I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I'm self-aware enough to know what I should do, which is I should tell some moderately amusing anecdote and kind of not be honest. And, and I'm going to be honest instead. Um, and I'm going to be honest in a way that I'm self-aware enough. It's going to make some people in the room really angry with me. As a matter of fact, okay. amusing anecdote is one time. Uh, I'll start with a music anecdote, uh, which is one time I gave a speech at uh, Smithsonian Institution, and since my mother was going to be in town from Boise, Idaho, and Washington, D.C., and her son was going to speak at the Smithsonian Institution, she was like, she wanted to see it, so she came. She was, and I was the counterpoint. So there was a big talk, and then I was supposed to be the kind of counterpoint. And so I, you know, the speaker spoke, and I spoke, and as I finished speaking, the woman sitting next to my mother turned to my mother, not knowing, and said, that speaker made me so angry. <laughs> and my mother said, you know, I've known him a long time, and he does that to a lot of people. <laughs> that was the defense my mother mounted for her son. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He does that to a lot of people. So I'm going to do that. So I think the biggest mistake I have made is underestimate how long the global education community could stay wrong. It's just unbelievable how the, and part of what was said today was interesting, in particular what UAE was saying, is that they, the, you know, the fact that these results that Justin showed that there has been deterioration learning performance conditional on enrollment, and we won't even call it education quality, could have persisted for 50 years, and that Justin's paper is the first time we knew it, is amazing. That's an amazing fact about the world, that we didn't know this fact until Justin did this work. And so I think I really... Uh, you know, I've been working on this off and on uh, uh, for almost 30 years, and I just kept thinking that a sufficient documentation of the fact of the really awful performance would in and of itself be enough to kick off this oh my gosh, we're on like the wrong path, we need to rethink what we're doing, we need to have a real shift in vision. And it's just taken unbelievably longer than I would have ever imagined uh, for that to happen. And, and I, and I want to say two things about maybe uh, uh, why I was wrong, right? One is, I'm not an education expert. I'm a development expert. And so <laughs> my overarching professional training is as an economist, and my overarching topic is the big picture question of development and why do some country societies and economies grow fast and become prosperous and others don't. And all education is just one subset of the work I have done over my professional career. And so I think there are two things that I, I was mistaken about. 
one um, uh, is I just <laughs> believed that market-like pressures were going to work. I had this deep sense that evolutionary, even if they weren't market pressures, there were evolutionary pressures in the world for the world to get better from feedback on performance, and that the fundamental variation in the world followed by some selection system created overwhelming pressures for things to get better. And I, maybe just that fundamental kind of quasi-market, quasi-evolutionary, quasi-optimistic thing was I just didn't believe that you know, something could get bad and just stay bad. <laughs> and that there weren't any sufficient evolutionary and or disruptive and or any pressures that could bring it, kick it out of that low level equilibrium and that it could persist forever. So I think I overestimated, and it, this is, in this case it wasn't the power of markets because in the end public sector education isn't a subject to market forces per se, but that, that some kind of evolutionary quasi-market-like pressure wouldn't either internally or externally be brought to bear in a way that would be sufficient to knock it out of this low-level equilibrium trap. So I think that was a bias in my thinking. I just, again, maybe it's just optimism, maybe it's just belief in, because it's an evolutionary pressure as much as it's, markets are just a subset of evolutionary mechanisms in the sense of variation, selection mechanisms, what persists, et cetera. So, and then the second is, um, I think early on, uh, as I was starting to work on education, as one again, one of the sub many things I was working on as a development economist, it struck me that uh, what was going on in the education sector was just fundamentally wrong about pedagogy. When I started getting exposed to this and started reading what people were saying about pedagogy, I said, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> That's just not right. And then I had this strong contradictory thought that I'm an economist, and as an economist, we don't, we don't think about the production function, or I think we often don't, and probably shouldn't mostly, think about the internal production process of the sector. We should think about the market into which the producer is embedded. And you know, if an economist is analyzing the market for hotels or the market for restaurants, we don't concern ourselves with the cooking. Like, look, we concern ourselves with, are people free to go to whatever restaurant they want? And are they free to spend their restaurant dollars however they want? And if they're free to spend their restaurant dollars and the restaurant is responsible for attracting or not attracting customers, we think about the market, the, the set of transactions. And, you know, an economist who said, well, you know, the fundamental problem with the restaurant industry is they use too much salt. It's like, no, that's not economics, right? <laughs> you're not a restaurant expert. You're not a cook. You're a analyzer of systems, right? Um, which is the system perspective. And I think, I think, <laughs> I think ex post, part of the overall deterioration was that they really did get embedded in a fundamentally set of wrong ideas about pedagogy and how it was. Uh, and I maybe should have, and I don't know, I, I don't know that I would have made any difference, but maybe had I been more willing to engage on that and not, because I kept trying to talk about the system perspective explicitly without ever talking about pedagogy. And ultimately, it was the teach for all and the structured pedagogy and the success of that that was like, we can't just talk about the system without actually talking about the fact that, you know, that some systems are <clears throat> producing extraordinarily superior outcomes relative to other systems must have something to do with the way in which the teaching and learning practices and that whatever feedback forces there might be or should be in order for more effective practices to be adopted are in some way embedded in some normative formation process in which people normatively feel good about failing. 
and it took me a long time to wrap my head around what that was and, and uh, way too long. So I actually, you know, I, I, and now I will end with like what might be an amusing anecdote to some, but I was at a meeting maybe four years ago, kind of early, relatively, or midway through the long rise process. And there was, <laughs> there was a meeting of some set of British, whatever, academic think people that worried about this, that I don't even remember the name of the organization, that had a little conference, maybe 30 people. And uh, the topic was, whose fault is the global learning crisis? Like, or the global learning crisis, whose fault is it? I was like, oh, that was kind of an interesting thing. <laughs> it was a good question, right? It was like, OK, we've admitted there's a global learning. Whose fault is it? And so uh, I was one of the invited people. And so there was a couple of people talked. And they were like kind of really not addressing the question. So I, <laughs> and moreover, I felt it's like, you know, a lot of the people in the room were like 50 years old, 60 years old, and had been part of the global education community their whole career. And like, they weren't like having any internal, yeah. like, maybe it was their fault. <laughs> so I got up and I said, you know, <laughs> the global learning crisis is my fault. <laughs> Um, you know, I was in India, and I was in classrooms in India, and I was seeing kids that were having their life chances pissed away by, by terrible instruction that they were experiencing that was going to lead them to drop out of school, having been to school and having had the hope of school held out in front of them. and. It's now 10 years later, after I was in the field seeing these kids, and nothing has gotten better in India. And yet I've been trying to do it, and so I have failed. And so the global learning crisis is my fault. <laughs> and the rest of the meeting sort of decided I was right. <laughs> <laughs> they like picked up that theme. It was like, yeah, it is his fault. <laughs> Um, so anyway, Thank you very much. No, I, I will end there. I think yeah, the big lesson learned was I have been. I I mean, the big lesson for me is it. It's amazing how long it has taken for the wave that is coming now, in which there is, I think, a real radically different commitment to foundational learning. It's amazing to me how long it took for that wave to build, and I feel like. I and others in the coalition that have maybe been working on this have been failing to, we, we failed to see really deep and important things maybe that could have brought that wave on sooner. Uh, and so uh, I think I, the lesson learned was I, I just radically underestimated how hard this was going to be. Well, I think we now know that Lance, not an education expert, but it's all his fault. <laughs> 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 it is my fault. And I'll, I'll abuse the position as a chair, because I, I want to come back to your metaphor. You always say you use metaphors, uh, you work them very hard. But just going back to your metaphor on restaurants, I think the other thing that I think we've, we've learned is that you, know, you wouldn't go out to cook a new meal without a, 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 you know, without a recipe. Yeah. And yet we, for a long time, have been um, dismissing the need for any kind of structured support. And yeah, I just, you know. dissertation was like, no recipes. Absolutely. Like, no, <laughs> the cook should just invent it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I think that's perhaps something else we've learned. Um, but I, would, would anyone um, like to share things that they have learned or question oh, or query um, some of the. I can't be right. Some of the. We have 40 minutes. <laughs> We've, it's, it's, uh, it's 10 to, so, so, questions from the floor, um, would anyone like to volunteer, please, Jakobus. So, something that I've been sort of struggling with since one of the main tenets of Land's takeaway is that uh, education systems need a commitment to foundational learning, uh, but we can't produce that from outside. There's a political process that happens, 
Uh, and then the big question then for me is, A, should, should I at all try and help a country from an outside perspective if I can't influence the politics? Should I even be there? Uh, and B, is there a meaningful way to actually change that political? So, I mean, maybe this is for Ben Piper, who's sort of been able to do that as an outsider in Kenya. Kind of like, how do you, how can you shape domestic politics to, to induce that kind of shift towards <coughs> learning? Well, okay, no small, no small question. Um, so, would you like to try and tackle that one then, or are you going to... Pass it over to Lan, who's desperate to get in there. Start ben, time, ben <laughs> actually has responsibilities. Uh, <laughs> he has to be wise and judicious in what he says. And he knows whatever he says, someone will come ask him for funding to do it. So he's got to be very careful <laughs> about what he says. Uh, I, on the other hand, rise is ending. I have you know, done what I've done. Um, so I think. Coming back to this, I, I think there's, there's two things about that, right? One is, um, you know, metaphors, whatever, sometimes my students would make fun that they learned a menagerie of animal analogies from me. But one of our, one of our pithy sayings is, you know, you can't beat a turtle to move, right? The turtle has survived as a weird-looking creature, not because it's aggressive, not because it's fast, but it per can protect itself from danger by pulling its arms and legs in. And if you want to beat a turtle to head a certain direction, the turtle can be beaten on much longer than you have patience to beat it. <laughs> You're a great audience. I'm going to bring you, like, <laughs> where... <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, so the first thing, and, and this is part of my mistake, maybe, is I was thinking you could get both domestic and global education actors to m go a different way by beating on them from the outside. And like I say, one of the lessons I learned is they are turtles, man. They are hard friggin' shell turtles because they have this self-reinforcing norm support thing. I'm looking for UAE. I mean, they, they, you know, they who's not looking at me at all. <laughs> she didn't hear her name mentioned. Anyway, anyway, but you know, they, they, there is a the strong norm formation in which you can ignore that what anybody else says because they're not us. And since they're not us, they can't possibly understand us and they don't really share our values and so what anybody else would say. So the first thing is yes and no, right? Meaning shifting the internal discourse of the inside the turtle, you know, ultimately you have to have people, and this is extending the metaphor too far, but, you know, for the turtle to move, the head has to be stick out, and it's not going to, nobody inside the turtle is going to stick the neck out if they think they're being bitten, because then if they stick their neck out and criticize from the outside, they're going to be traitors to the cause and rejected anyway, and so if the turtle's being beaten on, it will consolidate. It has to consolidate. So you have to have change from within. So to some extent, you know, the discussion we've had in Bela about parents and stuff, I've become less and less convinced that anybody is going to change this from the outside pressure mechanism at all exclusively. It has to be an inside the education establishment repurposing and revisioning that has to happen and anybody from the outside. Second is, I think, <clears throat> One thing that I've written that, that I've written lots of things, and it's always a mystery to me <laughs> which of them have resonance and which of them don't. But one of the many things um, <clears throat> that hasn't ever taken off, and I kind of understand why, is a blog I wrote about the AK-47 and the M-16. Um, uh, and I think it's super important to understanding your question, right? Because the M16, uh, I realize some of you, everybody knows what an AK-47 and M16 is, right? OK. <laughs> AK-47 is the Kalashnikov automatic rifle that's widely used, and the M16 is the similar automatic weapon used by the US military, OK? Now, uh, this is, uh, <laughs> now that we have 34 minutes, I can take some time here. 
And by the way, I'm from Idaho, so like <laughs> guns are second nature to me. I, I have no, uh, which is why probably this, that it was a gun analogy is precisely why it never took off, but I'm sticking to it anyway. Okay. <laughs> reinforcing, doubling down on mistakes. But the M16 and the AK-47 are the result of radically different design assumptions. The Soviets said, we're going to design the weapon to the soldier. And the soldier is somebody who we're not going to train. And so what we need is a weapon that, if they point it in the direction and pull the trigger, it fires no matter what. Right? And that it's not very accurate beyond a few hundred yards. Who cares? They can't aim it anyway. And so reliability and robustness is essential, right? And the M16 on the proving ground is an incredibly, no, not incredibly, but it's a substantially more accurate weapon. The best practice weapon is the M16, unambiguously, right? I mean, I can show you the test results and da 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 da. Okay. But, you have to train the soldier to the weapon with an M16, because if you don't keep an M16 weapon clean and oiled, it will jam when you pull the trigger, and nothing will come out of the barrel, or worse, it will blow up in your hand. So one of the things that global experts have been doing is they have been traveling around the world trying to promote the M16. Like, you should adopt. I mean, and McKenzie does this for a living and makes millions of dollars, and it's a complete and total fraud. Because they go, and they say, what do high-performing systems do? Well, here's what Finland does, and here's what... And then they say, well, therefore, in order for you to have a high-performing system, you should do what Finland does. And it's like, no. If you can't maintain the weapon, you shouldn't adopt it as your routine weapon. You should adopt, and in fact, when it matters, Countries adopt, countries and non-countries especially, adopt the AK-47 because they realize, like, it really matters whether the bullet comes out of the end when we pull the trigger, and we're not going to be able to create the capability to adequately maintain our weapon because we're not going to have trained soldiers, and so we'll adopt it. So I think the global community and donors and experts are often the vectors of wrong technology isomorphism. They're promoting best practice weapons that are not at all well adapted to the actual conditions under which the weapon will be used and the purposes for which the weapon will be used. And so I think <laughs> as an outsider, and I'm an outsider, I'm an American, I am not you know, from any of the countries I'm working on and I'm aware of that, but as an outsider I want to ask myself continuously, am I a vector of unproductive isomorphism of trying to take to uh, situations that I don't fully understand, solutions that have worked and been evolved organically re respective to the conditions that I have lived and I have worked and I have experienced and transmit them. And then through a product of normative isomorphism, make the people in countries who aren't adopting the M16 feel like they're stupid or inferior or if you were really cool and came to Harvard and become educated, you would know that this is the best thing and you would try and take it back to your own context and you would prove your chops by coming to international conferences where you all talked about how cool it was that you were doing the best thing. And so the outsiders can be, as much, can be part of the deep problem in that they're not creating a consensus around what actually can be done they're creating a normative consensus that's impossible to implement. And that's an enormously damaging thing because it promotes a reinforcing failing strategy. Wow, that was too long. Sorry. So I may, maybe learned just as we were very, very slow to understand that we were doing things wrong. Maybe we were just very, very slow in understanding the importance of this blog. Have, have you written this blog? What? Have you written this blog? Yeah, yeah it's been out for like okay. six years. I've then, never seen any. I, I don't think, has anybody read it? Okay. Whoa! Whoa! Oh my word, I'm wrong. Okay. Well, no, 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 student then, of mine. Then, then I'm, I'm Mark. gonna. Anyway, I'm gonna no, ask I wrote it if like eight years ago, and I've never okay. seen anybody say, so, you know, as Lance said about the AK-47. So I'm gonna see if there's anyone clever enough on our IT to put up the blog, you know, post, <laughs> so we can all read this blog and become enlightened <laughs> now, because. I mean, ben. seriously. It's not Ben's turn to say seriously. He, he will. He will come and say <laughs> seriously. He's going to come in. But I think it is the moment when people, I think we have realized 
that it's not just the what, that it's the how and the where that matters and the context that matters. Yeah, so, I, 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 but, yeah. but there's still a lot of attempt. Da, 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 da. Anyway. Ben. I'm glad we have an adult in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's worth being questioning ourselves on that, Jacobus. Is do we have as non as people not from these countries? Do we have a place in those countries? If you start feeling comfortable, and if I start feeling comfortable that the answer is yes inherently, I think it's a problem with me. So I have, st I still feel like I do have a place because I'm really committed that there are talented people in this country whose voice I can amplify. Eventually, that won't be the case. Eventually, there'll be no need for me or for us outside. But for the window where there is still a place for an outsider, my job is to connect with the talented people who have the solutions already in the country but are not in a position to implement those solutions. So that I'm hearing from them, I'm guided by them, their, their ideas that I'm sharing in the places that they otherwise couldn't be. And they're the ones who are having the pre-meeting. Next week is a pre-summit. But when you're in a, a low middle income country, there are pre-meetings where the real decision is made. If you go to the meeting and you don't know what the decision is going to happen from the meeting, you will lose that meeting. <laughs> and I can't go to the pre-meeting, but the people around me in that low and middle income country can and will, and they, that's the process where real, where real change happens. As a Westerner, if you go to the meeting and you don't know what's going to happen, it's going to go badly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say that uh, it is worthwhile, Jacobus, and I have, a, again, essay that nobody read. I have an essay on this topic about how important it is for us as people who are fundamentally outsiders to continually question the whole sector we operate in and be ready to decide at, at, if things get good enough, there's no space for me in, anymore. And instead, I should make sure that I move away for, for the people who can really continue to do that. But I think it's an important thing for us to all keep in mind. Over. Thank you very much, Ben. And for that question, Jacobus, you didn't expect such an in-depth um, response to that. Um, so we're going to pass over first to online questions, give them a chance. So Rashdi, could you read out a couple of those? Maybe take a couple and um, put it back to the panel. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the first one is for Ben. Um, is there any experiment that you participated in that worked at a small scale but failed when it was expanded? Um, and could you share what you learned from that project? There's more questions coming, so I'm not sure if you want me to. Can you give us one more? Yeah. Um, so what are RISE and the Gates Foundations and others such as those doing to help in cases such as the Sierra, Sierra Leone Secondary School case study to improve the school facilities and manpower? Okay. Great. So... Ben, yeah, do you I, want to give the first? I feel like the, if you have volume on experiments, you will have a lot of failures. And so I've had a few. And it, I was explaining the second question to Lance. No, no, I, I, did, I didn't hear it. The second question, but it's not really relevant, to be honest. He was asking to uh, relay the second question. So two, so two practical examples. So in, again, in Kenya, well, I'll, do, I'll do three. In Uganda, we had a nice RCT looking at three different ways of implementing teaching at the right level in connection with a structured pedagogy program. Hmm. So we, said, we, we were recognizing that in some contexts, those things have become complicated for an individual teacher, both teaching a structured lesson, then doing a catch-up or remediation program on top of it. So we had three different treatment groups, and it was hmm. going to be great, and then COVID happened, and now it didn't happen. So that was one failure. A second failure on, uh, on, on kind of studies was a... Uh, RCT trying to improve executive function outcomes hmm. in Kenya. Um, and I think that one didn't work because the, there were ceiling effects. But it had, you run the regression a lot of ways, and it, there's no way you cut it. it <laughs> zero in every plausible direction. Um, and then in a, another ECD program in Kenya, we were looking at uh, the impact of an ECD program in 2,500 ECD centers. And we were looking at... Uh, early literacy outcomes, early numeracy outcomes, and early SEL outcomes. And same thing, no matter how we run it. The literacy and numeracy showed impacts hmm. in all different directions. But no matter how we ran it, there was no impact on SEL. And in fact, 
I'm quite sympathetic to the importance of SEL, but I think the evidence of how to do that is much more limited at scale in low and middle income countries. I know DRC has one study. I know there's possibilities coming out from others, but um, yeah, those are, those are th just three to start. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those, Ben. Does um, Ms. Sudo? Or? No, I was trying to explain the second question to Land, but I think it's not relevant. It was very applied. Oh, okay. uh, like what Arise can do to do something on the ground. Yeah. And the answer is RISE isn't anything. <laughs> so I, I mean, RISE I, is a research project funded yeah. by other people. We're not an organization. Um, I think that, um, to, you know, thinking about that question, though, I think one of the things that RISE has done that's actually really um, innovative is the wiki. And we had the wiki page up a bit earlier. And I think that co-creation of um, responses to questions and so on is a really exciting project. And um, personally, I feel um, there's a lot further that can go, and I feel it's just in its infancy. But it would be great. Um, I don't know who the um, who was asked that question, but it would be great to for them to look and see is the answer to their question there somewhere in Wiki, and if not, you know, co-create the answer. Come and challenge one of the Rise team to to give you the response um, to your question. Um, it would be great to hear more from people in the room about what what's good on that Wiki and and what could be improved on that wiki because it, I think it's a very exciting ex experiment of co-creation. There's a lot of questions coming up in the room. Please. Uh, that's been on my mind because see when these uh, big donor programs uh, finish, the websites normally only have a year of life after that. <laughs> uh, and the whole issue is here that there's a good research. So if you want to have it impact, the papers and everything themes all have to, should out, be out there. So what's the plan for that? Does the website disappear, Rice website after a year or so, or are there any plans for that? That's a, that's a question back to, uh, to our, our great director here. Um, we well, are, otherwise we are, disappear, Land. We definitely wouldn't want to see the products of RISE disappear, and it's um, something that the team are doing a lot of hard work on, seeing Joe, seeing, you know, Kirsty's not here, but I know there's a lot of thought going into this, and mm -hmm. you'll hear at drinks, um, and uh, I think we should allow people to to leave a little early. I know you said we had to go on till half past, but I think people should go up a little early to, to drinks because we're going to answer that question indeed <laughs> over drinks as well. Um, but we've got quite a few questions still coming, so I think I need to let people come in. Um, please. I just uh, want to make a commentary on um, what Landa said about, um, about Finland or any of these people in I think we have to accept that knowledge is universal. But application, sorry. I want to, to respond to uh, or to make a comment on what Landa said about people going to copy what Finland is doing and hoping that they can reproduce the same education system. Uh, of course, they can't because. Finland is not Malawi or is not South Africa or Zimbabwe or any country like that. But I think what we have to accept is that knowledge is universal. But application has to be local, has to take context. And I'll give an example, which I hope doesn't offend anybody. <laughs> uh, many people here know about the so-called dual system uh, of training artisans, which is typically Germanic, which happens in Switzerland, which happens in Germany, which happens in Austria, and has been very successful. So in its wisdom, my former institution, the World Bank, said this is the best way of training artisans. So they tried to apply it in Tanzania, they try to apply it in Colombia. They try to apply it in Indonesia. Uh, we even try to apply it in Zimbabwe. And it was a complete disaster in all those countries. Because the conditions that, that happen to be in the Germanic uh, states do not exist in any of those uh, countries. However, Singapore took the model and ran with it, but they made it Singaporean. They took the knowledge 
and they applied it to the Singaporean context, and it has been very successful. Thank you very much. Just a few other hands here. Kane at the back. Could you pass the mic, please? Thank you. Oh, okay. Maybe just a quick extension to your answer, Lant, on why it's taken so long and what might have been the role of the global education community. So if we accept that it's probably not a lack of ideas um, and it's partly a lack of resources in some countries, but not entirely that, is there a sense in which vested interest is a big part of it, which you kind of almost said, but I think didn't quite go that far. No, I, I, no, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Which are yeah, not. yeah, but I, 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 I mean, this is a, this is a, I think, super deep and important point, which is, I, I am not saying, I, um, sorry, I, maybe I should have been clear. I, I should have been clear, which is, uh, I think the big question in the world is not defeating people who are have pecuniary vested interests and are resisting change for that reason. The real problem is change that is happening by pe people that sincerely and normatively believe what they're doing is the right thing. Right? The global I don't think the you know, I guess we're all like, even people that are members of the global international bureaucracy like the World Bank, you know, oh, look, they make so much money. Eh, they don't make that much money. And B. They do, and, I think. No, no, <laughs> no. I, 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 but by the same token, nearly everybody who had the qualifications and capability and drive to work at the World Bank could have worked at a private bank and made five times more. So people at the World Bank, yeah, they make a shit ton of money. But, uh, sorry, that's a technical term in Idaho. Um, <laughs> um, but, it, but they're not, therefore, they're not a vested interest in defense of bureaucracy. I think nearly everybody I ever met in the World Bank actually believed in what they were doing. And I think the global education community believed in what they were doing. And so I think I, I want to press to the deeper question of how do you get embedded in these self-reinforcing normative formation cycles in which you can persist in an ineffective low-level equilibrium but still strongly believe that you're doing the right thing and strongly resist any external criticism, right? And I think, there, I think that's a, a really interesting question of like, you know, and I, I loved today, and I love every day of every conference in RISE that Claire has organized. Um, <laughs> uh, but I love today because there was a lot of this thinking of what are teachers thinking, right? Because um, I, don't, I don't think many people in the education sector, the master or globally, are thinking, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway because it serves my self-interest. I think they're thinking... I'm doing the right thing, and you know, then they have some mental ways of reconciling the actual outcomes they observe with the fact that you know they're working very hard and productively and on a globally good cause. And that's a much harder thing. Like if it were, you know, if we were up against, <laughs> if the wave of foundational literacy numeracy were up against big tobacco. Like, that'd be terrific, man. Like, we could all hate big tobacco, right? But the global, nobody, I don't want to, like, attack the global education community. They've been devoted to expanding education, which is a world historical transforming thing that's been an enormously good thing. Uh, so so it's, it's like, you know, this is a case in which the sort of resistance to change isn't big tobacco. 
or big any, uh, you know. Something. Please, Ms. Suda, come in. Word. Lance, I do, though, agree a bit with, again, more based on my own experience of engaging. Like, look at the SBMC example alone. All the donors sitting in the education sector know by now, by evidence, what's happening, I would say generally, but they'll still invest in it just because at that time, do you understand? That's their, uh, the education advisor advising on community participation has to do something. So, so vested interest in a more broader, like, they defend their turf. So it's that, that particular intervention becomes uh, their vested interest in some way. I'm just sort of saying yeah, more from the bottom it's up. Not uh, it, but it's, it, it's, it, it's a yeah. different sort of vested interest, I, though. It's not they, a lobby they, kind of thing, but... They, uh, they become... But it's like, um, you know, it, it's... You defend that turf, that's what I mean. All the you defend, lobby, but, but, but because your intervention the is there. But, but again, if, if I were a PR person and wanted to make money defending turf, I'd work for Big Tobacco, because I could make a lot more, right? I mean, nobody, nobody, like... Very few people are getting rich off being resistant to not change what things they don't know are working. It, it's a much deeper, more, and therefore more pernicious dynamic, right? I'm saying if it were truly a pernicious, obvious, vested, pecuniary vested interest problem, like I would love that, right? If we could just expose, you know, big education. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not it. That's not it. I'm saying that's not it. Let me be clear. I'm saying that's not it, uh, in my mind, anyway. All right. I'm going to do one last round of, of questions. So um, we've got one here, one here, Bela and Lewis. Okay. Please. Mike, Mike, over here. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at land and no one else because at least he's one who takes responsibility. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a few comments, but I'll try to be quick. Uh, I, I think we still needed to address the question that came from the Hub or online about what next, and even, even, if, uh, even if it was directed to what has been considered as a wrong, wrong target, a rise, I, I think it's, it's right to direct it to rise because uh, I, I come from the academia background. And uh, in our country, we, can, we reached a point where um, researchers, when they go out in the villages to collect data, local people chase them away because they're saying, you have been coming here to collect this data, and you've been doing all these studies to get either your PhDs or prove that there's, a, there's an impact if it's a project and you get more funding. What is the benefit? How does this research translate into something tangible that can change our lives? Now turn that around. RISE has done this great research in Indonesia and Zambia and, and many others are continuing to do great research. But the ultimate goal of this research should not just be to understand, you know, there should be another step. We, in, at least in developing countries, we are saying today that some of our learners, or most actually, the majority of our learners, we are saying they are not learning. If you look at what is happening is that they have, at the end of their schooling, they are acquiring low level skills and not top, top level. So they memorize, they see what is, has happened, they can describe what has happened. It's the same with the research. We can describe what, what has happened, what we are, we are seeing there. But we need to go higher and say, how do we apply these skills? So research that has matured should also go beyond. And that's why in any great research, uh, there is always need for you to have a, a powerful dissemination strategy that goes beyond just doing a policy brief nowadays, it's beyond. So uh, what next? I think the question of what next is still very important. Like what does RISE want to see this going to? And finally, wrapping all that around, uh, I think we should take responsibility indeed, as Lanta said, to acknowledge that um, as educators who are trying to teach the world how to learn, we have failed to learn. Because, as he has rightly said, how has it taken us 50 years? Now is the time for, for us to turn inward and say, are we really, really learning 
from all these experiences and therefore what should we do? If we have learned, we must show and be able to apply and then change lives with what we have learned. Let me pause there, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so now, if you have a large portion of teachers being relegated to just AK-47s, right? You're just sort of saying, okay, you don't have to be extremely motivated. You don't have to even be paid as much. We're going to give you the right tool to teach and you will always fire the bullet. You will always have an effective classroom, right? Somewhere are we limiting the scope of how much a teacher in a developing country can do? How much sort of, are we sort of completely taking away the possibility that perhaps we can teach passion to these teachers, we can teach um, all of the sort of the unobservables, the motivation, the intrinsic motivation to actually run an effective classroom. Because that may come to bite us in the backside later on when you don't have an extremely motivated teacher workforce teaching in secondary level of education or tertiary level of education. Because that culture was never built. Great question. Let's, but I'm going to take all, all, all for Bela. Let's hear the comment. I actually want to go back to that school in Sierra Leone. It's not an outlier. And I think what was... school where? In Sierra Leone. Oh, okay, sure. The secondary school and that lone teacher, who in spite perhaps of having posts, um, was unable to bring teachers to that school and had to improvise quite amazingly, um, perhaps co-create, give agency to students, had to do so many things. I think in many ways, uh, that is not an outlier. It's a, quite a huge reality in many of these countries, including Pakistan. And that means that, you know, for RISE to look at these sort of um, qualitative pieces, but also from a policy perspective, to see how um, support can be extended to teachers like that, which is very different in many ways. It's like, it's the most disruptive form of innovative uh, system support, um, which gives him or her a separate grant, new ways of doing things, experimenting and perhaps documenting to, to the level of a fine art. And I've seen so many of them, and some of them really brilliant, creating their own social capital and networks. So Masuda, and like you that, you know, nothing can be done. I think that's a, a very, very, that was one of the most serious pieces of work that really needs um, a systems approach uh, and allocations which are very different. Uh, and support system to a leader uh, who has to sort of, you know, see the whole school and the whole community, the community as a school and the school as a community. I mean, I just wanted to leave that thought. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go back on my promise to let you five minutes early. Lewis, please, huh? brief comment so we can allow it, we, so we allow them enough time to wrap up. So I will be disagreeing with Lent on this. And I will do it very concretely. I think if you are a teacher union leader in Honduras or Guatemala, and you have your kids in private schools, and you demand that the things that happen in public schools are not only different from what happens in the school in which your own children are in a private school, but are actually the opposite of what happens in the private school that you send your own children to, you are acting in bad faith whether it's for pecuniary reasons or for ideological reasons, is very difficult to disentangle because human beings have a way of making their ideology fit their interests. And the things that those union leaders ask, and this is only an example. I, the same thing happens in the publishing industry. Uh, they act in bad faith. Um, and the values and ideology that often get used to hide the bad faith are often very nice sounding. I mean, who could oppose, okay, the, the point is that the publishing industry, the, the teacher union leaders, many others. So, four provocative questions. 
I'm going to give you one minute each to answer whichever one you want, because we learned that, you know, journalists can, you know, you just say whatever. <laughs> respond to whichever question you want. Pick and choose. One minute each to sum up and respond to whichever of those you'd like to. I'm going to go in the same order as we started. Um, so final thoughts and reflections, Ben, please. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. So just mine, mine will be quick. Just about this issue of could we have a demotivated teacher if we're kind of taking the power out of her hand? Is it kind of my interpretation of your question? I think it's the other way around. Uh, my view of the average teacher, we've talked about that a lot, is that they're well-meaning. And if they were better at their job, they might enjoy their job more. So I think giving them structure that's research-based, that's highly effective, not alone, but in a package of other things, will make them better at their job. Kids will learn more, numeracy, literacy, whatever. And in my experience, again, there, there's not data on this. Maybe there is, but I just don't know. But I, my, what I've seen anecdotally is that that makes them like their job. They're more motivated because they're, they've been doing this job for 10 years and kids haven't learned, and now they have some structure which is simple enough that they will actually use it. They use it, the kids learn, they enjoy their job, they're more, more motivated. So I wonder if the, the, the directionality of the causality on that is not switched. Thank you. How can you have seen Justin's presentation and have that reaction? This is a sinking ship. And you're worried that, oh, it might not cruise to the Bahamas in time for us to take a vacation. It's like, no, it's a sinking ship. Okay, we're going to take the sinking ship and try and raise it again. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, it's like, <laughs> like, how do you look at this trend and think, oh, we need to worry that maybe some point in the future... Don't give them the lesson plan. It's extremely effective. I've used it myself. Okay. I know that it's ex ex extremely effective. But without yeah. any sort of culture with regards to any kind of upward trajectory that that teacher, in terms of her career, can count on, sure, that teacher... But, uh, again, if you... Like, I don't think that's what you said, so <laughs> That's not what we're it. saying at all. I mean, if you read what we're saying about teachers, we're saying exactly that, but you have to start yeah. from somewhere. So, so we cut it off now. Yeah, Masuda. The last sentence I have. <laughs> Which is this? No, which is this that uh, just to come back to Bela, which is uh, where I started. Which is this that I'm, I've been convinced that there's something worthwhile doing in system level education. But I'm saying that I think what we did was maybe the best way to do it. I don't know how much you can learn from health. I'm still not convinced. That's all I'm saying. But I do agree. I, like I do agree. Looking at the bigger, like uh, putting it all together is useful. But for me, that's system. Nothing beyond that. That's what I. Was Lant, your final reflections on. Lessons learned. Hmm. Is that I should be nicer to you? Sorry. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the main lesson I, I, I have learned now, is that I, I, I'm sometimes too aggressive. Sorry about that. Um, and we need to, and let's go have drinks before I, uh, like, take back that nicest. <laughs> OK. Sure, yeah. Um, and I think we come back to your, your question that we need to think about what works, we need to think about what's next, we need to make sure all of the great research that's been shared throughout today gets written up and published and that we as a sector do take forward um, all the lessons that we've learned from the positives, the positive deviance and from our mistakes as well. So a huge thanks to the panellists and, and Claire, a word from Claire. Don't worry, I'm going to let you go to drinks in about a minute, OK? But I just want to avail myself of the microphone because Lan never hears me if I don't have a microphone and I'm standing <laughs> about 10 centimetres away from him. Um, so what we've seen today, we've seen passionate debate. You know, it, it's one of the great things about conferences. And it doesn't say... It, this is the final conference. 2022 is the final <coughs> RISE conference. But FCDO has funding for the conferences to continue. So the first message to say... These conferences will continue. You're part of the network. You will continue to hear about them. They will be going on going forward. So that's great. <laughs> to FCDO for ensuring that the conferences will survive. 
but we want to make sure that they're fresh and whoever you know the funding goes to that that they they are invigorated so your challenge over drinks is find someone from the rise team and tell them what you think works what's your lesson from experiencing these conferences over the last few years pass on your feedback we will assimilate it and pass it on to whoever adopts the mantle for taking the conferences going forward. So that's your challenge. Okay, now go drink and talk. Okay.